All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two uh, of our September council meeting. Uh, Executive Director Chuck Tracy, do you have any announcements? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, just uh, we're on schedule today. We've got uh, ground fish electronic monitoring and sablefish gear switching. Uh, sablefish is a, uh, scheduled to be a two part um, agenda item. Our plan is to uh, at least get through public comment today, and then uh, it's uh, scheduled for final action on Tuesday. Um, so uh, that's our that's our plan for today. Um, I would, uh, uh, on another subject, uh, we do have some um, uh, public comment presentations people have signed up for. I just want to remind people that if, if you fill out the JOT form to get the presentation, uh, uh, delivered to our staff so we can prepare it. Uh, you still need to sign up through the public comment portal so that we know that know uh, when to call on you and to manage time. So it's a, we're still a little bit of a two-step process if you've got a presentation. So there's a few people that fall into that category today and uh, there might be some uh, uh, need to uh, pay attention to that later in the week as well. So. Again, if you've, if you've got a public presentation, you've filled out the job form and you're good with uh, Sandra and Chris on that, you'll still need to sign up through the public comment portal. So uh, those are my announcements today, Mr. Chair, back to you. All right, thanks very much, uh, Chuck. So we'll get started with agenda item C4, electronic monitoring. And for that, I will pass the gavel to our vice chair, Brad Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Gerolnik, and good morning, everyone. Um, We'll get right to it here and uh, go to uh, Brett to start us off on uh, C4. Brett? Thank you, Vice Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, electronic monitoring final action. Just looking over the situation summary, uh, recall that in June 2021, the Council received an update from NIMS on implementation of the West Coast EM program. At that meeting, you directed staff to send a letter to NIMS requesting a delay in the program and extension of the EM exempted fishing permits. That uh, letter is under agenda item C4 attachment one. Uh, that letter summarizes basically what um, uh, a delay in the EM rule, a uh, extension of the EFPs and just looking to work with the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Service to, and NIMS to examine ways to develop a mechanism really for industry to fund the video review and storage by PSMFC and trying to reduce the concerns about confidentiality and federal record retention. There's also some information there regarding how the Magnuson Act apl might apply to a sole source contract with PSMFC. So we'd like to examine that possibility in the future. Um, and so we did receive then a letter back on that and from National Marine Fisheries Service, that's supplemental attachment two in the briefing book. Uh, we um, are looking then to, uh, for council action, consider the potential final action on delaying implementation and extending the exempt and fishing permits. And if you could provide additional guidance on program implementation as appropriate. Uh, also in the briefing book is the supplemental gap report one look at basically describing uh, justification for an extension of the EM EFPs and a delay in the rule. So I don't have too much else to add. I, that's my overview. I'll take some questions on that. I think if uh, once that's done that we could turn to Ryan who's in the seat, I believe to uh, discuss the letter that's in the briefing book and have a discussion on that and then move to action. Any questions for me? Yeah, questions uh, for Brett on his overview. Okay, seeing none, thank you, Brett. And with that, we'll turn to uh, Ryan Wolf. Ryan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and good morning, everyone. Yes, so, and I know this is, there's been a lot of discussion on this issue um, over the years. Uh, I, I do want to highlight. I don't. I don't want to read it, but I want to summarize some of the key points um, that the council has received uh, in uh, Janet Coit's response. Um, as, as Brett noted, uh, we received your letter uh, requesting a delay in the program 
um, highlighting concerns uh, with the cost. Um, wanted to extend the EFPs uh, in order to look into this, as well as the potential for exploring a program uh, similar to what the North Pacific is exploring, uh, looking into the use of cost recovery funds, um, uh, and also, as Brett mentioned, the potential um, for the Sole Source Authority and Magnuson. Uh, NIMS understands. We've we've heard your concerns. I know this isn't the first time that this has been uh, raised. Um, so we have had some extensive discussions uh, since the June meeting, um, not just with the West Coast region, but of course with headquarters, uh, with the Alaska region, uh, getting to understand a little bit more about that model. Uh, and having some discussions. Uh, and because of this, um, we would be willing uh, or excuse me, prepared to support extending the EFPs uh, for another two years. Uh, and in order to do this, there, there are two issues that, that we raise in the letter um, to help us uh, support this extension should the council wish to continue to pursue it. Uh, excuse me, delay and extension of the EFPs. Uh, first, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to extension of the EFPs, again, this is this is should not be new. We hear NIMPS uh, repeatedly just uh, casually remind that when we're extending or issuing or evaluating new EFPs, um, uh, it's helpful to have a little bit of understanding, uh, a rationale for the purpose and goals for those exempted fishing permits. Uh, and second, although NIMS has previously funded this, uh, as you remember the last delay, uh, we had a, some additional funds available due to surveys that did not go out from the pandemic. However, um, we have no identified funding for these costs beyond FY21. Um, so for FY22 in particular, uh, we'll need to find, uh, we'll need to ensure that the video review can be funded. And this may require a mechanism uh, for industry to reimburse specific states um, directly, if at least for some uh, of the costs. Um, so those are the issues that we raised. Uh, I do not see um, any issues with NIMPS supporting uh, a delay. Um, if we can touch on those. Uh, the next steps, however, um, will be, of course, to what to do over those next two years. Um, we would recommend the council uh, coordinate with the North Pacific um, and scope our own process here uh, to look at developing a consistent approach, um, maybe along similar timelines. We also note, you know, as we review it, since since it's a little bit different situation on the West Coast, especially as it relates to, to cost recovery, um, there may be other actions the council might want to take in parallel that that help uh, further un ensure uh, that that model would be successful. Uh, and if so, uh, not saying that is definitely what will happen, but if that does happen, again, um, to start looking into this as soon as possible, because I think the main point here is that, well, we acknowledge it, it, we definitely need at least two years to do this kind of substantive discussion and uh, analysis and to look into uh, a different type of program um, that two years also will come up quicker than expected. And so uh, it is something we would want to address uh, as we scope our future workload planning processes. So again, in kind of in, in closing, we, we agree that the collaborative approach taken on the West Coast has been responsible for the success of the EFP program so far. Well, we believe that collaboration um, will continue to be a successful um, component uh, of the program. Uh, so in summary, as I, as I mentioned, we NIMSI is prepared to support a delay in implementation. Um, I do want to note, while not in the letter, um, uh, some of those um, issues that were raised in the council letter, we, we, we just don't have answers at this point to those questions that were raised in June and in your letter. Um, we, we do have some concerns, such as our ability, for example, to 
have room and cost recovery to pay for EM video review looking down the road at, at, at the North Pacific model. But, but again, we, we fully support the additional time to vet the issues raised. Uh, and, and so we will continue to try to get firm answers to some of those key questions uh, that will help facilitate the council process over the next two years. And we'll look forward to bringing um, more concrete answers on those at a future meeting. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, questions for Ryan? Okay. Seeing that. Thanks, Ryan. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm sorry. I, I got my wrong panel up. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Um, and with that, uh, we will turn to um, to the gap and uh, I believe uh, Jeff Lackey is going to give the report. Jeff, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll be reading from agenda item C4A, Supplemental Gap Report 1, <clears throat> Report on Electronic Monitoring Final Action. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel reviewed the briefing book documents and received information from Mr. Ryan Wolf, National Marine Fishery Service, West Coast Region, under this agenda item and offers the following comments. The GAP appreciates NEMPS listening to the concerns of the Council and industry and attempting to find a path forward that works for everyone. The GAP recommends the Council move to delay the electronic monitoring program implementation for at least two years. The minimum of two years is required in part to coordinate implementation with the North Pacific program of similar design, which will help gain efficiencies of scale and standardize the process. The rationale for this path has been documented in past gap statements in June 2021 and March 2021. There are two primary items to be considered at this time in facilitating a continued EM exempted fishing permit in 2022 and 2023. First, EFP extension rationale. One focus item of the EFP work for extension into 2022 and 23 would be for industry and NIMPS to develop and test alternative catch handling protocols that are both cost effective for industry and provide sufficient monitoring and scientific data for NIMPS. The second focus item of the EFP work would be to reduce overall program cost, particularly for video review, in order to attract more participants once implemented. Second, <clears throat> funding for EM data review. Identifying funding for 2022 is first priority with 2023 to follow later. There are four potential sources of funding for 2022. First, appropriation. A 2022 appropriation of $400,000 specific for video review is a possibility, but if it were to work out, it wouldn't be until later this year. So three other avenues can be pursued in the near term. The second, uh, NIMPS funds. NIMPS is exploring the use of cost recovery and other funds. Third, repurposing a grant. Depending on the amount <coughs> of NIMPS funds available, there is an existing National Fisheries and Wildlife Foundation industry grant whose stakeholders have indicated repurposing a portion as possible to offset some of the cost of video review. The fourth, a new grant. Industry can apply for a new NIFWIF grant with matching industry funding, a 50-50 match, similar to what is done now for the North Pacific Pollock EMEFP. Further investigation is needed for this path, and that concludes the report. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, questions for Jeff on the uh, GAP report? Okay, thanks, Jeff. I see no hands. Um, with that, uh, that will take us to public comment. And uh, I see two signups, um, like Heather Mann, followed by uh, Britt Payne. Heather? Good morning, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. My name is Heather Mann, and I represent the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. MTC is a co-sponsor of the Whiting EM EFP and have um, been since the beginning, and I believe all active Whiting catcher vessels except one are utilizing electronic monitoring. Uh, MTC strongly supports the recommendations in the GAP report, and I encourage the council today to um, continue to your discussion from June and ask for a formal delay 
uh, implementing the regulatory program. I'm going to be brief uh, in my comments as much of the rationale and justification for today's recommendations has been presented to the Council um, through dozens of written and oral public comments over the last several years and even from the Council itself in the last two years you've had many uh, thorough discussions on the floor on this topic. Um, there's still some information that can be gleaned from operating under the EFPs for two more years, and this improve, uh, includes improving the catch handling protocols for bottom trawl and to some degree whiting. Uh, MTC applied for and received the NIFWIF grant with financing to explore uh, improving catch handling protocols in both sectors, and uh, we were granted um, that grant, that funding. We can also explore the best way to fund video review as we move forward with our regulatory program. So we'll be ensuring that the program is robust, robust but the uh, cost effective, um, both for the industry and for the agency. Um, it's become more apparent to me now than ever that accountability in all fishery sectors and gear types not just to support the child catch share program really is key to maintaining sustainable fisheries and exploring new opportunities. EM has a critical role to play in ensuring uh, that accountability. So it's important to get it right. I have also made a commitment on behalf of Midwater Trawlers Cooperative to repurpose some of the NIFWIF grant to support the video review by Pacific States under the 2022 EFP if a NIMPS uh, funding shortfall does exist. And I have shared that commitment in writing um, with the region. I do want to thank Ryan Wolf from the West Coast region for continuing to persevere in the incredibly difficult position uh, we have put him in. I previously described that position as caught between a rock and a hard place, with the rock being NIMPS headquarters and the hard place being me and other stakeholders. Um, I do believe that Ryan is sincere in his efforts and desires to see a cost-effective and workable program that stakeholders embrace, and he is working hard to secure a successful future for that program, and I think it's important to recognize him for those efforts. Lastly, I want to thank the council members, all of you, for really listening to your constituents, for understanding the importance of EM, not just for current users, but as a tool that can be used in all our federal fisheries for accountability. And as Julie Andrews said, quote, perseverance is failing 19 times and succeeding the 20th, end quote. And I feel really good about the direction we're heading in and the renewed collaborative working relationship between uh, the leadership in the region and the industry. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, uh, Heather. Uh, questions for Heather? Okay, thanks, Heather. Um, next, we'll go to Brett Payne, and, and uh, he'll be followed by uh, Jacob Isaac uh, Lowry. Brett? Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the Council. Uh, uh, this is Brent Payne, the Director of Natty Catcher Boats. Uh, I'm, I'll be very brief here. Um, I, I want to start my, my statement by saying the members of UCB that participated in the whiting fishery, um, all of our members, uh, except one, <laughs> we have a common member with MTC, uh, are using the camera system and are members of the current EFP. Uh, we greatly appreciate the efforts of, of Ryan Wolf and his staff and the, the, the headquarters staff of National Fisheries Service in, in submitting uh, the response letter to the council's letter. We greatly appreciate and thank the council for, for sending, uh, agreeing to send a letter to, to NIMPS at, at your last uh, um, meeting. Um, and we're, we're, we really feel we're in a great place here. So we really wanna thank the participants that, that led us to be where we are here this morning. Um, but in saying that, we do have a little bit of work to do now. And, um, and I, I I think uh, the, the agency's letter, uh, you know, highlights a, a couple things. One is um, there's kind of a two-step approach we feel, and the first step is to to justify the extension of the EFPs, and then secondly, um, I think the council needs to think about how they're going to approach um, thinking about doing a redo of the, the existing regulatory program and and the uh, and the rulemaking that that would have gone into effect at the beginning of next year but that's for another day, I believe. So specific to uh, justification for an EFP, um, 
I think the, the, the gap statement uh, provides some of that justification. I, I would say for, for United Catch Boats, we, we, we have two EFPs going right now uh, that we're members of. One is for the North Pacific Pollock Fishery, and then one is uh, the continuation of the EFP down here for, for whiting, for EM. Uh, many uh, of the boats uh, participate in both of those EFPs that are members of UCB. Um, so one of the things we haven't done is, is kind of compare the elements of, of the, the North Pacific's Pollock EFP with our EFP down here. And I think there can be some synergy there uh, in doing that. So that affords us the opportunity to look at what the requirements are for our EFP up north and compare that to the EFP down here. Both, both of them are, are, are have a, a, a you know, a, a, using the PAC states as the, as the sole entity to do the data review. Um, and um, I think that leads my, my next point is this issue of funding that, that uh, Mr. Wolf presented to you this morning. Um, we, we do have a NIFWIF grant with the, the Pollock program in Alaska. And we've had initially a NIFWIF grant that we applied for and received, you know, MTC and UCB for the, the first couple years of, of this program. Um, so we've been successful as trade associations of applying for and receiving NIFWIF grant money. So one of the options that you can see in the gap statement is, is, is redoing that again. So that's, that's a possibility as well. And we probably would try and pursue that if other avenues did not um, prove fruitful. So uh, we look forward to working with the council in a collaborative manner, like um, Heather Mann mentioned. Uh, when we work together, we, we can get, and then, so I, I'll just stop right there and if there's any questions, uh, but thank you very much for, for especially to Ron Wolf and, and, and you're, you're uh, taking the, the bull by the horns here. Uh, I think Fort Adlock, uh, you know, so, uh, I would say some, some rocks are softer than others. And unfortunately we have some soft rocks now, thanks. Okay, uh, questions for uh, Brett. All right, seeing none, thanks, Brett. Um, and next, we'll go to uh, Jacob uh, Isaac Lowry. Jacob? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and good morning, everybody. Um, can you all hear me okay? We can. All right, great. Sounds great. Um, well, I'd like to thank the council for the time this morning, um, and I'd like to begin. Uh, by noting that Flywire would like to thank the National, Mar National Marine Fisheries Service team for their extensive discussions at the regional and headquarters level, and that Flywire supports the proposed two-year delay to the EM regulatory start date under the conditions articulated by the agency. Flywire has worked closely with NIMF staff across multiple regions over time and have always found them to be gracious and very helpful. Flywire has experience with EM best practices developed in other regions that could make sense to align on the West Coast. And we look forward to continue engaging with the agency to support a consistent, effective national effort to provide American fishermen with digital monitoring alternatives that make sense for their businesses. Flywire also agrees with the council that offering up the urgent an ongoing need to continue investigating efficient catch handling and discard options for EM use in the trawl catch share fishery makes sense as the primary justification for another extension of the existing EM EFPs. However, one question that seemed to be glossed right over in the gap discussion Wednesday was how exactly this latest extension to investigate catch handling would deliver material results where 10 years of previous efforts have yet to meaningfully resolve the fundamental underlying issues. If we're serious about breaking out of the performative ritual of goalpost moving we seem to have been trapped in for the last few years, we're gonna have to put in place real quantifiable metrics for measuring success. And honestly, it would make a lot of sense for the agency to prioritize upfront the establishment of objective metrics for measuring how well different EM approaches meet the various needs of different sectors and fleets, from fishing characteristics to supply chain relationships. Metrics are what keep us from getting sucked into a single narrative and losing track of what does and does not 
work for everyone else. Metrics are how we make sure that one fleet doesn't get forced into subsidizing the monitoring costs of another. And metrics are how we make sure that every boat always has equitable access to their best monitoring options. Firewire has a ton of experience developing these exact types of metrics and is happy to engage with the agency to drive an inclusive, transparent process that gets this done expeditiously. Firewire also intends to remain engaged with the agency and participate fully in the upcoming regulatory deep dive review. Firewire has been ready to compete for market share in this region for several years, and we love what we have in store for the region's fishermen. Flywire's patented hardware offers boats cost recovery opportunities unlike anything that's been demonstrated in the existing EFPs. Flywire's data review software is more efficient than the tools used by Pacific states, and our AI is already years ahead of what the existing EFP holders are currently working on. Flywire built these tools, owns these tools, and did it all in-house. Ultimately, when compared to the existing EFP program, Flywire is offering a differentiated approach to EM implementation. Flywire and our investors are confident our differentiated approach will provide boats better value at less cost than the current anti-competitive sole source EFP model. Power has a good understanding of where we are in this process and has actively participated for several years. We just didn't maintain a very high profile. And we understand now that in order to find an actionable path forward, one that respects the fundamental economic rights of private businesses and does not exclusively indulge the existing EFP holders' apparent anti-competitive impulses. Firewire is going to have to be more interactive, and we look forward to engaging with the agency to ensure equitable access for all stakeholders in achieving this outcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jacob. Questions for Jacob on his testimony? Uh, Krista Swinson. Krista? Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair, and I um, thank you for your testimony, Jacob. I uh, Originally, I had a different question, but I think you kind of answered that one um, in terms of bringing up metrics. I was going to say, is there anything we should consider um, during the two-year period? Um, so I'm, I'm hoping, just because you didn't really specify like what a potential metric could be, can you give me an example or two just so that I'm clear about what you're talking about? Yeah, sure. Um, and honestly, I think that's a great question, Krista. Um, you know, I think high level, you know, obviously one of the easy ones is uh, cost, um, but doing that in kind of a, a consistent measurable way. So you're actually comparing apples to apples, which is a little bit different than what's been done this far. I think one of the other ones that people don't really talk about is actually quantifying what catch handling means. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to get into how you can actually measure the additional uh, labor costs, time impacts of, you know, catch handling methodology that the existing EFP is using versus the alternate methodology that Flywire deploys. Um, so there's a lot of really great ways to start getting at, um, beyond just a cost number, what does it really mean when we say an EM program that boats want to use, right? Because if it was just cost, we wouldn't be in a position right now where we have boats who are actively paying tens of thousands of dollars a year to not participate in a program that was originally designed 10 years ago for them. Um, so I think it's it's really important that we actually broaden the way we think about metrics and do it in a more scientifically rigorous way that's consistent with how it's been approached in other industries with great success over a period of several decades. Um, beyond that, uh, I think this would be a great opportunity to engage with the agency uh, and really kind of jumpstart this two-year process and get it off onto a great foot uh, to make sure that all of the stakeholders were working uh, together instead of everybody just fighting with each other with all this hos hostility. So. Uh, optimistic, like everybody else, about the change in direction here, and really excited about the potential to get under the hood and put together a program that's going to work a lot better than um, than what we've been looking at. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Vice Chair. Yeah, thank you, Krista. Um, further questions for Jacob? 
Okay. Thank you, Jacob. Yep. Thank you. All right. That uh, that will take us to uh, public comment. And I, I mean, uh, <laughs> council discussion, I should say. Um, and um, I'll look for uh, a hand. Still looking for a hand. Phil Anderson. Phil? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Vice Chair, and good morning. Um, well, to, when you are ready, I will have a motion to put forward. Um, I think um, just, you know, in general, I share a lot of the thoughts that were expressed uh, by members of the public, in particular, in terms of acknowledging National Marine Fisheries Service willingness to take into account in a very serious way the concerns that the council expressed in its letter. So that one, uh, that one, the expectation is. Um, and um, I, I really appreciate the work that the West Coast region did, particularly calling out Ryan Wolf, but I know he and as well as other staff members in the West Coast region really went to bat uh, for us. Um, and I appreciate uh, NIMS headquarters as well, recognizing um, that we can uh, make a much better program if we take just a little bit more time to work through some of the outstanding issues uh, that have been identified. So uh, those are just some overarching um, comments, and uh, I do, as I said, have a motion to propose uh, when you're ready for that. Yeah, thank you, Phil. Um, it's a, uh, you're completely accurate there, I think, in your overview of uh, the situation. Uh, I know I was, personally, I was pretty worried about uh, where we were headed um, in this last couple of meetings. So, but anyway, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And Phil, so thank you so much for those comments. They're right along the lines of my feelings as well. I really appreciate Ryan and members of his staff that have dedicated so much time to understanding the council position on this that's been long, long held. And and I I, I like the direction we're headed. I also I, I, I you know I like the open, transparent. Uh, communications that have been going on since our for quite a while now on this with with Ryan and and his staff. So I think it's a it's a it's an, a way better place than we than I felt we've been in a while. So thank you, Ryan, so much. I also would like to thank the Gap for a really well thought out statement and that addressed a lot of the. Um, a lot of the issues that were raised in in the letter from uh, from Janet Coit, and I I do uh, I, I do think that's a really good path forward. Also, thank the the agency, the industry as well on this that that they've come forward and and really engaged and tried to see ways to fund this and to see the way forward. I I would point out <clears throat> that it's the fifth paragraph where. NIMS encourages the council to coordinate with North Pacific Fishery Management Council and scope its own process to develop, look at developing a consistent approach. I think that scale, economy of scale, and understanding going into the future could really help us. So I think it's important to take heed of that and understand that we need to work together as the two regions to come uh, to find a way to, to do this in a cost-effective and efficient manner. So I, I I really appreciate that in that guidance as well. So um, <clears throat> I would I I just wanted to get those thoughts out there. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Um, anyone else? Yeah. 
And if not, I maybe would look for that motion. So Anderson, Phil. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and thanks to Sandra and Chris for helping me with this. Um, I would move that the council recommend to National Marine Fisheries Service a two-year delay in the implementation of the ground fish electronic monitoring program for all trip types, thereby establishing a start date for the use of EM on fishing trips of no earlier than January, January 1, 2024. In addition, the council recommends that National Marine Fishery Service extend the ground fish electronic monitoring EFP through uh, strike the, if you would please, I made a mistake there, through, 20, through 2023 and then also strike the word fishing after 2023, you would please. So it would read, electronic monitoring EFP through 2023 to collect. So the word that, there you go. I'll start over on the second piece. In addition, the council recommends that National Marine Fisheries Service extend the ground fish electronic monitoring EFP through 2023 to collect additional valuable information that will lead to a more successful, stable, and economically viable EM regulation. That concludes my motion and the language on the screen is accurate. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Second by Bob Dooley. Uh, Phil, you want to speak to your motion? Yes, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and my um, verbalization here, the rationale uh, couldn't begin to uh, equal what we have heard from um, our advisory panel, our groundfish advisory panel, members of the public as we work through this, this issue. And much of the justification for this motion is also contained in the council's July 21, excuse me, yeah, July 21st, 2021 letter uh, to um, Janet Coit, the Assistant Administrator for Fisheries of NOAA Fisheries. Um, so my comments here just augment uh, to some degree what has already been put forward in terms of the rationalization, the rationale for this, this motion. Um, I want to start out just by saying what I hope is the obvious that the council has a strong desire to continue working collaboratively with NIMS and the affected stakeholders to develop and implement a program that effectively meets our goals and objectives with particular emphasis on the cost effectiveness of this program. The council and the industry still think that if, that the future success of the ground fish fishery hinges on successful cost effective and flexible monitoring program. Uh, but we we remain uh, concerned about how the program will be funded by the industry uh, and National Marine Fisheries Service in, in the future. And, and that is a big part of the reason for the delay to work through some of those uh, challenges. We also want to, we want to build on our, on our successes that we've achieved with the EFP. Um, I mean, this has been, I think, without question, a very successful program. Uh, and, and we want to, again, build on that. We don't want to take a step back here and make it less, less efficient, less cost effective uh, as we move forward. In, partic in part, 
we need to have some additional time uh, to work and examine ways to develop mechanisms for the industry to fund video review and storage um, and reduce the concerns regarding confidentiality and federal record retention. The council believes that an additional delay and extension of the EM EFP through at least 2022 is needed to continue investigating efficient catch handling and discard options that could provide lower costs and encourage more acceptance of electronic monitoring in the trawl catch share fishery. And we want to establish a cost effective funding mechanism again for the video review and storage that is consistent with other EM programs across the regions. We have, um, we acknowledge the two um, conditions, I guess I'll call them, um, and or recommendations that were contained in the recent letter that the council received from Janet Coy on September 3rd. And Mr. Wolf uh, spoke to those here earlier as he summarized the letter. And the first one was to explain the purpose and goals of the proposal to continue the EM program under an EFP. And as I mentioned, and as the GAP and our public uh, test, uh, uh, members of the public testified that we do have an opportunity here by continuing implementation of the EM program under the EFP to, con to investigate efficient catch handling and discard options. Um, and that in turn could encourage some additional participants in the EM program. I think in particular the ground fish uh, bottom trawl um, vessels. And then, as I also said in my earlier remarks, is that funding, a funding mechanism for the video review and storage that is consistent with the EM programs across other regions um, is an additional um, and important piece to allowing uh, us to work through those issues and come up with the most cost-effective way of paying for those costs. In, there, in the letter that we received from Janet Coit, the second piece had to do with funding. And, I, and, and they have made it clear, and they did it again here in the letter, that while there is some funding available to assist with the industry's um, costs uh, in 2021, uh, those funds don't exist, at least at this point in 2022. And so it's going to take a real concerted effort, which I think the industry has demonstrated that they are, are, are going to step up and have stepped up to the plate to help find that funding. Because it's been clear all along that one of the concerns that National Marine Fisheries Service has had about extending this further is that industry needs to start to uh, um, begin to offset the costs associated with video review and, and data storage. And I think as we heard in testimony in particular from Mr. Payne, as well as um, Ms. Mann that uh, they, they have some funds identified already they are ready to step up and do their part, which is not surprising. They have been doing that all along as we have uh, worked through the development of the EM program and the process of moving it into regulation. So Mr. Vice Chairman, those are my um, uh, comments and rationale behind the motion that I put before the council uh, for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, discussion on, uh, on Phil's rationale. Uh, 
uh, Ryan Wolf, right? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. I, I just have a clarification question on the motion. Is this the appropriate time for that? Um, sure. Okay, and Bill, thank you for the motion and thank you for speaking to it. Um, I just one minor clarification. I know we talk about um, the kind of a in, in terminology kind of a reference to a single EFP, but but technically, uh, the way we administer it at NIMS, uh, we actually have a couple EFPs. For example, um, the fixed gear is separate from the trawl EFPs. So. Uh, I don't think an amendment is needed. I just wanted to clarify that your intent is to extend, you know, all of the EFPs that currently make up uh, the electric, electronic monitoring uh, program. Thank you. Phil? Yeah, Mr. Vice Chairman, and thanks, Ryan. That was uh, my error in, in not uh, making that clear in that second part of the motion, and, and you are correct. It is to extend the EFPs uh, that are currently in place that implement our electronic monitoring program um, uh, through 2023. Uh, so yes, your, your uh, interpretation was correct and I apologize for my error. Okay. Thank you, Ryan, for the, that clarification. And Phil, for the, oh, Maggie Summer, Maggie? Thank you, Vice Chair. I uh, wanted to thank Mr. Anderson for the motion and speak in support of it. Uh, I, I um, as has been said, I, I echo all of the appreciation that has been expressed for the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, Ryan and West Coast Region staff uh, in particular. But also, uh, I am sure there's been a lot of work going on uh, at the headquarters level there and uh, appreciation for all of the work that industry has been putting into this for a very long time and the um, solutions that have been uh, developed and, and brought forward, uh, including the potential uh, near-term funding solutions. It, in, in thinking about this issue, it, it certainly stands out to me that as a council, we are working to address a variety of challenges across the groundfish sector under multiple agenda items. Um, and uh, many of those relate to the cost and efficiency of, uh, of operations. And this is uh, really a, um, a highlight in that area and a tremendously important one uh, to make progress on. And uh, I, I think that this motion will uh, provide us with the time to um, move forward and do that, uh, but also to continue the, the important work exploring some of these uh, challenges and, and, and learning more about how to best implement EM uh, through the EFPs. The importance of accountability was mentioned earlier uh, I, I um, can't agree more with the, the importance of that to uh, our, our knowledge, to public knowledge, to um, knowledge among the industry itself of, uh, the, of fishing operations and the effect on our, our managed stocks, and can't overemphasize the value of EM tools in advancing that goal of accountability at the vessel level, at the sector level. Um, and the importance of, of continuing work under the EFPs to address these questions uh, related to catch handling and the best application of EM systems uh, on a wide range of, um, of different vessel and operation types. Uh, I'll just say, Mr. Anderson referred to building on successes of the EM EFPs. Uh, we have a great opportunity to do that, and I think also to build on um, what have been very clear successes. Uh, it hasn't been an easy path, but I, I think we um, there have been there's been some great progress made, and and we can build on some success in the collaborations and and the relationships that have gotten us here and will keep us moving forward. So thank you for the motion. I'll be pleased to support it. Thank you, Maggie. Further discussion. Uh, Krista Swenson. Krista? Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair. I um, also want to support the motion, um, and I 
I really appreciate the thought that's gone into the motion um, and the clarification that's gone into the motion um, and wanted to express my appreciation for, for NIMS and the work that has been done there, um, as well as with industry um, to really come in and identify both problems and solutions. Um, I do want to urge a little bit of caution in terms of as we progress, um, when we're talking about um, expanding to regions or working with regions. And I see a lot of crossover um, in working with the North Pacific um, in terms of many of our vessels participate in distant water activities by going up there. And I do think that there is a lot of crossover. Um, and I realize that this is a ground fish program, but when we talk about expanding to other fisheries and or potentially other gear types, um, the conversations that are going on in HMS and, and particularly with regard to um, longline are very, very different. Um, and so I do think that the um, metrics question uh, that I asked today, which, which does relate to it, I was wondering really what, um, what we should be looking out for as we work through this program that could potentially impact others. Um, and that's because we're having conversations on uh, EM in correspondence to blockchain. We're having conversations about EM being used um, for social accountability, including facial recognition. And I certainly am not advocating for that, but I do think privacy concerns um, will continue to be there. And so I don't believe that this program um, as it is necessarily will be a fit for everybody. And I, I do think that just making stakeholders aware that yes, there's the opportunity for crossover, but but we will need to continue with EFPs will be important. So I am, I'm supportive. I am very appreciative of the work that has been done, but I do want to urge some caution and in people thinking that there is um, maybe more crossover than there is for um, expansion to other fisheries. So thank you. Thank you, Krista. Um, Bob Dooley, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. <clears throat> and I'd like to thank Phil for a great motion, and I will be supporting it. Uh, I like the his rationale behind it was very complete. I would uh, I, I like all the comments by our fellow my fellow council members afterwards. And Krista, I think you brought up some very good points. I would like to speak a little bit about the collaboration with the North Pacific, and I think we're in a, a pretty unique situation as a region in that we have a lot of industry crossover on focused on this particular item of 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 this this em program that's that's in regular that is you know in, in, that it, uh, regulations have been developed for and we're looking to delay i think we need to work together with the north pacific because in on their on their program as they develop within the next two years to get that collaboration and consistency. And I would urge the agency to do that. But also, please don't leave behind the industry and collaborate with them as well, because we do have such a close working relationship with those with the sector that uh, that is mirrored to our uh, EM program that we currently have. So I think that, that those voices are entrenched in the North Pacific as well as here. And I think the collaboration between the agency as well as the council, as well as the regions would, you know, and, and making sure that our, our, our participants, our industry is involved in those conversations would help to, to make this a, a, a smoother process. So I, that, that's a comment I would make. And uh, as we go forward, and I, once again, I really appreciate the, the, transparency and the openness and the communication that we've started here. So I think in, um, I, I will be supporting this motion. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Further discussion? Cool. 
Okay. Um, seeing uh, no more hands, um, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, the motion passes uh, unanimously. And uh, I'll look to Brett to uh, see how we're doing on C4. Brett? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, you have completed your action as far as the delay of the implementation of the program and extending the EFPs. I am looking for a little bit of guidance on sort of the, the future of this. I know it's a little murky about the next steps, but if there are thoughts from the council about how um, you'd like council staff to engage in this or just to wait and see how things go and work on the side with National Marine Fisheries Service to strategize about the, the coming year and or two years, um, we can do that. I just want to check in with you on that. Yeah, okay. Um, does any uh, council members have any comments this time or maybe we can deal this with uh, future planning? If not, uh, Phil Anderson. Phil? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Brett. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in particular, I'm thinking about the items that we referenced in our rationale for the motion in terms of the extension of the EFPs. Obviously, the funding side of it is one, um, and there's both some short-term, as in the next couple of years, issues, as well as the longer term which in my mind is going to um, in part rely on National Marine Fisheries Service, NOAA General Counsel um, to, you know, reconcile what's going on here versus the North Pacific, what, what Magnuson Act allows, you know, those types of things. Um, but on the other, the other part where uh, uh, and I think I think Heather spoke to this in her testimony, and it was in our letter as well about uh, the potential of investigating catch handling discard options that um, we need to we need to figure out exactly what it is um, that we will be uh, asking if is that something we're asking for a particular set of, of um, experiments, if you will, um, uh, on boats that are using EM, um, and how do we go about uh, putting those together, the, the protocols and, and um, what exactly it is, and, and documenting, you know, what what happens if we're looking at different approaches. So I think that's the piece that I'm. I, I don't have an answer for it right now, but uh, I don't want us to get through the next year or two and not have, not follow through on that part of the extension of the EFP rationale. So I don't. None of that was particularly helpful, probably, but because I'm not exactly sure where where that work gets done, and um, the the EFP uh, uh, sponsors um, are probably the ones that need to think about that maybe first, and we'll probably have some good ideas um, to bring forward. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Um, anyone else? Okay. Okay, Brett, back to you. Okay, thank you for that information. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, I will look forward to maybe some discussion under workload planning if there is anything that uh, the council would like uh, for council staff to, to work on or reconvene a gem pack meeting, things like that. Um, but we can ruminate on that for the week. Thanks very much. I think it closes this agenda item. Okay, thanks, Brett. 
And uh, with that, um, I will turn the gavel back to uh, Chair Grolick. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. A uh, great job, great work by the council on that agenda item. Um, so let's get started on agenda item C5, a sable fish gear switching. Uh, we'll get, uh, I'll hand the mic over to Dr. Seeger here in a moment to give us an overview and then uh, see if you have any questions on the overview and then move right into the presentation. So, Jim. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Jesse and I will be uh, presenting a PowerPoint here. Uh, if you can uh, go ahead and give Jesse control here, we'll, we'll use that PowerPoint for the overview as well as the rest of the presentation. Uh, we'll have a lot of uh, opportunities uh, for uh, council questions as we go along the way. Uh, you can anticipate about, uh, uh, about 30 minutes uh, for my section uh, going over the alternatives. That, then that might be a good break point if you decide you want one. And then there'll be another uh, 30 minutes or so uh, where Jesse will be uh, presenting. So uh, gear switching, uh, range of alternatives, agenda item C5. We're here this morning to uh, talk about your action is to adopt a range of alternatives and provide other guidance as appropriate. You might recall that initially you slated selection of a range of alternatives for last November, uh, but then decided it would be best to first select a maximum gear switching level, uh, which you did at your April meeting. Uh, at that point, you set a maximum to 29% uh, based on the average amount of gear switching from 2011 to 2000. I think it's 16 or 18. Um, and uh, right now you have three SAMTAC alternatives that are on the table uh, that we, we've been working with. Um, also, as a reminder, last fall, there were other alternatives that have been proposed in public comment, and there was some hope that industry members might work together to come up with uh, a consensus alternative. In thinking about the range and the guidance uh, you might consider, uh, whether or not the SAMTAC alternatives generally cover the scope of reasonable approaches to gear switching limits, and whether there are any of those alternatives that might be eliminated at this point, or if another alternative is needed to have a complete range. You might also want to consider whether the individual alternatives are adequately specified, particularly with respect to the 29% maximum gear switching criteria. And finally, keep in mind that if there is anywhere that you can narrow the options within an alternative, it will be that much easier to review and digest the analysis produced in the next phase of this process. Right now, next action on this issue does not appear on the council's year at a glance planner. Uh, you do have a related agenda item next March, uh, the beginning of the scoping for the next trawl catch share review. I also want to note that somewhat related to this is the limit entry fixed gear sablefish review, uh, which will probably be showing up on your November agenda. Um, because around half of gear switchers also participate in that fishery, there may be some interaction between the provisions of that program and incentives for gear switching that you'll be wanting to think about. In addition to what you had in your advanced briefing materials, uh, there is a supplement that provides a graphic summary of the alternatives, uh, supplemental attachment five, and then you have uh, reports from the GMT and GAP that you'll be getting uh, later this morning. And as I mentioned for the main uh, presentation, I'll cover the uh, GMT or the SAMTAC alternatives, including key questions related to the 29% maximum. And then Jesse will go over an analysis of that 29% maximum criteria. So that's, that's uh, the overview before we get into the alternatives. Let me see if uh, there's any questions about that. And then uh, with the chair's permission, we will go into the, uh, the main presentation. All right, thanks, Jim. Any questions uh, so far? I'm not seeing any hands, so why don't you move forward, uh, Jim, with your presentation? Okay, great. Um, so I'll start with an overview, as I mentioned. Uh, provide, then I'll provide a couple uh, cross-alternative comparisons and then just discuss a little bit more about some additional range of alternative considerations in general before uh, passing it off to Jesse. As always, 
we have the no action alternative under which gear switching would continue unlimited in regulation, but limited by markets and so forth. Then there are three <coughs> action alternatives, each of which in one way or another restricts northern sablefish gear switching. So I do want to focus that uh, we are we are just talking about restricting northern sablefish. And uh, whenever we mention quota share and quota pounds, we're talking about northern sablefish quota share and quota pounds. So I'll take a moment to review the key provisions of the catch share program that relate to the gear switching issue and design of the alternatives that are uh, essentially part of the no action then. The first two cells in this uh, table uh, with the darker colors are the ones that create the opportunity to gear switch, right? They're in that a, a trawl permit's required to participate, uh, but vessels with a trawl permit can use any gear. Then moving to the center cell, uh, the regulations were met in 2017 to allow fixed gear and trawl permits to be registered on the same vessel at the same time, which made it easier for fixed gear vessels to fish both IFQ and the tier fishery. The remainder of the provisions I'm going to highlight are important to keep in mind as we work through the provisions of the action alternatives and their impacts. First, recall that any person can open a quota share account and acquire a quota share but a quota share account itself is not transferable. Then in the last column here, quota pound is issued to a quota share account and it must then be transferred to a vessel account in order to be used. And finally, there is a, a quota pound, a vessel quota pound limit of 4.5% and a control limit of 3% for Northern Sablefish quota share. So again, those are just some things to keep in the back of your mind as we go through the action alternatives and the analysis. So with respect to the action alternatives, some things to consider in evaluating the adequacy of the range of alternatives include first, <clears throat> the mechanisms for achieving a limitation on gear switching. Adequacy of the range of those mechanisms likely turns on factors like differences in the nature and distribution of the resulting impacts. The impacts of the limitation mechanisms will be strongly influenced by the degree of certainty you want in keeping to the 29% maximum criteria, the groups to which the 29% limit applies, or that maximum applies, and the time period or duration across what you want which you want the 29% criteria to apply, whether it's a, a short-term target, a long-term target, or both. So the three action alternatives each use a different mechanism to limit gear switching, and the mechanism is reflected in the short title of the alternatives. Under each alternative, there would be some gear switching opportunity provided to all participants, the first row of boxes here, and then additional leg opportunity, a legacy opportunity that might be provided for those that have a gear switching history, the second row of boxes. And that legacy opportunity is the same that we've uh, referred to in the past as a grandfather uh, opportunity. The allocation of the legacy opportunity would be based either on permit history or vessel industry history, as indicated in the last row here. Gear switching vessels list lease about 50% of their permits, so about half the time the vessel owner and permit owner are the same. So there may not be much difference for those individuals in this choice, but about half the time they are different entities, and so there's a, a substantial difference there. Focusing first on alternative one, <clears throat> when issued, all quota pounds would be deposited into quota share accounts as either trawl only or unrestricted gear, gear in, con in a constant proportion. And of course, unrestricted gear could then be used for gear switching. Except those with a qualifying history of using their permit to gear switch might be provided an option to designate a quota share account that would be opted out. In that case, 100% of the quota pound issued to that account would be unrestricted with respect to gear and therefore, as I mentioned, could be used to gear switch. The opt-out provision is the only legacy opportunity the SAMTAC specified as an option within an alternative. For all the other alternatives, the legacy opportunity is more integral to the alternative. 
Under alternative two, every trawl permit would be able to gear switch the equivalent of half <laughs> of a half percentage of quota pounds. And then those with a qualifying history of using their permit to gear switch would be provided a gear switching endorsement which would allow an amount of gears, a larger amount of gear switching opportunity. That endorsement might expire with the permit transfer or continue indefinitely. Under alternative three, any vessel with six qualifying trawl landings in a year would qualify as an active trawler and be able to gear switch 1% of the quota pound for that year and in the following year. So that would be an ongoing evaluation from year to year. Vessels with a history of gear switching would be able to get an exemption from this requirement at the start of the program and be allowed to do a limited amount of gear switching. While based on vessel history, the exemption would be attached to a permit designated by the vessel owner, and then it would expire when the permit is transferred to a new owner or a new individual is added to the permit. That then leads to some key questions that you'll want to consider in determining the degree to which the alternatives meet your 29% maximum criteria. Deciding what you want in relation to these questions will determine your constraints with respect to how many people qualify for legacy opportunities and the amount of gear switching you're able to provide to those receiving the legacy opportunities, as well as the amount of gear switching for any other IFQ fish, fishery participants that want to gear switch. First, if you want certainty of not exceeding 29%, then greater restrictions on the number of legacy qualifiers and the gear switching opportunities provided to each participant would be required. As we'll see in the analysis of 29%, there are a number of sets of alternatives and options for which it would be difficult to impossible to achieve 29% with certainty. Second, question, is it your intention that the 29% apply to all participants or only those receiving legacy opportunities? Again, the provisions can be less restrictive if the 29% only applies to legacy participants, uh, for example, than if it applies to all participants. Finally, is the 29% maximum criteria for now or after the legacy opportunities expire, essentially in the long term? I'm going to spend a little more time on each of the alternatives, repeating some of the things that I've said, but going into a little bit more detail. But my real main purpose here is just to orient you on this graphical summary that was provided to you as a supplement, uh, supplemental attachment five in your briefing materials. So the top half of this figure shows that all quota share accounts receive trawl only in any gear quota pounds in proportions of either 70, 30, or 90, 10, depending on the option selected. In this slide and the others, I'm not going to go and go to the list to go into a list of the qualification options, but we'll come back to those in a bit. Then there's the option to provide a legacy opportunity to qualifying limit entry permit owners in the form of an opt-out account. As I mentioned, those opt-out accounts would receive 100% of their quota pounds as any gear quota pounds, and importantly, quota share could be added to the to the account in the future and any gear quota pounds would be issued for that additional quota share that's added. The opt-out account status would expire with the expiration of the account or the addition of a new owner to an ownership group. And there's a conversion date option under which all trawl only quota pounds would become any gear quota pounds. And there are a series of options for you to consider there. A few other provisions to be aware of, uh, gear specific quota pounds percentages would be set in the FMP and vessels making trawl gear landings that have both types of quota pounds in their vessel account would be allowed to choose which type of quota pounds they use to cover that landing. Under alternative two, the first row of boxes here shows that all permits would have at least a 0.5% gear switching limit. And then those that qualify for a legacy opportunity would have the have a greater amount 
either their historic average for years fished or a 4.5% limit, which corresponds to the current annual vessel quota pound limit. Then you have options for endorsement expiration, either it would expire with new ownership or not. Then there is an option related to gear switching limit overages that applies to both vessels with endorsed and unendorsed permits. And the question there is whether if a vessel went over its per permits gear switching limit, would that reduce a permits following year limit or not? We also have listed here a summary of a number of other provisions that I'm not going to step through at this time. These cover permit transfers, sequential registration, and what happens when permits are combined. Finally, we have alternative three. Here the left side shows the opportunity for every trawl, trawl able vessel to become an active trawler and gear switch. And the right side shows the legacy opportunities. So the active trawlers would qualify annually with the six landings. And once qualified, that status would remain in place for the remainder of the qualifying year and all of the following year. Then the participants would qualify for the legacy opportunities at the start of the program based on a vessel's qualification. And the vessel owner would then designate a permit that would receive the exemption. Those exemptions would be able to gear switch either the 0.6% limit or an amount equivalent to the quota share they have owned continuously since the control date. These exemptions would expire with the addition of a new permit owner, and there's an option to limit the duration to 12 years at the most. There would be an overage provision that's similar to that which identified for alternative two, and it again applies to both the active trawlers and those with exemptions. And then with this alternative, though, there could be additional gear switchers targeting other species other than other than sable fish that are neither active trawlers nor vessels with exemptions, uh, but they would have to discard any northern sable fish taken as part of their gear switching activities. And as with the previous slide, there are a number of other provisions that I'm not going to go over in detail, except I do want to mention that Alternative 3 has this 10% backstop provision for each group. So 10% for the active trawlers and 10% for the legacy qualifiers, maximum of 20% for the two combined. If either group were to exceed their percentages, then in a subsequent year, the amount of gear switching opportunity that individuals would, re would receive would be scaled back to keep the group within uh, those 10% backstops. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the control date and the qualification requirements that I mentioned we would come back to. But first, I want to mention with respect to the control dates, as you know, to be effective, a control date has to have veracity. It, it has to be believed. So if a control date is announced, it's not used in an adopted policy, then that can have implication for what happens when a control date is announced in the future potentially creating management challenges if, announce, if announcement of a control date becomes a signal for new entry or expansion of activity by those already in the fishery. If post control date periods are used in the qualification requirement for current deliberation, then at some time in the future, when a control date is announced for a different program, it can provide an incentive for new entry and an incentive for existing entrants to increase fishing to ensure they meet qualification requirements. On the other hand, if post-control post date periods are not used in the qualification requirements, but are used in a recent participation requirement, then a few, at a future time, uh, the a future control date announcement might not be a signal for new entry since the activity would not allow any new activity would not allow for your basic qualification, but it might still provide an incentive for existing entrants to increase fishing to ensure they meet recent participation requirements. So with all that in mind, then let's take a look at the uh, qualification requirements. And I'm just gonna touch on these, uh, on these tables, um, the legacy opportunity qualification requirements for each of the alternatives. Note that the control date for this program is September 15, 2017, here shown in blue. Here you see the qualification sub-options listed down the side, on the left hand, left side. Uh, then the period of time over which the qualification must be met by the is represented by the color 
bars in the middle and the qualification amount on the right hand side. So for sub option A, you can see that one landing is required between the start of the program and the end of 2018. For sub option B, you can see that the qualifying period ends on the control date and the amount is 10,000 pounds for that entire period. You see a different period for sub option C. And then for option D, you can see that there are two ways to qualify. One is 30,000 pounds between 2011 and the control date, and the other is 30,000 from 2014 to 2018. Also, the SAM tax specified that sub options B and C might be combined at the time of uh, council preliminary and or final action. So, so to provide two ways of qualifying similar to what you see there in sub option D. Here we see a similar format for alternative two. Uh, options one and two, the qualifying uh, for options one and two, the qualifying amounts must be landed in each of three separate years rather than alternative one. It was a qualifying amount for the entire period. And there is an additional column here that has a recent participation sub option you could add that requires at least one landing in two, the 2016 to 18 period. You'll note for option three, there are two ways to qualify and there is no recent participation required for the second. And here, same table for the active trawler exemptions, two options similar to those uh, in alternative two, but here they're based on vessel history uh, rather than permit history, which is under alternative one, and you don't see the recent participation uh, column here. So a couple uh, cross alternative comparisons, uh, one for those receiving legacy opportunities and one for future new entrants. So, and with respect to those receiving legacy opportunities, <clears throat> under alternative one, any legacy participant would be able to expand their gear switching up to the 4.5% limit through a dish acquisition of additional quota share, plus in season uh, acquisition of any gear quota pound. In contrast, under alternative two, vessels with endorsed permits would be limited to either their historic average for years fished or be able to expand their gear switching activity up to the 4.5% limit, depending on the option that you selected, assuming if you selected on alternative two. And then under alternative three, legacy participants would generally be constrained below past levels, though there may be some exceptions. And they would not have an opportunity to expand their gear switching levels, except possibly by becoming an active trawler. Uh, and recall the active trawlers get the 1%, while the, uh, the basic legacy uh, permit gets 0.6%. Okay, next we'll look at the comparison for new entrants. Assuming that gear switching, a gear switching limit is adopted and the policies are placed well into the future, for much of the time, the impacts might relate more to the impacts on future rather than current participants. So we're going to look at the new entrant impacts here. So alternative one, new entrants could gear switch to the same level as legacy participants. They could do this by acquiring quota share and receiving either 10 or 30% of the quota pound uh, for that quota share as any gear quota pound and they can acquire quota pound in season in amounts up to the 4.5% limit. Under alternative two, the new entrants could gear switch up to the 0.5% level, but if gear switching endorsements do, don't expire and therefore are transferable, they also might be able to acquire one of those uh, endorsed permits and participate at a, at a legacy permit level. Under alternative three, a new entrant would have to be able to rig up and tr to trawl and qualify as an active trawler uh, through, <clears throat> though prior to expiration of the active trawler exemptions, they might be able to lease an exempted fish permit and fish up to the 0.6% limit. So finally, as a reminder, in thinking about the adequacy of the range of alternatives, it's important to, keep, to also keep an eye on both what is in the alternatives and the documentation of alternatives and options considered but rejected. 
We've been documenting alternatives and approaches that were considered but rejected early on, and you'll find a discussion of those in the section of the SAMTAC final report entitled Deliberations and the, and the second part of Appendix B to the report. Along these lines, it'll be important to articulate rationale for other alternatives and provisions considered but rejected as you move forward. Additionally, even if there is a relatively low likelihood that you would select an option, Sometimes it's easier and clearer to demonstrate something was considered, particularly as required by the MSA, for example, by incorporating a provision into the range. That's as compared to including it in a discussion of, th of things considered but rejected early on. For example, this became apparent when we worked through the Council of Deliberations in response to a lawsuit on the original Amendment 20, the trial, the trial quota program. And the council included initial allocation options that went beyond the control date in order to clearly demonstrate consideration of the recent participation as required by the Magnus and Act, Stevens Act, but ultimately did not select those options and stayed with their status quo selections. Similarly, if, for example, you were to eliminate alternative three, that's the only alternative that has a qualifier based on vessel history. So if that were to happen, you might want to consider whether to include a discussion of the vessel qualifier as an option considered but rejected, or to modify another alternative to include vessel-based allocation so it would be considered and discussed as part of the range. So Mr. Chairman, that com completes my uh, overview or look at the range of alternatives. We can stop here for questions and then uh, proceed as you'd like, uh, either with a break or to Jesse's presentation. All right, uh, thanks very much. Um, I'd like to give folks an opportunity to uh, ask some any questions right now, although we're also, you know, do for a break. So let's let's just see how many questions we have, see if any hands go up, uh, keeping in mind that uh, we'll have another opportunity to ask uh, questions uh, after um, the second part of the presentation. So any, any burning questions right now? I'm not seeing any hands. So before Jesse gets started, we will uh, take a break. Um, let's take 13 minutes, um, 9.27. We'll be back at 9.40, and we'll pick right back up with uh, Jesse's presentation, and then we'll entertain questions uh, on the entire presentation. And so 9.40.
All right, welcome back. It's 940. Um, before we go to Jesse's presentation, um, were there any questions that folks uh, thought of over the break that they want to ask Dr. Seeger? Uh, not seeing any hands. So uh, Jesse, welcome. And if you're prepared with your presentation, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Awesome. So good morning, everyone. So our last section of this presentation is covering the analysis of the alternatives relative to the 29% gear switching maximum adopted by the council in April and as discussed in attachment four. But before we get into looking at the analysis of the alternatives, we wanted to do a quick review of recent gear switching trends. Sablefish North is a highly attained species overall, with ACL attain attainment averaging 94% from 2011 through 2019. Over that same time period, IFQ attainment has been at 97% on average of the allocation. Of the allocation, an average of 31% is taken on average by gear switchers from 2011 through 2019, and that's been done by a total of 40 permits and 40 vessels. This graphic you've seen before, so on the top panel, we have our utilization percentage by gear switching vessels of the IFQ allocation, and then you have on the bottom, the number of gear switching vessels that participate each year from 2011 through 2019. From 2016 to 2019, the recent average has been 34% of the allocation has been gear switched with 15 to 16 vessels and permits participating in those years. So while recent levels have been above the proposed 29 maximum and have stabilized at those levels, there have been years in the past where the percent utilization by gear switching vessels has been less. Under no action, levels could remain similar to recent years or could change depending on factors such as market conditions, other fishing opportunities, or climate change. So next we're gonna talk a little bit about our analytical framework uh, for attachment four. 
And to start off with, I wanted to do a quick reminder before we get into the analysis of those three key questions Jim raised at the start of the presentation. So we're gonna dig into these three questions a little bit more and how they will relate to whether the alternatives meet the 29% criteria. To help shape the development of the alternatives, the council must consider if they want to use a certainty or projection-based approach. So under a certainty-based approach, the maximum amount of gear switching opportunity allocated would not exceed the 29%. However, actual gear switching amounts may be less than the 29%. For the projection-based approach, our analysis has quantitative results that are based on recent data and provides a projection of what the level of gear switching would be under each alternative, assuming that the past is representative of the future. If the council chose this method in structuring the alternatives, we would use that data to project whether the amount of gear switching would be at or below 29%. So this is really similar approach to what we do for our trip limit style management, where we set limits based on recent trends to reach but not exceed a level of harvest. With this approach, there is the potential to change limits to meet the goal if fishery conditions were to change. For example, the council may want to tweak legacy limits in the future to ensure that a maximum of 29% is not exceeded. We include in the analysis document, and I will be mentioning this frequently, that qualitative considerations need to be taken into account in evaluating the quantitative results. These considerations include things like future market conditions, ACLs, and even fishermen strategic responses to the policy themselves. We do not have a quantitative method for taking these considerations into account and therefore must leave it to policymakers to evaluate them and determine the degree to which they expect that you can rely on these quantitative estimates. The question of whether the council intends for the 29% to apply to only legacy participants or to all entities will ultimately impact the qualifying requirements and the amount of gear switching allowed by the legacy and non-legacy participants. For all alternatives, the legacy opportunities may or will expire over the long term. This means that the amount of gear switching opportunity will or may change over time. This leads us to our final question. Is the 29% maximum for the short term or both the short and long term? Now, if the 29% is only applied to the short term, in other words, prior to the expiration of a legacy opportunity, then the council may want to consider if there is a separate long-term objective for example, a lower level of gear switching or an ultimate phase out. Based on the current suite of SANTAC alternatives with minor modifications at most, this table presents an overview of whether the 29% maximum is achieved when applied to both legacy and non-legacy participants over the short term or again, prior to the expiration of those legacy opportunities. This analysis shows that achieving less than the max with certainty is unlikely for all alternatives as they currently stand with the exception of the no opt-out option under alternative one. Over the long-term though, if expiration provisions were included, some of these alternatives would be within the maximum. On the projection-based side, most alternatives appear to have gear switching being within 29%. Although again, it is important to remember as we go through this analysis that these projections are based on current conditions and these can change over time. So now let's take a deeper dive through each alternative on how we got to these conclusions. For each alternative, we are gonna walk through both certainty and projection-based approaches and how the result may vary if applied to either legacy or to all participants. 
Now, we're only going to discuss each of the these alternative impacts on the short term, which would be before any legacy opportunities expire and could be thought of as the first few years after implementation. However, there are discussions of long-term impacts in attachment four, and we would be happy to answer any questions related to those discussions. And before I get into discussing the individual alternative analysis, I wanted to stop here and see if there were any questions. All right, uh, thanks, good, good pause. Uh, let's see if there are any questions thus far. And I'm not seeing any hands, I'm not sure how to interpret that, but please go ahead, Jesse. <laughs> Sounds good. So moving on to alternative one, our gear specific quota pound alternative. So first we're gonna look at the certainty based approach under alternative one. Under alternative one, the first main decision point is the amount of gear specific quota pound that would be is issued as trawl only versus any gear. The current options recommended by the SAMTAC are option one at 70% trawl only, 30% any gear, and option two at 90% and 10% respectively. The second main consideration for alternative one is the opt-out provision where a qualified limited entry permit owner could select a quota share account to receive all of their quota pounds as any gear. For quota pound option one, the opt-out is an option. For quota pound option two though, the SAMTAC recommended that this option only be considered with an opt-out. So starting, we're gonna start with looking at the no opt-out option with quota pound option one. In order to make the total amount of gear switching less than 29% for certain for all participants in the, in the short term, this alternative would need to be modified to 71% trial only and 29% any gear. And I wanted to note that as we move through this presentation, on the top right hand corner of your screen, there will be a square um, that shows whether we're discussing the combinations for all participants or looking at it in that legacy only view. So under the opt-out provision, if all participants gear switching were to count towards the 29%, there could be no opt-out accounts to be certain that there was no more than 29% gear switching. Under option two, up to six quota share accounts could be opted out to have the total amount of potential any gear quota pounds remain under 29%, including non opt out accounts, and the ability for the six opt out accounts to accumulate up to 3%. Now, these numbers are only specific if the council's intent was to have the 29% apply to all participants. So that's legacy and then those that would not qualify for an opt-out. If the council wanted the 29% to just apply to those legacy participants, even if the total amount of any of your quota pounds available would be in excess of the max, then up to eight quota share accounts could be issued under either option for an opt-out. The last main decision point within alternative one that could affect gear switching levels is the conversion date, where all trial only quota pounds would convert to any gear at a specified date. The conversion date provision of alternative one would not provide for any certainty that the amount of gear switching would remain within 29%. While the goal of our analysis was to project the amount of, in, of gear switching under each alternative compared to the 29% maximum, ultimately for alternative one, the actual projections we were able to make were on the amount of any gear quota pounds that, were avail that may be available under each qualifying option. 
In projecting the amount of any air quota pounds that may be available under any qualification option, there are two main uncertainties to keep in mind. That is, which quota sh share account would the permit owner select and how much quota share is actually in that account now or could be in the future. For this analysis, we attempted to link quota share accounts to qualified permits under the current qualification options by assessing common ownership across the permits and quota share accounts or where there were strong linkages between quota share accounts and vessel accounts. Now, regardless of our confidence in some of these designations, there is significant uncertainty around these projections. A discussion of these issues related to uncertainty can be found on page seven of attachment four, and I'd be happy to answer any questions on this issue if there are any. Under gear specific quota pound option one with an opt out, it is estimated that between 19 and 44% of quota pounds would be issued as any gear to those opt-out quota share accounts, depending on the qualifying criteria. This range is based on the ability that we were able to identify quota share accounts for 29 of the 38 permits that could qualify. For the remaining nine permits, we assumed zero quota share was opted out for our lower end projection, which this might be an example of where a permit owner chooses to open up a new quota share account. And at the upper end, we assumed that each of those nine quota share accounts would opt out the average amount of quota share we saw across the 29 identified quota share accounts, which was 1.03%. In total, when considering the amount of any gear quota pounds issued to non-opt-out accounts, there could be between 44 and 61% of quota pounds issued as any gear. In terms of the actual level of gear switching, there are several factors to consider. First is that the, the amount of any gear quota pound available could be an underestimate given it is impossible to determine if these are the quota share accounts that would be selected and how much quota share could be added into those accounts in the future. Additionally, gear switching levels would likely be beneath the amount issued as any gear, as gear switching participants would have to sweep up quota, pound, quota pounds from all of the non opt out accounts in order to reach these levels shown in the yellow box. Further, given that there have been only 15 to 16 recent vessels participating in gear switching, but nearly or over double that number of permit owners receiving an opt-out provision under the current suite of qualification sub-options, it is likely that some of these quota share accounts would use their any gear quota pounds for trawling activity. Additionally, factors such as market, market conditions, opportunities in other fisheries that affect the gear switching level under no action would also impact gear switching levels here as well. Under gear specific quota pound option two, which would require the opt out under the SAM tax recommendation, we would still have the same amount of any gear quota pounds from opt-out accounts as was shown in the previous slide. Combined with the remaining quota share accounts though, which would only receive 10% of their quota share as any gear quota pounds, the estimated totals of the any gear quota pounds would be between 27 to 49%, depending on the sub option and scenario. The same factors that would influence the gear switching level under quota pound option one would still be relevant here. However, compared to the previous option, there would likely be a lower utilization of those non opt out quota pounds as each of those non opt out quota share accounts may only receive a few any gear quota pounds. 
this would mean that it would take a lot of time and money to gather up all those individual quota pounds from all the accounts. Therefore, gear switching levels would likely be less than that of gear specific option one. For each of the alternatives, we provided a summary table of potential impacts under the various conditions related to the 29% maximum. So under no opt-out and gear specific option one, there would need to be a change in the percentages to 71% trial only and 29% any gear to ensure a maximum of 29% gear switching. But it is likely that gear switching would be within the 29% as quota pounds would be spread across all quota share accounts. While gear specific option two is not recommended by the SAMTAC without an opt out, if selected, it would have a maximum of 10% gear switching and the likely would be less in reality. On the bottom row, we have our summary of the opt out provision impacts. For the certainty approach for all participants, there could be no opt-out accounts under quota pound option one, but six could be permitted under option two. If the 29% were only to apply to legacy participants though, the council could opt out up to eight quota share accounts under either option. Looking at the projection-based approach under the opt-out, as previously shown, we were able to project the amount of any gear quota pounds that may be available under each gear specific quota pound option and qualification sub option. However, the actual amount of gear switching that would occur under each of these options is uncertain, given that the utilization of the any gear quota pounds is a function of several factors. This includes the ability to sweep up quota pounds for multiple quota share accounts, the actual number of entities that would gear switch compared to the number that may receive an opt out or any gear quota pounds, and then the ability for quota share to be added to each of the opt out accounts. And I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions because I know that's a lot of information to take in. <clears throat> Thanks, Jesse. It is a lot of information. Um, any questions? All right, please continue. Okay. Moving forward to alternative two, our gear switching endorsement. The current iteration of our alternative two um, does not allow for certainty of 29% as the 0.5% limit for all non-endorsed permits would be in excess of the 29% maximum alone. Therefore, we are providing comments on how the current alternative to structure could be modified to achieve a certain maximum of 29% gear switching. In order to achieve the 29% with certainty, the council will need to consider the trade-offs between providing opportunity to legacy versus all other participants. So as a reminder, there are two endorsement limit options for alternative two. Limit option one is the average percent of Sablefish North allocation taken in active gear switching years from 2011 through the control date. And limit option two is 4.5%, which is the same as the annual vessel limit. And then, shown here on the right hand side of the screen is we have our non-endorsed permits which would each receive a limit of 0.5 percent. So the first combination we're going to take a look at is endorsement limit option one applied to only legacy participants. Under the current suite of sub options for endorsement qualifiers shown in the table on your screen you could stay within the 29% maximum under all but qualification option one, which would mean that between 10 and 14 permits could be endorsed. Since the 29% would apply to legacy participants only in this situation, 
the 0.5% limit could remain for all other trial participants, noting that overall gear switching levels in this instance could be in excess of 29%. However, if the 29% applied to all participants and there were still 10 to 14 qualifying permits, the non-endorsed limit would have to be set to around 0.03% or about 1,750 pounds in 2020 in order to be certain to be within the 29% criteria. Moving on to endorsement limit option two, you could have a maximum of six permits, whether the 29% limit is applied to both legacy participants or to all participants. Again, if the 29% only applied to legacy participants, the 0.5% limit for all other permits could remain. However, if applied to all participants, and again, assuming that 6%, six permits were endorsed, the non-endorsed permit limit would have to be reduced to 0.01%, or about 580 pounds in 2020 in order to meet the 29% maximum. It is important to consider that the amount to the non-endorsed permits could increase marginally with fewer endorsed permits in this situation. So moving on to the projections for alternative two in our proposed methodology. For endorsed permits, we utilized the same random sampling methodology as we used for the no action analysis in April 2021. A description of this approach and a link to the April analysis can be found on page 13 of attachment four. Now with our projection methodology, it is important to remember that the biggest source of uncertainty with this approach is that we are using historical data to represent future conditions. For non-endorsed permits, while technically every other trial permit would receive a limit of 0.5%, it is likely that only a subset would utilize that limit to gear switch. For our analyses, we assumed that gear switching permits that would not qualify for an endorsement, but had recent history from 2016 to 2019, would continue to participate with a non-endorsed permit. And in that case, the gear switching amount would be the recent average of that permit or would be capped at the 0.5% limit. So here we have our projection-based results for endorsement limit option one. The endorsement, the endorsed permit percentage shown in the third column here on the screen is based on our median or risk neutral projection from the bootstrap analysis. Under endorsement limit option one, all of the scenarios are projected to be within the 29% limit, whether applied to just endorsed permits or to all participants. However, the level of gear switching by both endorsed and non-endorsed permits will again depend on market opportunities, overall allocation levels, and the other factors I've previously discussed. So for projections under endorsement limit option two, it is projected that the total amount of gear switching again would be within the 29% maximum, whether applied to just the endorsed permits or to all participants. Again, with this option, the amount of gear switching by each of these groups will depend on market and harvest opportunities. So let's take a look now at how alternative two relates to the 29% level across our certainty and projection-based approaches under the various options. To ensure certainty of being within the 29% for all participants, the council would need to assess the trade-off opportunity between legacy and non-legacy participants. As I mentioned, 
under the current proposed 0.5% limit for all non-endorsed permits, the alternative would not be certain to be within 29%. However, the council can change the percent limit for non-endorsed permits, as well as the number of endorsed permits to meet the goal of 29% if desired. If the 29% applied to legacy participants though, only to legacy participants though, all but one of the qualification options recommended by the SAMTAC would achieve the maximum under endorsement limit option one. For option two, there can only be a maximum of six endorsements. Under the projection-based approach, regardless of if the 29% applied to all participants or just the legacy participants, gear switching levels would likely be within the 29% under any of the proposed qualification requirements proposed by the SAMTAC. And I'm gonna pause here and see if there are any questions before moving on to the final portion of the presentation. All right, well, let's see if you have any more luck this time with any questions or any clarifications. Not seeing any, so carry on. Okay. Oh, wait, hold on, Phil has his hand up. Please go ahead, Phil. Uh, thanks, I think. Um, Jesse, on, this isn't necessarily applicable to just this last segment. And I'm sorry to, the, to even have to ask this, but so on the ones where you have um, if I can say this correctly, where the legacy, where you're only considering legacy in the 29% um, for um, the, the legacy um, portion of the gear switching participants. Am I, I'm just, I want to make, am I understanding that you're, when you look at at whether or not the 29% is being achieved or not, or, or gone over, that you're only looking at those legacy uh, boats, permits, and that gear switching that might be done by non-legacy would be in excess of the 29%. I don't know. I'm hoping the question made sense. Mr. Chair, Mr. Anderson. Yeah, I think I got you. So um, the reason Jim and I brought up this question, I guess I'll, I'll take one quick step back, was because um, there has been a lot of discussion with the council about, you know, wanting to, there's been discussions about allowing trawlers in the future. Like, do you still want to be able to have that ability to gear switch if you're a typical trawler versus, you know, this group of vessels and permits that are more that, that they only gear switch. And so for us, the legacy is the, that group that only gear switch. And so we wanted to evaluate this in those two different lenses. So there are cases, if you were to look at, let's say a legacy only, and I think that I'm gonna use one of these as an example. So um, like for alternative two, for example, um, in the legacy only case, if you were to have six permits that had an endorsement limit option two, you know, you would be at, I think it's like, I can do math in the short term, 27% uh, for that group of that group of gear switching vessels. But since you're only applying the 29% to that group, then that means that all of those other permits could theoretically gear switch, which would bring you above 29%, but it's up to the council, that kind of policy decision of whether you want to allow that kind of non, uh, or to allow all those other, maybe like a trawling vessel to participate as a, uh, with some gear switching versus allowing this higher amount of gear switching for maybe a more um, typical gear switching vessel. Does that help or is that more confusing? 
Yeah, um, <laughs> Mr. Ches no, th no, that really does help. I, I had, so in the, in the case where, um, the, the legacy permits, um, under what, under, well, let's say under this option two, these six permits would, would, um, take nearly all the 29% and there would be very little left for non-legacy vessels that wanted to take some portion of their sable fish quota pounds quote, uh, with fixed gear, there'd be very little left to accommodate that practice. Is that right? Mr. Chair, Mr. Anderson, yes, if you are looking like if you want to be absolutely certain that you do not exceed 29% by anybody, then this would be our example of you would have to actually, like you said, there'd be so little left um, based on our uh, 2020, you would have to reduce that 0.5% down to 0.01% which would be about 580 pounds in order to be absolutely certain you don't exceed 29%. Okay. That, that, um, helped a lot. Uh, thank you very much. Any other questions? Bob Dooley. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jesse, thanks for this presentation. It's very, very insightful. I, would you go back to the screen that you were just looking at with Phil? please? Uh, no, there. I'm, I must be missing something here. I don't, I, if you, maybe you can clear it up. I don't see how many permits are affected by that first blue box, the end endorsement limit option one, average percentage 211 to control date, because it appears to me the second blue box the four and a half percent is there we go. Okay. So that is what is the total amount? I see it goes up, but I'm, I'm trying to get a, a, uh, a handle on that. Last time we heard that if you picked a certain uh, option that it would limited to 12% or 11% was the number that was, was being uh, bandied about. But I see these are up in the 29% and 24% levels. And I'm trying to figure out where, what happened to that thought of 11% or 12% that was talked about the last meeting. So I hope I was clear. I'm a little confusing to me, so I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Mr. Dooley, um, I am not 100% certain about where the 11% is coming from. I know there has been talk about 11%-ish owned by gear switching vessels, the quota share, and maybe that's what you're thinking about. Um, but in terms of alternatives, so like in the example here on the screen, the current SAMTAC qualification options for alternative two um, would qualify between 10 and 15 permits. Um, and you can see that on the table on the screen. So under endorsement limit option one, um, the percent limit in the third column on the table is actually if you took all those permits, you figured out what endorsement limit they would have, and that would be the maximum amount that those 10 to 15 permits in combination could take. Does that help? I know it doesn't maybe provide the exact location of your 11% number, but like I said, my guess is that might be related to the amount of quota share that's owned by gear switchers. Yeah, I think maybe that's where I'm I'm looking for. Will that will that be forthcoming? The that analysis of what's owned by gear switchers and might shine some light on uh, versus what's used and leased. 
Mr. Chair, Mr. Dooley, uh, no, not in this presentation. Um, you know, the, the goal of this presentation, as Jim kind of explained, and we're working through is taking the Santec proposed alternatives and seeing how they relate to that 29% that y'all adopted and kind of trying to pick out these certain questions about short term versus long term, you know, whether you want that cap to apply to all participants or just these kind of legacy group. So um, the information that you're looking for has been previously presented in some SAMTAC documents. And, um, you know, I think Jim and I can definitely point you back in that direction. But since that's currently not a full part of any of the current SAMTAC alternatives, um, that wouldn't show up in this presentation. Thank you, Jesse. I, that clears it up in my mind. What a, thank you. Uh, Maggie Summer. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I may on that in, on that question. Oh yeah, go ahead, Jim. Thanks. Yeah, I just I did just want to confirm that the uh, the eleven percent is for the vessel owners, and the analysis that Jesse's providing here is for what the quota share owned by the permit owners. Uh, and since that number shows up in the gap report and so forth, I also wanted to give a little bit more explanation. There is that that 11% will vary. It'll be 12% or even even larger or smaller numbers. Uh, specifically, it was uh, when it was first produced, it was for like the most, it was for four years and it was only vessels that participated in more than at least one year in the most recent four years, which I think at that time was 15 to 18 when that number was produced. So the point being is, is that if you, rely on that 11% or 12% or whatever it is that the vessel owners for your direction and policy that we're going to need to be specific about the time period that, that you were looking at, that it's vessel owners only that we're looking at. And then um, it made that number could change a lot depending on what those time periods are that you select and other criteria. So thank you. All right, now Maggie, please. Thank you, Chair Grelick. Thank you, uh, Jesse and Jim. Jesse, I have a question um, on your slide 51. And um, I, I, uh, I guess really maybe this is a, an example of a, a bigger question, but I just wanted to ask you um, to, to uh, talk briefly about, I'm looking at the slide where uh, you just have it characterized as um, likely that gear switching would be under 29% uh, for the endorsement limit options one and two. Um, whoops, maybe I have a, a different version. <laughs> the, the slide titled Summary of Gear Switching Levels, Table 10. That's it. Um, and just, I, I think it's important. I've, I've heard a lot of discussion um, so far, for example, in, in my delegation this morning um, about this whole question of projections. Um, and I, I um, in your summary here, I think that this is probably relying on information in the analysis in table eight, for example, where you have the projections um, laid out by quantile, uh, but just wanted to, uh, to ask you to give us a sense here as you're presenting this um, of what likely means, you know, what level of, of quantification is associated with that. Mr. Chair, Ms. Summers, yeah, um, I, I'll just say that. So our intent with these summary tables um, was to try to boil down all of the information in the document and provide kind of a quick snapshot. Um, so there are definitely details that um, could be missed. And, you know, like you said, this characterization of likely than 29%. Um, for this, we were really relying on um, what I showed in this slide, uh, which is attachment four, table seven, and then for endorsement limit option two, the companion table. And it is based on looking at, again, as I noted, the median projection from our bootstrap analysis, and then combined with um, our assumption for the non-endorsed permits. So taking that into consideration, um, you know, we were relying on that kind of typical 
uh, 50th percentile that we use a lot in ground fish projections. Um, however, I would say that those bootstrap tables that are, are provided in attachment four do let the council kind of take an assessment of what level of risk you are comfortable with in, you know, allowing a certain number of permits to be endorsed, again, based on historical percent utilization and all the other assumptions that we have to put into that analysis. So um, I, I definitely, you know, that's why I, I hope and keep repeating and, and I wanna take it like Jim and I completely understand that these projections, like there's a lot, um, yeah, it's taking into consideration when looking at these numbers. And so that's gonna come in that more qualitative aspect rather than a quantitative aspect. Thank you, that was very helpful. Any further questions? All right, uh, Jesse, back to you. Okay, awesome. Let's move on to alternative three, our active trawler alternative. So we're gonna begin with our certainty approach, again, under alternative three. And within alternative three, there are two groups of vessels that can gear switch. There are active trawlers and exempted vessels. We're gonna begin with our exempted vessel group. And so these are our vessels with historical gear switching activity or our legacy participants. So under the current suite of qualification criteria, between 11 to 12 vessels could qualify under the sub options and based on the gear switching limits that are part of this alternative could gear switch up to a limit of between 9.04 to 9.64%. For those without exemptions, the only way to gear switch is by getting an active trawler designation. Active trawlers are those trawling vessels that harvest a certain amount of ground fish. Vessels that get the status could gear switch up to 1% of the sable fish allocation. There are no limitations on the number of vessels that could get the status outside of the ability to access a permit and quota and meet the criteria as an active trawler. Based on recent data, well over 30 vessels would likely qualify for active trawler status, resulting in over 29% possible gear switching from this group alone. Therefore, the current design of Alternative 3 does not allow for absolute certainty on an annual basis. But with the 10% backstop provision that Jim described earlier, there is a high likelihood of being within the 10% for the active trawler group over a large number of years. The 10% backstop built into the alternative ensures that neither the exempted vessels or the active trawler groups could take more than 10% with fixed gear. Exempted vessels would therefore stay the same. For active trawlers, if there was more than 10% taken by active trawl vessels in a given year, then in the following year or years, depending on how the process is set up, the 1% limit would be adjusted downward. This would result in a maximum of less than 20% for both groups combined. Looking at alternative three through our projection-based approach, for exempted vessels, this group would be restricted to the limits discussed on the previous slide and would potentially have gear switching levels less than that if they didn't use all of the quota pounds that were um, they could harvest. For active trawlers, while there could be over 60 vessels that qualify each year, Historically, we've only seen about two vessels on average gear switch, and by that I mean trawl and fixed gear in the same year. Assuming those trends continue, this would mean a total of about 2% gear switching by this group. Overall, our total projected gear switching in the short term would be between about 11 and 12% for alternative three.
So here's our final summary table looking at alternative three. As I just covered, certainty would be there for exempted vessels, and there would be a high degree for active trawlers with the backstop provision. Overall, our projection-based approach um, looks at like there would be less than, uh, we would be within 29% with both groups combined. So as you have hopefully gathered over the last hour and a half or so, <laughs> there are three main levers that can be adjusted to achieve the 29% criteria. First, starting on the left, is the number of legacy qualifiers. Then there is the gear switching opportunity provided to each of those qualifiers. And then you finally, you have the amount provided to all other participants. Additionally, the short and long-term question interacts with these provisions. And uh, this is related to the phasing out or expiration of legacy opportunities. So a reminder of your council action today is to adopt a range of alternatives and provide other guidance as appropriate. Again, some considerations for the council and their deliberations are, do the SANTAC alternatives cover the range of mechanisms for controlling gear switching? You can provide guidance on adjustments to meet the 29% criteria. And these are kind of related to what I just spoke about in the previous slide. So as an example for this guidance, if you so choose, you could make statements such as bring back alternative two with fewer qualifiers, but with higher endorsement limits. And Jim and I can then take your feedback where the current iterations might not meet the goal currently, but can figure out how the combination to meet your intended goal. And then finally, we have um, if there are options within alternatives that you can eliminate, that does limit down the analytical burden in front of us. And at this point, that's the end of the presentation. And if there's anything that Jim and I can answer, we'd be happy to do so. Thank you very much, Jesse. Um, I'm still sinking in, for me anyway. Um, let me ask uh, if there are any council members with any questions for Jesse or Jim. Uh, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I'm uh, marinating on your discussion surrounding certainty, and I just want to make sure that I have this in my mind correctly. Um, under Alt 1, yes, there would be certainty of attaining the 29% um, with gear specific quota pounds issued at the 29.71% ratio. Under Alt 2, no, there's no alternatives there that provide any certainty on the 29% attainment and three, um, the active trawler alternative, uh, Maybe. Um, I guess my my question, first of all, do I, do I have that generally right? <laughs> Mr. Chair, Mr. Remco, uh, mostly, yeah, there are iter <laughs> there are iterations. It's kind of, I want to say yes with an asterisk in a way, um, because you're right. With Alt-1, you can achieve certainty of the 29%, as I said, if you had no opt-out and... Yeah. Uh, the 7129, um, and then, yeah, Alt 2 currently, no, and then Alt 3, um, like I said, it's a it's a high degree of certainty on average. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, my, so my question is, if, if I was looking for alternative that, uh, an alternative that attained certainty, um, and I wanted simplicity in the idea of a fishery that didn't have gear specific quota pounds, um, 
but instead had in-season monitoring of the fishery and the gear used for the quota pounds taken with or use the quota pounds used to take northern sable fish if those landings were tracked in season and put in a a gear bin and tracked um and then the gear switching um would not be allowed through the remainder of the season once 29 percent of the quota pounds were taken with non-trawl gear is that option anywhere in these alternatives Mr. Chair, Ms. Remco, not specifically, I would say. Um, I think you might hear an alternative like that in public comment or the gap report. At least I feel like I've heard of that one. Um, but it it would kind of be um, a modification of alt one, I think, in a way. I don't know, Jim, do you want to wait? Do, would you say that's a fair assessment? <laughs> Yeah. Um, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'm seeing Alt One only be being inclusive of establishing gear specific quota pounds, though. Like for issuance, is that not how it would work? Mm, Mr. Chair, Mr. Yamko. Yeah, I guess I was just thinking about it in terms of, um, you're right, like what you're referring to wouldn't necessarily label the quota pounds, but in terms of um, the, like, it would be a certain percentage of the quota pounds could be taken with gear switching in that kind of intent is why I was kind of relating it to alternative one, but you're right that like what you're describing would not have specific gear specific quota pounds. You would just have, if I'm understanding you correctly, it would be here's all the quota. And then we would just say at whenever 29% or whatever the level you choose is hit, then there could be no more gear switching after that point. Right, thank you, thank you. Uh that's good enough for now. Much appreciated. Okay, further questions of Jim and or Jesse. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to um, pose one for Jim. I'd like to ask Jim to, um, if he would indulge us, um, recap the comments he gave on the last slide uh, in his section of the presentation titled Range of Alternatives, where he talked about considerations regarding adequacy of the range, and he provided a couple examples of um, past council action, and I would find it very helpful to hear those again. Mr. Chairman, thanks for the question, uh, Ms. Summers. Yeah, so I'm thinking about the range of alternatives and uh, uh, you know documentation of, of what's been considered and so forth. There's there's two approaches to consider. One is to um, you know as you move through and, and consider things and say, well, no, that's not what we want to do. Or uh, then you can we can just document as things as options that were considered but rejected. And we talked about how that's been done in the SAMTAC report, and we'll we will you know obviously be continuing to do that as you move forward. Uh, but the other approach uh, I talked about was where you might include something in the range that you think there's a, probably a pretty low probability that you're going to uh, to adopt it, uh, but you include it just for uh, clarity of documentation of the consideration. Uh, and the specific example I gave came from Amendment 20, uh, where uh, council completed work on that amendment. There was a lawsuit over consideration of recent participation. Uh, we went back to that issue. There was discussion about just beefing up the discussion or actually uh, having a range that included uh, more recent periods that were after the control date for the purpose of demonstrating to the court that, that had been carefully considered. Uh, and that, that was done in that case, uh, the council didn't, you know, they considered it via the, the range, but did not adopt an option that included anything after the, uh, uh, didn't change their original recommendation. Um, 
And then the other example I provided was just simply more along the lines of if you want to include something in the range of alternatives, just being careful if you decide to eliminate an alternative to examine that and, and uh, um, make sure there wasn't something in there that was a, an important part of the range. Uh, and I used as an example alternative three, which was the is currently the only alternative that considers uh, the vessel allocation to vessel owners. And earlier in the presentation, I discussed how there's about a 50-50 split. Uh, so for about half the people, it won't make a difference whether you allocate to the vessel or permit. But for half the people, um, half the time, the vessel and permit are under different ownership. So you can anticipate, and you've already heard testimony last fall, uh, some fairly strong uh, and compelling testimony about allocating to each of these groups. So you can anticipate that that will be an issue. Uh, that will be receiving a lot of attention. So even if you made a decision to go one way or the other on that, you, you might want to include it in the range just to give a full document, to make sure it's fully documented and, and considered and, and uh, everything's vetted for the public. Thank you very much. Um, very helpful as we think about our, our own decision. Uh, any further questions for Jim and Jesse? Uh, I have one question, and it may not be a fair one, but um, you know, maybe you can take a stab at it. Um, I I'm seeing quite a number of stacked uh, alternatives and options here, a and I'm wondering, I mean, how many different permutations and combinations do we have here? Uh, I, I mean, not even counting suggestions we'll be getting from advisory bodies or the public. Mr. Chair, uh, I have not counted them all before, but there are um, a lot, I would say, um, as you've well gathered between the qualification options, um, you know, looking at how the endorse or the legacy limits um, under the various alternatives. Um, so there, the expiration options. So all those things that Jim kind of covered in that, uh, the supplemental attachments, you are very spot on in your characteristic that there are um, a lot of different options and um, currently on the, the table, which is um, again, if there are things that the council could eliminate um, that obviously makes uh, our jobs a little easier <laughs> and, uh, you know, probably, um, but you know, it's ultimately you have to make the choice of like what you want to keep in the range of alternatives. Jim, do you have any idea? Any other thoughts? <laughs> uh, no, the word a lot was the first one. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the other thing is in addition to kind of what's structured within the alternatives, what then also multiplies the considerations is, whether you want certainty or whether you want to go to go on a projection basis for uh, ensuring that you meet your 29% criteria, which then doubles uh, whatever analysis is going to be produced. So uh, that's kind of some of the importance of those questions. If, if you can identify that, hey, uh, you know, we all know right now that we want to move through this uh, and have certainty that we're not going over 29%, then that will that will really help that uh, if that's, or if you know that you, you don't want to go the certainty route, that you're going to be comfortable with projections, that will help, or that might be too too much to ask, in which case then we'll be bringing both back to you in the future. All right, thanks for that. Yeah, it's certainly, we, we have a job ahead of us to try to uh, narrow that down. It's quite expansive at this point. Um, so with no further questions, um, Jim and Jesse, thank you very much. Um, for that presentation. And we will now go to uh, management entities and advisory bodies. And first we'll hear from the Groundfish management team, uh, Katie Pearson. Thank you, Chair Gorelna, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Wonderful. For the record, my name is Katie Pearson and I will be reading agenda item C.5.8, Supplemental GMT Report 1. The Groundfish Management Team, GMT, received a presentation from Dr. Jim Seeger and Ms. Jessie Dornhaus, um, Council staff, reviewed documents and public comments in the briefing book and offers the following summary of considerations. 
The GMD understands that the council's decisions under this item are largely policy-based. However, the GMT offers a recommendation relative to the first question posed in the situation summary, namely whether the council wants the maximum 29% of gear switching to provide certainty or to be based on projections. In addition, we provide relevant previous recommendations and note the importance of incorporating uncertainty in future models and projections. The attachment for analysis and situation summary prompt the council to consider whether their intent with the 29% maximum is either to have certainty that 29% will not be exceeded or to project that generally less than 29% of trawl northern sablefish allocation would be attained through gear switching. The GMT reminds the council that the April 2021 motion on this item states that setting a 29% maximum is only for the purpose of guiding the development of draft alternatives that would limit gear switching. The initial recommendation to identify levels of gear switching for the purpose of analysis came from the GMT at the November 2020 meeting in which we stated the council would then select a target level of gear switching to inform adoption of the range of proposed alternatives at subsequent meeting. Agenda item G.1.A, Supplemental GMT Report. The term target in this case could be considered synonymous with projected. While setting a gear switching limit with certainty, similar to a hard cap, may offer some um, certainty to buyers, the GMT considers this type of limit to be unnecessarily restrictive and may not allow otherwise qualified gear switchers to fish with fixed gear under their obtained quota pounds at status quo levels. Given the initial intent for the a maximum limit on gear switching and recognizing that this, along with the two other two questions listed in the situation summary, it is ultimately up to the council's discretion is ultimately up to the council's discretion. The GMT recommends the council consider the range of alternatives with the intent that the 29% maximum limit on gear switching would be a projection rather than a certainty. The GMT urges the council to address the other two listed questions in a manner that holistically considers all who would be impacted at as this agenda item moves forward. In addition to fishery participants, this action will impact communities that rely on fisheries and stable fish markets, as well as consumers of fishery products. Previous GMT recommendations from Supplemental GMT Report 1, November 2020, that are still applicable to the range of alternatives discussion include, the GMT recommends the council replace self-designation of gear specific quota pounds under alternative one with the provision in which the vessel's trawl landings were, are automatically debited from their trawl only quota pounds before debiting from the unrestricted quota pounds. The conversion date analysis available to date does not indicate that there will be appreciable impacts on the availability of trawl gear quota or gear switching quota compared to the 2016 to 2019 average level of gear switching. And thus the GMT recommends eliminating the conversion date sub option if alternative one is included in the range of alternatives. Data show that gear switching landings are higher later in the year, SAMTAC agenda item F, attachment one, May 2019, chapter seven. If this pattern persists, there will be less utility in converting trawl only QP into unrestricted QP during the year. The GMT recommends proposal designers work with council staff and the National Marine Fisheries Service to find ways in which to simple, simplify alternative three without compromising its intended purpose to attribute and cap gear switching levels for individual vessels based on their historical participation using either trawl or fixed gear to harvest sable fish. Finally, the GMT encourages the council to take into account input provided from ground fish fishery stakeholders during meetings, climate, climate scenario planning workshops, and other venues regarding increased need for nimbleness in light of expected changes in the environment and markets. Supplemental GMT report, April 2021. Given the great degree of uncertainty in the future, in future behavior of fleets and climate conditions, as well as the lengthy process required to amend a fishery management plan, the council may want to 
consider actions that are more adaptable and do not require FMP amendments. Methodologies used for projections in stock assessments, harvest, harvest specifications, or specific agenda analysis will need to be reviewed by the Scientific and Statistical Committee. At this time, we do not have specific input on the projection methods used in the attachment for analysis to estimate likely gear switching outcomes, but note that the GMT has started to discuss the challenges associated with using the past to project future con conditions as we see continued impacts related to climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. The GMT notes that broader discussion across FMPs and council bodies will need to take place to truly understand how historical data can inform predictions about the future. And that ends our statement. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, I see Maggie has her hand up. Please go ahead, Maggie. Thank you, Chair. I don't have a question. I just wanted to um, welcome Katie and thank you for your first GMT statement reading to the council. Thanks for jumping in on such an easy one for us. Through the chair. Thank you, Ms. Summer. All right. Um, any other questions, comments for the GMT? Okay, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, now we'll go to the gap report. And my understanding is there may be more than one reader uh, for this. I'm not sure who is starting off or if my understanding is incorrect, but I'll just open the floor to the gap here and see who, uh, see, Jeff, are you first? I, I am no. not. It, it's me, uh, Mr. Chair. It's Richter. <laughs> Mr. Chair, did you pick me up? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll be, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll be reading from agenda item C5A, supplemental gap report one, ground fish advisory sub panel report on sable fish gear switching. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel received an overview of this agenda item from Dr. Jim Seeger, Pacific Fishery Management Council Staff Officer, and Ms. Jessie Dorfengaus, and offers the following comments. For statement framework, as we noted in prior statements on this issue during the September 2020, November 2020, and April 2021 meetings, gear switching in the trawl catch shares program continues to be challenging for the gap. As such, the GAP will again be offering a statement that includes opposing viewpoints in the interest of making sure the Council is aware of the full range of perspectives. The GAP agrees this represents the most comprehensive way to provide divergent viewpoints. For the statement in support of no action alternative, representatives on the GAP who participate in gear switching offer the following comments for the Council's consideration in addressing Sablefish Management and Trawl Allocation Attainment Committee principles and specific changes to the alternatives that have been analyzed to date. We respectfully submit that we remain unconvinced that limiting gear switching at this time will result in a higher attainment of a mix of groundfish species landed by trawl vessels using nets. The mixed species fishery faces a myriad of problems, demand from consumers, supply chain disruption, frozen versus fresh markets, and processor trip limits on vessels, to name a few. None of these challenges are caused by gear switching. Regarding the stated goal of the SAMTAC to make sablefish more affordable for trawl net fishermen, we would point out that current lease prices for sablefish at 21 cents is approximately one seventh of what the lease price was in the market at $1.50 at the time this goal was originally articulated. The price at the dock to the fishermen has also declined during this time, but it has gone down by about half. The point is the, the, point is the cost to lease trawl individual quota by any trawl permit holder has declined far more than the dock price, making sablefish significantly more affordable for trawlers to acquire. To restate the obvious, this has occurred because of the marketplace and not due to unrestricted gear switching. We would also add that council action to restrict gear switching in order to make TIQ more affordable for trawl net fishermen is unlikely to occur as lease prices reflect the value of the fish. The 2021 annual catch limit is about 15 million pounds and the supply out of Alaska is about 50 million pounds this year. Again, a significant increase over the earlier years of the IQ program. For 2022, 
the Pacific region harvest combined with that of British Columbia and Alaska will approach 80 million pounds. Without a corresponding huge increase in demand, domestically and internationally, prices will likely stay low. What is certain is that if the council acts to limit gear switching and the amount of sablefish taken by fixed gear is reduced, the value of the TIQ sablefish fishery will be worth significantly less. And here is a comparison of very recent dock prices in round pounds for sablefish caught by fixed gear and sablefish caught by trawl net fishermen. And this price information comes from different processors and is at best our closest estimate. And the table's pretty self-explanatory there. You got your weights and various prices breakouts. Uh, regarding the specific questions presented to the council by Dr. Jim Seeger and Ms. Jesse Dorpengaus as they develop the alternatives, those, in a, those of us in the gap engaging in gear switching have the following general answers. Under question one, we recommend that the 29% figure be a general goal for the council and we'll use as a guide in selecting alternatives and that it not be a rigid top limit. We also recommend that in choosing alternatives to go forward for further analysis, that the council aim for at least that amount of 29% to continue to be landed by gear switching participants. For question two, that the general goal of 29% to be landed by gear switching participants be available to all participants who gear switch IQ. Under alternative one, A, on January 1, there is an opt-out provision for all quota at approximately 11% that is currently owned by qualifying vessel owners and is also specifically excluded from any trawl gear, any gear classification. Uh, B, the remaining quota is classified as trawl gear, any gear. And C, that there be a conversion date to any gear as of August 1 and the amount landed by gear switching after the conversion date be limited to 18%. And then D, this is not a permit restricted alternative. And under alternative two, uh, A, the 29% includes only the qualifying historical participants based on permits. And B, the alternative is modified to reduce non-qualifiers to a very small limit, similar to those levels suggested most recently by staff in their presentation. And under alternative three, A, the amount that can be taken by gear switching historical qualifiers be increased to 29% and B, the individual vessel limit of 0.6% taken by gear switching be eliminated. Under question three, as to whether limiting gear switching should be a short-term or a long-term goal, we recommend that the limitation on gear switching be a short-term program and reevaluated frequently adopting any alternative that includes an arbitrary termination of gear switching before seeing the effects of the program and whether it is or is not achieving its goals would be short-sighted. And moving on, while we continue to recommend no action be taken by the council, we have new modifications as to the specific alternatives that are currently before the council that we believe should go forward. These modifications attempt to resolve questions regarding the alternatives that are being raised in some of the written public comments for this meeting, discussed by staff in their current presentation, discussed in advisory bodies, and have also been voiced by council members. Alternative one, as mentioned above, qualifying participants who own quota 11% would be able to opt out immediately and gear switch as of January 1, that quota would be classified any year upon issuance. Quota share could be added to the account. There would be a conversion date provision effective as, as of August 1 for 18% of the quota to be any gear that would be allowed to be taken by gear switching. Parties could be required to register their intent to gear switch their quota prior to August 1. And alternative 2A, set aside the amount of quota share owned by qualifying participants, approximately 11% for quota owners, to be able to land what they own. B, dividing the remaining 18% based on all who qualify during a window period in proportion to their average landings during the window period. And C, for those who do not qualify, reduce the landings to a very small amount suggested by council staff during presentation to be limited to 0.03% or less. That would stay close to total attainment of 29%. And alternative three, 
We do not recommend moving forward with alternative three. Should the council decide to do so, we strongly recommend the amount to be taken by vessels that gear switched during a qualifying period be increased in this alternative to 29%. We do not recommend going forward with any aspect of the alternative three that invites new participants into gear switching or that restricts owners of quota that gear switch to an individual 0.6% limitation. Those who have historically gear switched should be able to land at least up to what they own and what they have leased during the qualifying period. However, should the council want to invite new participation in the form of active trawlers, we recommend that the 10% total amount for new active trawlers referenced in alternative three should be in addition to the 29% for those that qualify as historical gear switching participants. In other words, eliminate the 10% backup backstop limit on gear switchers currently in alternative three. Also, the amount proposed to be allowed for individual active trawlers of 1% is too high and should not be greater than any individual percentage limitation on those who have historically gear switched. In conclusion, we also recommend that each of the alternatives include an option to be able to, one, transfer a gear switching endorsement attached to a permit to a new owner under alternative two, and number two, transfer the ownership of a quota share account allowed to use fixed gear to a new owner under alternatives one and three. And as referenced above in response to the questions, we recommend removing from any of the alternatives an automatic sunset clause. And then next up, we have a statement in support of limiting gear switching. It is not only important to specify recommendations for the range of alternatives, but also to give the rationale why different alternative features are necessary. The following gives both from the viewpoint of those that see reduction of fixed gear attainment necessary for achievement of OI and future fishery community stability on the West Coast. Uh, number one, regulatory factors. The Magnuson-Stevens Act, national standards, and especially NS1, fishery management plan goals and objectives, and trawl catch shares program drive decision-making. NS1 twin mandates of preventing overfishing and achieving OI are the foundations of the MSA itself, as well as all fishery management. They are requirements and other NSs are in support of these twin mandates and do not supersede these twin mandates. FMP and program GNOs are designed to be in alignment with NS1. In under A, since achieving OY is a requirement, alternatives are required to include options that allow the fishery the capacity to achieve OY. On B, the MSA requires that limited access privilege program review from which gear switching has been identified as the number one issue, include making any necessary modification of the program to meet those program goals. So alternatives are required to include options that make modifications to meet program goals, including to provide for full utilization, which is essentially achieving the OI. And then C, alternatives should include options to meet FMP goals, including goal three, to achieve the maximum biological yield of the overall ground fish fishery which is essentially the achievement of the OI. Under number two, current status of the fishery on the West Coast. Utilization of trawl allocation is dependent upon bottom trawl fishing and processing. Utilization is down under catch shares, even as many ACLs are up. Processor fillet lines have been in retraction trajectory ever since 2011. Now, there are only two to three ports on the West Coast receiving landings from multiple bottom trawl boats year-round, with only one or two ports giving the confidence they will still be doing so in another five to ten years. Under number three, necessary improvements in the fishery on the West Coast to achieve OI. Optimum yield cannot be achieved for the groundfish fishery without multiple geographically dispersed ports receiving landings from multiple boats year-round. Expansion of fillet lines, most likely in existing processing plants, is required to have a chance at building towards the OI. Sablefish is the most important species of this multi-species fishery, not only for reasons of incidental catch and efficient year-round targeting strategies to support fresh markets, but also for essential economic viability of both vessel and processor at the individual level, 
and also for a volume that provides critical mass of activity to support economically viable processors in multiple ports. Sablefish absolutely impacts the capacity of the program to achieve OY. The larger the fixed gear cap, the further away from capacity for OY the fishery will be. The full trawl allocation of sablefish caught by trawl gear is required to achieve OY. This is backed up by historical catch rates of sablefish to other species, the most important being Dover, because it would have to be a driver of any processor and market expansion due to its volume. But as a processing representative said at the first community advisory board meeting in asking and answering his own question, what species does sablefish help get out of the water? Response to all of them. Each pound of sablefish caught with fixed gear represents approximately eight pounds of other fish that could be landed if that one pound of sablefish was caught with trawl gear. Diverting up to 30% of sablefish to fixed gear effectively guarantees that OI of other species will not be achieved. Alternatives with options to have a very low cap of zero to 10% are required to help reverse the retraction of processing capacity under catch shares and help drive the expansion. Near status quo fixed gear attainment may not move the needle on incentive for processor investments and therefore the OI. Uh, number four, a rationale for 10% immediate FG cap. The fishery and coastal infrastructure has been past the point of an emergency for a long time. Each year that goes by make it more difficult to reverse course in working towards achieving OY. There is an urgency. Beyond that, the QS owned by fixed gear vessel owners that have a minimal level of pre-controlled date participation, which was 30,000 pounds in three years, is in the single digits. 10% more than covers that amount. Caps above 10% represent inclusion of leasing or insufficient participation. The trawl vessel and the ground fish processors represent decades and generations of investment in the trawl fishery in the hopes of achieving the promise of OI in the MSA and full utilization of the trawl catch shares program. Benefits of increasing utilization include the following. Under A, the fact that trawl infrastructure is necessarily anchored in communities providing jobs, stability, and infrastructure critical mass for other fisheries. B, there's increased employment. C, domestic food security, which has recently increased in importance. For number five, a general request on ROA. In light of the previous four points, the general request for ROA are to move all three SAMTAC alternatives forward for analysis with the following features. A, use hard caps to provide certainty, avoid unintended consequences, and maximize capacity to achieve OY. Remove all loopholes from hard caps from further consideration. This includes conversion date, uh, 0.5% allowance for any vessel not covering overages, using an overall soft cap target different than the maximum allowed, and making sure the opt out does not allow for overages. Eliminating loopholes and using hard caps would also simplify the analysis. Now B, use three hard cap sub options with each alternative one of 10%, one of 20%, and one of 29%. Council could give general guidance on how to achieve each hard cap level. Rationale for including the 10% cap provided previously. The 29% is a pre-controlled date average and recent council action maximum that many or most understood at the time for the word maximum to mean it could not be exceeded and the range of alternatives would be at and below that number and 20% is a middle level amount. For C, includes, include a phase out with each option. Fixed gear phase out would be either a complete phase out or at minimum phasing out gear switching for vessels that are not active trawlers. Rationale for including this feature, uh, first up would be maximizability to achieve OI. Next would be provide a robust range for analysis to measure effects in light of purpose and need and achievement of OI goals and objectives, et cetera. And then last, it would give ample time for fixed gear participants to decide if they wanted to use trawl gear to, to continue to participate in the trawl fishery. Uh, for number six, active trawler alternatives. 
here too is ATAs. Some thoughts on this alternative would be A, there might be room to simplify the oversight burdens of all three alternatives. Or ATA, a suggestion has been made to tie the exemption to the vessel instead of the permit. Also, there might be room to look at simplifying requirements to monitor ownership changes to the permit and or quota share account. One suggestion has been made for a group to review the alternatives that are passed at this council meeting with the specific purpose of streamlining oversight burdens without meaningfully altering intent. That sounds like a good idea. And B, there has been some concern expressed about the active trawler vessel status itself and how monitoring will work with for that. The mechanism once programmed should be almost self-sustaining with only a confirmation of status automatically flagged in the system being confirmed on occasion. Under C, if the council were to adopt ATA and the 10%, 20%, 29% hard cap sub options were used for each alternative, the active trawler 10% could be achieved by eliminating the active trawler section altogether. 20% would be the current alternative itself, and 29% could be a combination of 15% exempt vessels and 14% active trawler vessels. And then last D, rationale for including the ATA in the ROA. Uh, first, uh, it maintains the fixed gear option for active trawlers. Uh, next, it recognized the combined minimal level of pre-controlled date participation with the ownership of the vessel and permit and quota share. So it represents true participation, investments, and ownership. And then last, in its current form, the ATA accounts for the previous two points, as well as gives the trawl fishery more certainty and more capacity for increased utilization. Um, Mr. Chair, that completes our rather large gap statement. Uh, fielding questions will be Mr. Jeff Lackey, Mr. Bob Alverson, and Ms. Michelle Longo Etter. And I'll just be standing by listening. All right. Well, maybe we can look to you to help uh, direct traffic uh, to the correct uh, gap member. So let me see uh, which questions we have. Who has questions for the gap on this report and the different perspectives contained therein? Maggie Summer, please. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Um, thank you to the GAP for the report. I have a question actually at the very end of the report uh, under the rationale for including the active trawler alternative uh, notes that it maintains the fixed gear option for active trawlers. I think we were reminded earlier um, that a very small number of vessels have um, both trawled and used fixed gear in the same year. I am curious if the GAP as a, a group had any discussion on the uh, how, how important this need is to maintain an active trawler options for uh, trawl participants who have not been or aren't currently using fixed gear. That would be a question for Mr. Lackey. Thanks. Yes, um, thank you. And that was not specifically discussed in the gap. It has been discussed and recognized generally in industry that there is a declining uh, participation that people who tried it earlier have not used it as much in, in recent time. And I, I don't know if that answers the question, but it wasn't specifically discussed in the gap. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Maggie, for the question. Uh, further questions from the council on the GAP report? Going once, going twice. Thanks very much for the GAP report. And Thank I, you, I, Mr. Chair. We, we don't have any further questions. Folks have had more than adequate opportunity. So that will complete our reports and will take us to public comment. The last I looked, I had 16 public comments. Quite a number of them are from um, 
groups and uh, if they each took their full 10 minutes, we would be here for several hours. Um, but I'm not inclined to, to limit the time right now, but I, I would ask uh, all of the public speakers to uh, be sensitive to uh, time and to use it effectively and not necessarily use the full time just because you have it. And I would similarly ask uh, council members to make their questions a specific pointed uh, and uh, leave council discussion for council discussion. So first, we have Paul Clampett, and Paul will be followed by uh, Jonathan Gonzalez. And I know um, there, there will be some presentations here, and I know Jonathan has one. I don't recall if Paul does. Um, so Paul, go ahead, and then Jonathan will, will bring up your presentation. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? You bet. Thank you, Chairman uh, Gornick and members of the council. Uh, my family purchased a trawl permit along with quota that came with it in order to grow our, our business. If you recall, this council re reallocated uh, sablefish quota from a 49 to 52% split uh, to the present 48 to 42 percent many years ago, and we felt it was unfair at the time. When trawl rationalization was developed, we saw it as an opportunity to recoup, recoup our previous losses by purchasing the quota from the trawl fleet. Nothing could uh, be fairer than a willing buyer and a, and a willing purchaser. Um, we are why, my question is why are we still discussing limited gear switching when when we have yet to determine if this will solve the problems of underutilized resources. We need to look at how processor, processor and post-trip limits on certain species affects the underutilization. We need to see how processors, processor controlled sablefish through leasing above the ownership cap affects underutilization and cost of lease fees. We need to know why, as of August 25th, 2021, 3.9 million pounds of northern sablefish still need to be taken, and 1.6 million pounds of southern sablefish still still is unharvested. And we need to uh, we need to examine if moving the line to 36 degrees for sablefish would alleviate underutilized quota. Uh, if we could, if we curtail gear switching and the leasing of quota to fix gear you will make it more difficult for new entrants. It's much easier to equip a fixed gear boat and to lease fish than to get the capital together for purchasing quota and purchasing a trawl vessel. Part of the stated intent of Amendment 20 was to lower the impact of trawling on the bottom habitat and consolidation of the fleet was one of the anticipated results. Um, if you curtail, curtail girls gear switching, you will hurt many fishermen who who built a business plan around the ability to, to lease or purchase trawl quota. Gear switching was built into trawl rationalization. These fishermen made capital investments and investments in time. Um, doing away with, tr doing, what trawl res doing what trawl rationalization was intended. If you are going to eliminate or curtail gear switching, these fishermen need to be compensated or allowed to continue. In conclusion, I, I just think that this is this whole program that's being looked at is is just unnecessary. It's complicated. It's a Frankenstein monster. It's going to be difficult to administer and implement. And I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Are there any questions for Paul? Uh, not seeing any hands. Uh, from around the table. So we'll go now to John Gonzalez, and John has a, a uh, presentation. So why don't we get that spooled up? Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chair. Just want to confirm you can hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear, John. Great. Great, thank you, Sandra. Uh, my name is John Gonzalez. I am the policy specialist for fisheries at Pacific Seafood. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Next slide. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to start by reintroducing the Trawl Stakeholder 2 alternative while highlighting its objectives. Uh, the first objective is to clearly define the participants while considering current operations and investments as per the purpose and need of this action. Uh, the second is to define participation, which caps out at the trawl quota that was either currently owned or owned as of the control date, whichever is less. And third, uh, and most importantly, it creates a ceiling or a certainty-based cap of 10%. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I stated last November, I recognize that the criteria highlighted here that is intended to define the participants could actually equate to a level of gear switching above 10%, but that was not the intent. Um, the real intent is to simply cap gear switching at participation moving forward at the level of quota that was owned by vessel owners prior to the control date, which we understand is somewhere around 10%. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, to the question of certainty-based caps versus projections, we think it is critical that the council take the certainty-based approach. Uh, while I understand that the council deals with uncertainty and projections in many different aspects, I don't see this action as an example where projections are appropriate. Um, at the fundamental level, a projection-based approach is problematic as it could technically allow gear switching opportunities in amounts greater than the initial target level, even though projected levels would be less. And page 40 of the analysis actually points to an example uh, where one might have projected gear switching levels to be less than they actually were. Specifically, it points to a comparison between 2018 and 2019, where the sablefish allocation increased to its highest level during the cat share program. And while sablefish X vessel prices declined to their lowest level, and northern sablefish QP price had declined to its lowest level, yet there was still an increase in the amount of of the total percentage of trial allocation taken through gear switching. This is an example that is relevant considering the current market conditions and the expected projected Sablefish ACL increases in the near future. Um, and reading from the purpose and need for this action, the purpose of this action is to keep Northern Sablefish gear switching from impeding the attainment of Northern IFQ allocations with trawl gear. And this action is needed because the shore-based IFQ Q program has under attained most of its allocation since the inception of the program in 2011. And so as we can see here on this table, every percentage point that goes to gear switching is at the detriment of attainment and the economic success of this fishery. At this stage and considering what is at stake, any level of uncertainty is unacceptable here when attempting to meaningfully weigh the alternatives impact on the purpose and need. Um, we stated in the letter too that we, we can look at this example here that was provided in the analysis back in April where gear switching is reduced to zero points uh, to a $12.7 million increase in annual revenue and an increase of 20.9 million pounds landed, which equates to an additional 7.4 percentage points of overall non-whiting attainment. This projected increase in revenue and attainment comports with MSA National Standard 1 which is a mandate, as well as the purpose and need of this action, while benefiting active trawlers, shoreside processing infrastructure, employment, coastal communities, and domestic food security. So in closing, I just want to reiterate the four asks that we included in our letter, which is number one, to take the certainty-based cap approach regarding maximum amounts of gear switching opportunities rather than approximating expected projected maximums. Number two, please analyze certainty-based caps of 10 20 and 29 percent for all three alternatives. Um, this is just taken into account that acknowledging our alternative might not be added. We really think it's important to have a 10 percent alternative in there. Uh, number three, please add our trawl stakeholder two alternative to the current range of alternatives. And lastly, uh, consider identifying who we are trying to help with this action when considering the long term objective for a gear switching level. And I'll leave it at that and happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Are there questions for Jonathan uh, on his comment or presentation? Uh, I'm not seeing any hands. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Mike Okonefsky. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, Mike. 
Well, thank you. I'm an independent, uh, my name is Mike Okineski for the record. I am an independent consultant for Pacific Seafood. I wish to make two general observations. The GAP report makes note that council action to restrict gear switching in order to make TIQ more affordable for trawl fishermen is unlikely to occur as lease prices reflect the value of the fish. The 2021 annual catch limit, ACL, is about 15 million pounds, and the supply out of Alaska is about 50 million pounds this year. Again, a significant increase over the earlier years of the IQ program. For 2022, the Pacific region harvest, combined with that of British Columbia and Alaska, will approach 80 million pounds. I agree that it is likely that sablefish quotas will continue to rise in the near term. I would expect lease rates will reflect the sablefish vessel prices as well as sablefish ACLs. Vessel prices usually reflect sablefish marketings, sablefish marketing prices. I agree with the gap, disagree with the gap characterization, which emphasizes that council action was to restrict gear switching in order to make TIQ more affordable for trawl net fishermen. The Groundfish FMP economic goals and objectives and the OI for the whole Groundfish program should be the primary reason why we're going through this process. Whether you believe or not that sablefish is a factor in the IFQ program's poor performance, it has been represented by many active trawlers and most major trawl pro product processors. The gear switching is an impediment to performance. This point has been made many times by the people who fish for trawl fish, process trawl fish, distribute trawl fish, and market trawl fish. What I would like to point out is that quotas go up and they go down. They can go down very suddenly and without notice. The drop in the ACLs would likely participate a rise in the lease prices and strengthen the fixed gear lease of IFQ sablefish. After a remarkable rise in fixed gear harvests in Alaska in 2021, it is likely that additional effort would shift to leasing IFQ sablefish when ACLs retreat. For processors, this makes any investment with a plus five year payback horizon, and many of our investments are 10, 15, even 20 year horizons, a black hole for uncertainty. I would expect the same for trawl fishermen. Lastly, with the start of wind energy development, Pacific's Eureka plant could be seriously impacted by the, the development of the Humboldt wind in energy area. In addition, the potential development of a Graves Harbor wind proposal could impact our Warrington groundfish and whiting production, as well as our Westport shrimp plant. Allowing gear switching to continue as is or without serious reduction will only make it more difficult to continue these operations as viable propositions. I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Questions for Mike. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Michelle Longo Etter. Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Michelle Longo Etter, and I'm one of the owners of the fishing vessel, um, Kimmy Boy. We submitted uh, extensive written comments, and my husband, I anticipate, will address uh, alternative two in more detail. I'd just like to make a couple of preliminary comments. One is that uh, we thank those people who have come forward um, and included recognition for those of us who gear switch, who have uh, purchased quota and participated extensively through throughout the control window period to the control date and beyond. And, and we think that's significant movement forward uh, as we try and reach agreement. Um, I would also make the preliminary comment that um, relative to some public comments that may come in the future that we oppose managing um, this fishery that has any element of a race for fish um, to it. With those two um, issues, I'd like to 
raise two other matters that are of important to us that don't necessarily get a lot of not haven't haven't yet gotten a lot of attention or discussion. And one of those major issues we've heard about for about the, the last five or 10 years is the fact that young fishermen have difficulty um, affording entry into fisheries and how are we going to address that? And there's been regional conferences through um, in, in Alaska, in the Northeast and um, this council has uh, supported a program to help educate uh, bringing new fishermen in. But one of the things that's really important, I think, for each of these alternatives to have is to allow transferability of the ability to gear switch as a, a key portion of each of the alternatives. We have an alternate skipper and crew who all recognize that the value uh, of our business is not just in the boat, but in the value of the permits and the quota share. If we want these young people to be able to move up, we've got to be able to transfer um, some of these privileges that we have to participate in these fisheries. And I would just emphasize that trawl quota uh, is the only um, uh, permission that we have currently that is divisible. And it's the most affordable option um, because of its divisibility for new entrants to be able to move up. And when I say new entrants, I'm not talking about adding additional gear switching, but simply being able to transfer um, portions so that they too can have a vested uh, interest in what we do. Also, I'd recommend that the none of the options have an expiration date or an artificial sunset date. The reason, um, well, let me say, you know, trawl vessels and processors talk about certainty for investment. And as vessel owners, uh, quota purchasers, we've all borrowed money and need to pay it back. And for our alternate skipper and crew, they also need certainty to be able to go to a lender, uh, to borrow money, uh, to not have there be some automatic termination date is really important. Let's face it, there's a lot of us who are aging out. Um, many of us in the fishery are, and sociological um, studies have shown that uh, across our uh, Pacific fishing opportunities. And we need ways to provide opportunities for young people to partner with us and certainty for lenders and the ability um, to buy quota to be used with fixed gear is really important. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the council. Thank you, Michelle, for your comment. Uh, Corey Niles has a question. Corey? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And, and morning, Michelle. Your uh, comment, um, you brought up a question I had yesterday and looking at the NIMS report in the presentation on the, on the survey that was done at quota share ownership. I did some asking around our delegation in Washington, um, but on, this, on the idea of, of crew working their way up in the fishery by, by, you know, owning some quota share, but, you know, fishing on a, on a boat they the crew with, I understand that, um, not uncommon at all up in Alaska, but we, we so far as a council, I don't believe have heard fo of, from folks who, who do that down here. So I was just wondering if you knew of, uh, you know, folks like you mentioned that are, are trying to work their way up and actually own quota share currently in this fishery. Well, I think I, I don't have specific examples. I, you know, I can say that, um, you know, that I would, you know, publicly disclose, um, but there are discussions uh, going on and, you know, potential transactions um, that could take place if indeed, um, you know, they're able to walk into, you know, the banker's office and um, uh, say that, you know, this is what I can do and I'm gonna need, you know, 10 years to, to pay this off. And, you know, here's here's a payment schedule I can afford based on some, you know, projections about 
what our possible earnings will be. And here's my history of earnings uh, in a vessel that has participated in this fishery for the last 10 years. And this is what we're looking at for the future. So um, it's um, the boat isn't going to, you know, it's not, as I mentioned, it's not just the boat and um, it's the ability to go forward and um, I'm not sure that answers your questions more specifically, Corey. It is a practice that is done much more frequently in Alaska and very, um, not very often to my knowledge here on the Pacific coast. And this is a way that we could begin to open up that opportunity in ways that other regions have adopted. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. That, that answered it. And sorry, I didn't mean to suggest you uh, divulge confidential information there, but just, just general knowledge. So yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Right, any further questions of Michelle? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Bob Alverson, followed by Lori Steele. Yes, Chairman Gorlink, uh, can you uh, pick me up? Uh, this is Bob Alverson. Bob, we can hear you. Please go okay. ahead. Yeah, um, so we submitted uh, uh, comments back on September 1st, uh, Mr. Chairman, and um, our association members uh, still um, do not see the uh, uh, rationale for overly restricting ge uh, gear switching. Uh, there's still, three, as Paul Clampett already testified to, and, and you can look up on uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Pacific States uh, website, there's a, more than half of the trawl sable fish available here in August. And what, we, we, what we've noticed over the last uh, decade of uh, the trawl program is about September and on August, the trawlers make a calculation. Do they need their black cod, black cod for Dover sole markets, for starry flounder or whatever? And they go, you know, there isn't much more of a market for Dover sole. We're all on trip limits imposed by the processors. And we have surplus sable fish and they put it on the market. Um, and they, uh, and the fish and the uh, uh, pot and longline guys uh, pick it up and, and have been harvesting it in the fall. This has been going on for, for 10 years now. And um, two thirds of all the, uh, the gear switching, according to Jesse and Jim's uh, reports, um, come from trawlers putting their own fish on the market. About 11 to 12 percent is is gear switch by people that own pot or longline boats and actually went out and bought quota. So um, that's how we see have seen this pro, uh, this trawl ITQ program working relative to sable fish. Uh, we don't think it's broken. We think there's adequate amount uh, to continue without uh, serious restrictions. But in the in the, in light of the council's decision in April, um, we are, have worked through the gap and um, and through uh, our own uh, comments. September first, we uh, made a recommendation at that time that one option you might consider is to just have a 29 percent gear switching. Season started January 1st, and when it uh, ends, it ends. Um, it is sort of a self-imposed potential race for fish option. What um, we were looking at is member, the members were looking at in September, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, all the options at that point had some lens for you had to have a permit that met a certain poundage amount. And we wanted an option in there that did not require some historical landing requirement uh, for a permit. So that's why we put that one up. Should the council endorse uh, the gap recommendation um, on alternative one that the fixed gear people, Michelle Etter and myself helped put together, uh, the association does not see the need for this alternative that we submitted in September 1st. Um, we think uh, the modified alter, uh, uh, alternative one that we uh, have worked on from the fixed gear side um, cleans up. It, it uh, eliminates all the uh, the permit requirements, 
and basically sets up two two sets of quota one for the people that have historically owned and caught and um, and then the 18 percent is the difference uh, we did have a discussion this morning in our state uh, program do we really need an august uh, 1st conversion date and that was the first time i really thought about that maybe not but i would suggest leaving it in as an option um and if we decide it's just an encumbrance that's not needed it, it's easily jettisoned um, alternative two um, similarly recognizes that same 11 percent and i think uh, michelle uh, at her uh, did a good job um, articulating how that works and then um, our two conclusions um, that keeping transferability and sales um, and uh, is very important to keeping this whole industry alive and um, allowing people to um, move their quota when they retire and sell out or for people to lease and and, um, and operate in that fashion. Um, Mr. Chairman, that concludes uh, the association's comments. Thank you, Bob. Um, any questions for Bob? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Alverson. Couple of questions for you. Um, first, um, you just described for us the situation where trawlers have no market for Dover and they have the surplus sable fish and they're putting it on the market. Um, the trawlers are putting their own shares on the market. Um, is it your perspective that those trawlers are participating in our process on this issue and offering uh, comments to us? Uh, through the chair, um, there are people that we call trawlers that don't have any boats anymore that we lease from, people lease from. Uh, there's a number of the whiting fleet that we lease from that I never hear talk about anything here. And the, the irony there in some of these options, um, uh, and I t the options I'm talking about are not the gap recommendations, but what we are left with after the June meeting. Um, a lot of the people that we have leased from um, their trawl permits were not used in those lease operations. So there's a number of trawlers that may think they are going to get a gear switching endorsement. But if the council says it's on the permit and not the fish, <laughs> there's a number of people that I don't think fully understand these alternatives. So the answer, Marcy, is no. I don't think every all the groups uh, that hold trawl quota um, are being heard from. Thank you. Um, that helps a lot. I appreciate your your explanation. Um, next question, if I could. Um, I think I understand that now that you've come up with this modified Alt-1 um, that we heard in the GAP statement, you're supporting that alternative over the recommendation in your letter, which essentially was the race for fish option. But I just want to make sure that I understand that really the intent of the modified gap alt one um, would preclude those individuals that we just discussed, these trawlers that are putting their shares on the market, because they wouldn't be the ones, I mean, if, if the new modified alt one gives credit uh, to those that invested and purchased shares always with the intention of converting them to fixed gear, they would be protected. But these trawlers that are, that are or were active trawlers but are leasing to gear switchers would be the ones that would be precluded under this modified alt one. Is that correct? <clears throat> through the chair, I don't think uh, I don't think you're um, accurate in the way that that would work. Um, 
the eleven percent, I agree with you uh, on that. Uh, the, those those people are that's kind of uh, welded together with uh, their boats and their own quota. Mm -hmm. But the eighteen percent is in addition to that, and that would reflect what the trawlers, these three groups I just mentioned, are putting their current fish up for the market. But it would be restrained to eighteen percent. Um, the historical average of all gear switching has been, I think, 33%, depending on the years you look at, uh, say 33%. So there's going to be some restraint, in my opinion, of, of um, what do I want to say, to, to lease all the quota you want to lease from the trawl perspective. Does that make sense? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Bob. I believe so. Um, I probably mischaracterized that when I said be precluded. That I, I I see what you're saying now. It's it's that those those three groups and the 18 percent and and that 18 percent would be um, essentially a reduction from their activity levels today. That would be accurate through the chair. Yeah. Thank you. Got it. Appreciate the explanation. All right, further questions for Bob. Uh, Brad Pettinger. Uh, no additional questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you're looking for Brad Pettinger. I mean, I mean it myself, so I apologize for that. Um, yeah, Bob, um, kind of curious. I look at the Jefferson State uh, website that uh, has a black cod quota put up. And I see, for the most part, looking at the uh, quick look at the years, that most of the sales of, of quota pounds are done um, prior to uh, August uh, by far. Um, do your participants utilize that website, or do you have like, kind of a long term, uh, or do they have long term agreements with folks uh, to buy their fish uh, outside of that website? Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Pettinger, my understanding is is that uh, any agreement would be just for the se uh, current season. I don't know anybody that has long-term agreements on, on gear switching. Um, I do know that some of my my members have uh, gone on, on Jefferson Trading and leased their fish and paid a, a lease fee in February and then caught it in, in uh, August, September, October. So there is... There are some of the uh, people that hold trawl quota that probably have no intention of using it uh, to catch uh, Dover salt or other species, if that's what you're asking. Thank you. Uh, further questions of Bob? All right. Uh, not hearing uh, any further questions. We'll thank Bob for his public testimony and go to Lori Steele who has a presentation. Brent, your hand is up. Did you have another question or? All right, very good. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Uh, just checking that you can hear me. Absolutely. Okay, great. And apologies in advance for talking very rapidly through this presentation, but I have a lot to get through and I'm gonna try to be not repetitive. Uh, my name is Lori Steele. I'm the executive director of the West Coast Seafood Processors Association. Today, I'd like to give you a big picture perspective and address some of the questions raised by council members earlier this year by painting a picture of where we are in terms of ground fish processing capacity on the West Coast and what we stand to lose if we don't take action to preserve our ground fish infrastructure. Next slide. Then the map on slide two gives you an idea of our current capacity to process volumes of ground fish on the West Coast. Right now, we've got 10 shoreside facilities processing ground fish in any volume. Six of these have what I consider to be significant capacity, while four are smaller facilities. Smaller is in quotes because it's relative, but generally smaller facilities process less than two or three million pounds of ground fish annually. Some of the smaller facilities are very small in terms of their current ground fish processing. I also want to recognize that there is some limited ground fish processing occurring in Half Moon Bay, but there is no facility, facility located there. On this map is all we've got right now, and it's not a lot. Next slide. 
The next slide identifies the future potential for processing ground fish if we can get closer to achieving OI for the fishery. At most, I see potential to expand to 13 shoreside facilities. In a best case scenario, eight of these 13 plants could process high volumes of ground fish. Some of these eight plants are not there yet, but they want to get there. For example, the Iwako plant is just coming back to life, but in a best case scenario, that Iwako plant is very interested in processing ground fish in significant volumes year round. Five of these 13 facilities would still likely remain smaller, and ideally we would still have processing activity occurring in Half Moon Bay. Next slide looks at the state of Washington. We've got two plants in Washington with potential to process high volumes of ground fish year, year round in Westport and Ilwaco. I've already mentioned Ilwaco, and here on this slide, I have the Bellingham facility listed as not likely to process high volumes of ground fish, but it did and it could. I actually went back and looked at historical production in Bellingham, and I would say Bellingham has a lot of potential in a future best case scenario. Just two years ago, Bellingham processed over 4 million pounds of ground fish. The important point here, which applies in all of our states, is that year-round ground fish processing means year-round employment opportunities in these communities, which provides stability for our infrastructure. And this stability is going to lead to more opportunities in other fisheries. Our infrastructure is critical, not just for ground fish, but for every fishery. Next slide, in Oregon, we've got the potential to process high volumes of ground fish year-round in Astoria, Warrington, and Newport. There is more ground fish processing capacity in Oregon than in any other state. We simply cannot stand to lose any one of these plants. Next slide, in California, our largest state on the West Coast, we are down to just two ground fish processing facilities, one of which has potential to process significant volume and the other will likely remain smaller. We're very hopeful that a processing plant will be emerging again in Crescent City, but they are having a hard time getting things rolling there and they're not getting much help or support from the city. I want to emphasize that particularly in California, if any of these plants are lost, they will never be regained. There's no going back. It's pretty scary. We are down to the bare bones in terms of ground fish processing infrastructure in California. Slide seven, next slide. Meanwhile, our ground fish stocks are mostly rebuilt and can sustain high levels of catch, much higher than anything we've seen in recent years. We spent a lot of time yesterday talking about under attainment of whiting by the mothership se sector and taking action to increase attainment for this sector. Yet we've been asking the council to address under attainment of ground fish by the shoreside sector for years. The table on this side focuses on Dover sole attainment as it relates to total ground fish catch. Numbers came from the IFQ website. This table not only shows that Dover sole attainment is very low right now, but it also shows that Dover sole is critical to overall ground fish attainment. Roughly 20% of our ground fish catch right now is Dover sole. I didn't include the total non-whiting ground fish allocations on this table, but it's an understatement to say that under attainment in the ground fish fishery is significant. Sablefish has been identified by the trawl sector as a major limiting factor and one of the primary reasons we cannot get as much dover or other ground fish out of the water. I think it's clear from this table that a high volume of dover sole is needed to get the rest of our ground fish stocks out of the water. And we need every pound of sablefish we can get in order to increase attainment of dover and all of our ground fish stocks. Next slide. One thing you've heard is that we do need to auto, what we need to do is automate some of our ground fish processing, particularly for Dover sole. Automation provides a much needed supplement to our current workforce. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over the bullets on this slide because they are self-explanatory, but I will add that we are facing labor shortages over the last two years like nothing we've seen before. We struggle to find enough labor to operate our plants and we're not operating anywhere close to full capacity. Automation was supplement, not replace our workforce. Next slide. This slide gives you an idea of what automated filleting machines look like. Two machines are needed to cut Dover sole. The first machine depicted in the left two images is the water jet machine, which removes the frill from the fish. The second machine depicted in the right two images is the filleting machine. Together, these two machines equate to what I'm referring to as one setup. 
for filleting Dover. A plant may purchase one or two or maybe three of these setups for cutting Dover and maybe a couple machines for rockfish, but it's not feasible to envision a full line of cutting machines instead of people in a processing plant. Next slide. This gives you an idea of the kind of investment we're looking at. As I mentioned, two machines are needed for one setup for Dover Soul. The purchase and conveyance of these machines, the belts and parts necessary, and the training of employees to operate these machines properly cost upwards of $5 million for one setup. Filleting machines are not currently designed specifically for our rockfish on the West Coast, but my understanding is that acquiring, retrofitting, and operating a machine that would work for rockfish at this time costs upwards of $1.5 million. So very generally, just looking at Dover Soul automation, if we're talking about two or three setups per facility, that's a 10 to $15 million investment per facility to automate for Dover. Rockfish automation would be additional investment. Next slide. This slide gives you a general idea of the potential in our ground fish fishery if some of these plants make these investments. This is really be a best case scenario given all the other challenges we are facing. If we are able to expand the ground fish fishery to better achieve OY, I estimate that over the long term, we would have a maximum of eight facilities with potential to make investments and improve and produce ground fish year round. On a, in high volume. If we assume these eight facilities were to invest in just one setup for Dover, that's $40 million. I consider this a minimum investment for these eight facilities because like I said, you would usually, you would generally want two to three setups per facility. But I also don't anticipate that all eight facilities would make the investment. But just looking at one setup individually, there is potential to process upwards of 70,000 pounds of Dover in a 24 hour period if the machine is operated full time for 24 hours. At 365 days a year, that could equate to 25.5 million, million pounds of Dover per facility. If all eight of these facilities operated a Dover setup 24 seven year round, this could be over 204 million pounds of Dover sold. Some of the facilities would make these investments with some added certainty in the management system, but some would not. So more realistically, if three to four facilities were to invest in one setup, we could be processing 76 to 102 million pounds of Dover. And even if you cut these estimates in half, assuming that these three or four facilities would not operate the machine, the machine 24 seven year round, we're looking at 38 to 51 million pounds of Dover, which is a huge increase to where we are now. And this would allow for increased catch and production of so many other ground fish stocks as well. The take home point here is that we can achieve OY, not just for Dover, but for many of our ground fish stocks, if we can enhance certainty, provide stability, and then automate some of our lines. Well, this is speculative. I don't think it's out of the question that two or three or maybe even four facilities would be willing to make this investment if they had some of the certainty we've been asking for. Last slide, I'd like to make a few general points about the range of alternatives be, that should be adopted by the council for further analysis. I strongly encourage the council to apply certainty-based caps versus the idea of projected maximums under the alternatives. Projective ma projected maximums do not address our most important need, which is certainty. I don't ever recall considering the limits in these alternatives as projections or soft caps. No matter what the percentage is that's ultimately selected by the council, it must be a hard limit in order to give processors any degree of a certainty about what to expect in the future. We would like to see certainty caps of 10, 20, and 29% analyzed. I also encourage the council to keep things simple. All we are asking for is to keep trawl allocated sable fish in the trawl sector. Simplify the alternatives to achieve this outcome. That's it. Um, you can take a look at the what else is on the res on the slide here, but just in closing, I will encourage the council to prioritize the need to achieve OY for this fishery and to please prioritize the preservation of our existing ground fish infrastructure. Our infrastructure is critical to support every fishery on the West Coast, and we've already lost too much of it. We cannot stand to lose anymore. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lori. Uh, questions for Lori? Corey Niles. 
Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, yeah, and thanks, Lori. Um, I appreciate the presentation, and yeah, you, we in Washington, um, you know, I was not around. We are, were, uh, we, others have, were, of course, but the, the Bellingham example is one always in our minds, and going back to the buyback and losing all the trawl permits and never quite being the same. Um, so just definitely want to recognize that. But my question for you is on that second bullet there and what you said, I'm still maybe not fully grasp, grasping this distinction between certainty versus projection. Yet here's, um, in my mind, and, and I think in the gap in Bob Balverson just kind of spoke to this idea. If we have, if we just simply have two, two pools of quota in the IFQ program, one's open for, for any gear type and say 29% is for any gear, the rest is only for trawl. Um, I guess the distinction between a projection and certainty kind of, kind of breaks down for me because that 29% is the most you would ever see fished with fixed gear. And it's likely to be less than that because folks who receive some of the any gear quota are going to, uh, going to fish it with trawl gear instead of fixed gear. So it would be mm -hmm. unlikely even that they get to 29%. So are you, uh, I'm just putting that out there to, do, to, 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 am I understanding your comment correctly? And how would that scenario play out in terms of your, the certainty versus the projection comment you made? Um, thank you for the question. And that's a good question. I mean, it, it gets complicated when you get into the weeds of these alternatives, but in the example that you provided, um, I would consider that a certainty-based cap of 29% um, because you, it, it provides certainty that no more than 29% would be utilized by the fixed gear se sector, um, you know, or by gear switchers, I'm sorry. But, you know, like you said, the projection is that not likely all of that 29% would be um, utilized by gear switchers. But I guess the difference is, you know, I, I look at it more, I try to make an analogy to quota setting. Um, I mean, you set a quota and, um, you, you know, you're pretty certain you're not going to go over. I mean, you are certain you're not going to go over that quota because it's a hard stop. Um, when you do an analysis of the impacts of the quota, you um, analyze, uh, you know, what the impacts are of the entire quota being utilized, even if you think uh, it won't all get utilized. Um, so it's more about the management system setting up a scenario where there's a certainty where the limit is. Um, you know, I mean, whether or not the limit is actually achieved is the second is a secondary issue. Um, what what I don't support is a management system that is designed to target or or set up uh, something that may achieve something around twenty nine percent, but we can't tell you if it's definitely going to be a limit of twenty nine percent. And that's that's what I, how I'm interpreting the projected based approaches. Thank you. That, that helped. Yep. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think, Lori, it might be one slide back. At, you were talking about the projected capacity and up to eight processors um, facilities making this. It may not actually be different processors um, doing this. And then, then you mentioned, well, it might be... <laughs> somewhere between two and four. Um, so would that effectively half the numbers that we're talking about? Um, and can you speak to any kind of plan as to how, um, you know, we're, we're going to actually achieve those numbers um, in, in terms of not the machinery that's put in product through the plants, but the actual sales in terms of competing as a commodity in a commodity marketplace. And the reason I'm asking this question is I continue to have trawlers that are telling me that they are on um, limits or trip limits. Um, so I'm really trying to flush out kind of where the capacity is now. And, and yes, we could through having consistency in market 
uh, potentially grow, but, but what is the game plan other than putting a machine in that is going to allow us to do that? And I apologize, but I think you're the only processor left testifying today or processor representative. So sorry, that question goes to you. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for the question. And um, yeah, this is, you know, starting at the top of this slide where I've identified a maximum of eight processing facilities. This is certainly if all of the stars aligned and all of the other challenges that we're facing could be dealt with. And, you know, if we were to be able to uh, regain markets that would support that kind of volume. Um, I can tell you that um, our processors are working hard on regaining those markets and finding markets. I know of several processors that are actively engaging in, in that element of things and really trying to get more Dover sold. Um, I think we have a lot of potential with uh, the USDA with Dover Soul, but um, we need to get more of the fish out of the water before the USDA is ready to work with us on Dover. We just got rockfish in with the USDA this year, um, and it's because we have been able to sort of revive the rockfish fishery in markets enough that, that the USDA saw an opportunity to provide a supplement to that market. I think there's tons of potential with Dover Soul there, but it is going to, you know, involve um, or it is going to require a lot of sort of upfront effort by the processors. This is occurring. Um, and, you know, in reality, even though we might have eight facilities that have, when I say the potential for our Dover automation in high volume, that just means they have the capacity and they are interested in processing ground fish on a year round basis. I mean, I'll go ahead and name a couple of these facilities. Facilities, and they include um, Safe Coast in El Waco and Deyang Seafoods in Astoria. You know, both of those facilities right now are not um, uh, processing high volumes of groundfish, but they want to. And they have indicated that if we can get things up and running and if we can start seeing more certainty in the future with, um, you know, how much fish we can get out of the water, that they would be, you know, on, they would be on the table for being one of the facilities that might make this investment. Um, given the investments that have already been made by a couple of facilities, um, I think it's more realistic that we're looking at three or four facilities that would do this. Um, and, you know, the facilities that have already made some investment into these machines, um, there are a couple of them. Um, and those are the same companies that are working really hard on the marketing aspect of things. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a chicken or an egg thing, but it's really kind of got to uh, all occur at the same time. And it's got, we've, we've got to do it with, um, with some security about the future. You know, rockfish automation, um, we're doing some R&D into uh, trying to get a, an automation or a machine that would cut uh, West Coast rockfish, you know, with, um, with, you know, at, with maximum efficiency and just to do the R&D, um, the company, you know, the machine companies are looking for some sort of commitment that if they develop the machine, we're going to buy so many of them, you know, so it's, there's a lot of factors at play here. Um, but I will confirm, you know, that we're not, we're not just sitting around waiting, you know, for something to happen so that we can make these investments. We're we're working really hard to try to get our markets back and, and sell more Dover right now. And I do see a lot of potential with Dover in the future with the USDA and some other volume markets if we can just get things going again. Did that answer your question, Krista? It did. Thank you. All right. Bar Brad Pettinger, followed by Marcy Uremko. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gerlnick. Um, Lori, just uh, quickly, could you, um, we, we've heard uh, about uh, boats on limits. Um, we see that the not much fish was delivered the last year as far as uh, Dover sold the trajectory. Um, I, I'm assuming that some of that, or quite a bit of that, is due to the COVID pandemic issue. And could you briefly give us a uh, how that's affected the processor uh, processing sector, and um, and uh, what the, what the outlook is there? 
Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, we are still reeling and trying to recover from the impacts of the COVID pandemic. I mean, the initial shutdown, you know, last March obviously uh, created um, a, a surplus of product for the fish that, that we were really getting out of the water. Um, and it has taken us this long to sort of clean out that inventory um, and get establish a working relationship with the USDA to um, purchase some of our surplus inventory and to help provide us with an overflow uh, market. Um, we've been successful on that with rockfish. It's taken a really long time, um, but certainly with a, a, a species like Dover, I mean, just just the nature of Dover is that it's generally high volume, low pr lower price. And um, with the increase in cost of operating, over the last year and a half, it's created a significant challenge in terms of trying to um, increase uh, purchases of Dover. I mean, market, you know, the market issues and the market challenges are one thing, but then just the overall cost of doing business has just totally increased exponentially on throughout the supply chain over the last year and a half. So, you know, we're facing a lot of challenges. Um, it's, I think we're still, you know, a ways out from being through this pandemic in terms of the impacts on, on the processors and on the supply chain. Um, we're getting out of the hole now um, and certainly looking forward, but um, it, it definitely, it definitely slowed us down in terms of being able to, um, you know, pay fishermen for large quantities of fish that we can't sell. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do the best we can. And, and I think I mentioned it's this at the last meeting. I mean, processors don't make money unless they sell fish. Um, we still pay the fishermen and we still pay our companies to, you know, we still pay our workforce to uh, work, but we don't make money unless the fish gets sold. So we're doing everything we can to try to sell the fish. And the more fish we can sell, the more fish we can catch. Um, but the pandemic really has uh, had some last long lasting ripple effects. Um, the, the latest thing that we're dealing with um, is labor shortages. And I mean, it's been really, really, really hard this year. Um, and, and this applies across all of our fisheries, but you know, we can hardly staff our, our facilities to process fish, you know, at all. Um, so this all plays into the situation that we're in right now. All right, uh, Marcy Yaremko. Sure. Thank you, Lori. Um, since you are the representative of the West Coast Seafood Seafood Processors Association, you know you, you have a pretty good feel, I think, for the overall situation um, that our West Coast processors are facing. Um, I'm looking at your slides four, five, and six, where you break out Washington, Oregon. And California individually, and I think the take-home message is that um, the capacity um, to process uh, fish year-round may may be there, um, and you need the fish to to do that. Um, I'm not sure if you're following uh, the request to the council this week for considering emergency action to extend the the uh, end season date of the primary sablefish tear fishery. But one one thing we heard in the discussion um, so far on that issue is that in Alaska, at least, um, processors um, are pretty busy with salmon. And I'm just wondering, um, on the West Coast, um, obviously, uh, your uh, activities depend on the production of fish uh, from the fishers that supply uh, the plants on the West Coast. But 
Um, I see this kind of emphasis of the need for year-round supplies of, of fish, and this discussion is about sable fish and ensuring that there's enough sable fish to be sure to maintain a steady supply of all ground fish into the markets. But I'm just wondering how much an effect um, other fisheries have on these plants and their availability. And if you can speak specifically uh, to salmon this year, um, I'm just interested in knowing um, if salmon is having an effect uh, in the processing uh, capacity of the plants that, that you're representing. Sure, thank you for the question. Um, I can say that on the West Coast overall, um, we are not processing large quantities of salmon anywhere. Um, the salmon, you know, that, that is processed is quite limited, at least relative to um, uh, things like ground fish, uh, you know, whiting and crab and shrimp. Um, you know, all of these, not all of them, most of these facilities uh, also rely in part on crab and shrimp seasonally, whiting seasonally. Um, but again, you know, we're looking at trying to sustain these operations year round. And really the only way to sustain these operations year round is through ground fish. Um, ground fish really needs to be the backbone uh, uh, the backbone of production for these facilities in order for them to operate year round and not just be open for the crab fishery or just be open for the shrimp fishery. Um, and we're also really looking at, um, uh, I mean, this is about for us, uh, it's about being able to achieve the levels of production um, in the ground fish fishery that we are allowed to and authorized to under the FMP, you know, in a sustainable way. And the volumes that we're talking about here are so much higher than the volumes that we're talking about with, with species like salmon on the West Coast anyway. Um, Ground fish, um, West Coast ground fish um, has the ability to contribute to feeding the world. That's the way I like to describe it. You know, we have enough um, potential and uh, certainly enough fish in the water that if we could get it out of the water, um, people all over the country and the world could be eating West Coast ground fish. Um, and that's what we're really looking at when, when we're talking about these facilities and talking about production on a year round basis. These, you know, there will always be some cutting fish up and down the coast, you know, in small quantities and it, you know, at fish markets and things like that. But if we really want to achieve and realize the benefits that can be realized in this fishery, um, we are currently right now down at a critical level for our infrastructure to work, to be able to do that. Um, and uh, I mean, I relative to ground fish and relative to to shrimp and crab, I would say that salmon production on the west coast is is uh, is is a much smaller player, and certainly isn't one of the components that we view as you know part of our portfolio that could potentially feed the world. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, further questions for Lori? Uh, I'm not seeing any. We obviously have a number of additional public uh, commenters, but we are into the noon hour here, so we will take our lunch break. Um, we will we'll come back in a little bit over an hour at uh, 1.20. So we'll see you all there and we'll start with, I think Jeff Lackey is the next speaker. So see you all at 120.
<clears throat> okay, it's uh, one twenty. It is time to return, and we are in public comment on agenda item C five: stable fish gear switching. And our next speaker is Jeff Lackey, and Jeff has a presentation. Yes, hello. Uh, can you hear me? I can. I can hear you, and we'll just give Sandra a moment to to get the presentation up. There we are. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Jeff Lackey. I'm speaking on behalf of Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. And I'll be presenting some slides that were actually from two years ago, presentation I, I did to the SAMTAC. Uh, next slide, please. The trawl baseline for West Coast Sablefish was 48% for 60 years prior to catch years, with the lowest decade being 44%. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Despite six decades of a near even split between trawl and fixed gear, after catch shares, the trawl splint went to 30%, with fixed gear accounting for nearly two and a half times the amount of trawl. Next slide, please. The pre catch shares baseline for bottom trawl was 40 million pounds, that's excluding Petroli, Sable, and Hague. But as of 18, 2018, it was less than 25 million pounds. Next slide, please. So reports show that there were 54 vessels that fished in 2009 or 10 that did not fish in 2014. There were 17 new vessels that hadn't fished in 2009 or 10, and 13 of those were fixed gear vessels. So we had 54 vessels leave the fishery, where Sable was a portion of their incidental catch, and 13 come in where Sable was primarily their only catch. Next slide, please. So, the, so what happened with that? Well, the pre-catch shares Dover baseline for the three years prior to catch shares was 24.2 million pounds per year average. Post-catch shares, three year, first three-year average, saw the immediate 32% drop down to 16.5 million pounds and further declined there to 14 million pounds in 2018. We saw from Lori Steele's slide, we went down to 12.7 and then 10 point something in 2019 and 20. Next slide, please. This is a, a diagram from the five-year review that shows the cycle of inconsistent supply to processors and the low attainment that leads to uh, low prices and uncertainties. And this is what was experienced in the, in the trawl fishery under, under this scenario. Uh, next slide, please. The five-year review document makes clear the link between fixed gear attainment of sable and reduced a, a, attainment of DTS species. Three findings from that document. The fixed gear fishery contributed to the decrease of, in attainment of Dover and Thorny Heads. And second, that sable fish quota is a principal constraint on DTS fishing. Third, that the upper bound Dover increase of 14.5% or 14.7 million pounds would be the theoretical potential increase in the absence of gear switching. Next slide, please. In 2018, on average, every 100 pounds of sable fish for a trawl, trawl vessel corresponded to 808 pounds of other IFQ catch minus petroli, and that's for bottom trawl. Uh, next slide, please. Same year, on average, for every 100 pounds of sable fish for a fixed gear vessel corresponded to five pounds of other IFQ catch minus petroli again. So for 100 pounds for, for uh, trawl, 808 for, for fixed gear, five. Uh, next slide, please. So when we look at that, 
difference, a clear picture emerges of a significant impact of fixed gear use on the utilization of other IFQ species, which is backed up by the data. In addition, the immediate 32% reduction in Dover attainment under catch shares corresponded with the 27% share of northern sable land landings attributed to fixed gear. Next slide, please. And so here's a recap I won't go over, uh, but I wanted to uh, turn attention to a public comment letter that I submitted under this agenda item. I noted 13 items that uh, could really have more consideration and discussion in the council process to arrive at a sufficient range of alternatives and 13 items to consider in the future in advance of and a discussion of PPA. I'll try to go through them quickly. The first and most important is the capacity for OI. There is no doubt that fixed gear attainment of trawl sable reduces the capacity to achieve OI. This is easily understood when looking at historic catch ratios, economic viability for vessels and processors that sable brings, and the necessity of geographically dispersed fishery that uh, the increasing quantity of sable would be required to, to have. OI is not achieved without these three components facilitated by sable. Capacity for OI is the number one item that should drive the decision making. The second is the immediacy of need and the potential for, for permanent harm. Um, with, when infrastructure supporting trawl leaves a community, other fisheries can suffer and losses can be permanent. There is a lot of ground fish infrastructure and muscle memory that has less of a chance of rebuilding with each passing year of underperforming. That might be what Lori Steele was talking about when she said they are at a critical level with their infrastructure. It would be good to have a, more of a discussion about the immediacy of the need. Third, that we have a role to play in domestic food production. This should be really front and center for something we, we, we do as a, uh, in, in the decision-making process. It's so critical. It's, it's more important than ever how domestic food production and food security are, are extremely important to our country and could be more so going forward. Uh, fourth, sector integrity. Something we hadn't talked about a whole lot in this process, but it's, it's just critical to all fisheries. And fixed gear sable is largely focused on frozen product and limited processing needs, whereas trawl sable is part of a multi-species fishery and requires infrastructure permanently anchored in communities and markets that take time to build. The rationale, the rationale pretty much for all sector integrity that, that marks all fisheries is that it, not to mix two disparate sectors that destabilizes one of them. And this is what has happened here. Fifth, the choice before the council. It, it might be good to talk about, uh, we, we do have a choice and that might be what Lori Steele was talking about when she said that we have what we have to gain and what we have to lose. And she did that in terms of talking about the map and communities and plants. Be nice to talk about the two, the two paths that, um, that are laid out for what happens if we don't achieve OI and we continue on this path and what happens if we give the capacity for achieving OI and we can pursue that path. Um, hard cap versus soft cap, it would be good to have more conversation around that. I have a written public comment under agenda item G1 at November 2020 council that had lots of discussion under that that hasn't been well discussed of sort of the, the the mechanisms and, and cause and effect around that. And every loophole is a self-fulfilling prophecy in this in this case of, of fixed gear. It diminishes trawl catch. There's not a good reason for soft cap caps because of the previous explanation of, of uh, sector integrity. They, they only destabilize. And in the interest of time, I will skip over the others for now. They are in my public comment. Um, but with that, I wanted to go back to Lori Steele's presentation and the driving item of ROA and eventually PPA and FPA should be striving to achieve OY, uh, both from a legal and a practical standpoint and what it means to communities. Lori's presentation really put that into the practical perspective of what that means and looking at those maps and that the processors are at a critical level of infrastructure that supports not only ground fish trawl, but other fisheries. Lori showed in terms of communities and processing plants what they have to stay, uh, stand to gain and what they have to lose. And Sable has helped lead 
as I've showed previously, to a contraction. And the trawl allocation needs to go back to the trawl fishery to help lead back to an expansion to really get back to what Lori was showing as possible. And as the pro I say all this because as the processor goes, so go the trawl vessels. We cannot sell fish where there is no processor or the fillet lines have shrunk in capacity. Status quo fixed gear attainment is not a roadmap to community success. The near term meaningful reduction is needed. The previous points are rationale for why a 10% hard cap and a phase out is necessary. And with that, um, that is why we support the uh, page six gap statement three general request on range of alternatives for using hard caps, uh, having hard cap sub options for each alternative 10%, 20%, and 29%, and to include a phase out with each option. And thank you. That concludes um, my, my, my statements, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Jeff, thank you for your statement and for the presentation. Let me see if there are any questions for you from the council. And I am not seeing any. So thank you. Oh, now I do. Marcy Remco. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Jeff. Um, appreciate your PowerPoint and your testimony. Um, I'm looking to talk a little more about Dover specifically. Um, you've referenced Lori's uh, information and then you've provided some as well. Um, on the current level of 14 million pounds, which is down significantly from the pre catch share average, um, it sounds to me like you're suggesting that the reason we can't get that Dover out of the water is due to the sablefish constraint. Um, but I'm hoping you can characterize for us um, what the situation is right now with um, the markets imposing uh, Dover trip limits. Um, how, how widespread is that? And how might it affect this uh, third bullet that you have up on the screen? Okay, so thank you for the question. And I'd like to answer that by kind of oversimplifying it. Um, the first several years of the program, Sable was the direct constraint. Talk to fishermen running away from Sable or stopping fishing when they were running out or um, the uh, processing plants reducing their fillet lines. Um, and so there was a contraction that took place a few years ago and we kind of had one thing after another, whether it was, you know, the, the Japan market, the prices went down. There were several things that affected. It's almost as if the contraction in the fishery because of the Dover led to a contraction in the processing. Um, now we're at a place to where the vessels are, they're totally dependent on the processors. In, in, in my hometown here, there's just, processing it's not totally gone away but it's it's pretty darn close it's it's, it's a shell of its former self and we're kind of looking at what happens next um, and at this point the vessels are dependent upon the processors but the processors as Lori has talked about in even in previous testimony there's just been so many things happen they're looking at okay, how much do they go invest in a new plant or a new fillet line or machines? Um, as was noted in the state meeting this morning, talking about the fish that's left in the water since the pandemic happened, it's like, well, yes, they're sable now, but it's the pandemic and you can't go out and make a 10 year payback um, plan to, to ramp up your production if you don't know you're gonna have the fish. We've already been constricting, constraining at 29%. So 29% doesn't, in my mind, I'm, I wouldn't be real uh, confident that we would see a, a lot of investment. So we're kind of at a, I think Lori even talked about a chicken or the egg. Um, 
there's at this point not a lot of incentive for the processors to do something different than they're doing. But with, with the pandemic, it's hard to do anything. They're, they're surviving right now. So it's kind of difficult to say. It, it's more it's easier to talk about a few years ago than it is now, because now the pandemic covers everything. But a few years ago, Sable was, you know, 100, 98 to 100 percent prescribed before the pandemic. And so we were kind of maxed out. But then because the processing capacity got hit, we're going to have to ramp up the processing capacity again to get to OI. And that's kind of where we're at. Did that thank answer you, your Mr. question, Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Brad, Brad Pettinger. Yeah, thank you, Chair Rolnick. Um, Jeff, I'm kind of curious. Um, uh, you pointed out the reduction in Dover landings from uh, 2008 into, as we went into the IFQ system. Um, but I didn't see you, you didn't um, seem to indicate that uh, the uh, patrolling uh, overfishing designation in 2009 or the 30% uh, reduction in sable fish had, had much of an effect. Or at least you didn't mention that. I'm kind of curious. You know, do you, it's a known fact that didn't, um, is there, um, are you thinking that wasn't a cause or um, it's a, I'm kind of curious why you didn't mention it. Um, why I didn't mention it in terms of why there was a, a Dover reduction. Um, so the, the slide, let's see. What slide is this? Um, slide six, the 2008 through 2010, the average Dover catch was 24.2 million pounds. And then the three years immediately after um, the catch years was implemented, the Dover catch was 16.5 million pounds. And so what I was drawing a line from, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide five, you had 54 trawl vessels leave the fishery that you sable to catch other species, and you had 13 fixed gear fish uh, vessels enter the fishery to catch pretty much only sable. And so, the 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 percentage of fixed gear catch corresponded not too far away from the percentage decline in Dover. Um, so that was the distinction. I know there's some other issues with petroleum, and but I don't. That wasn't really part of the point I was trying to show here. I don't know if that helps. Sure, I could. But, um, yeah, of course. I, yeah, no, I, I just got curious. To do, uh, I was looking for more context in, in what you uh, in your presentation there. So, um, but I think you've. Uh, but don't, okay, I'm good. Brad, I, I guess I didn't hear that last. Did you Did you have a comment or not? A question or oh, not? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I said I was good. Thank you. Okay. All okay, right. Great. I didn't, didn't hear that. Uh, any other questions of Jeff? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, our next uh, public speaker will be Robert Eder. Sound check. Uh, loud and clear. Chairman Gorelnik, members of the council. My name is Bob Edder, fishing vessel Timmy Boy, Newport, Oregon. My comments today are focused on moving forward a more clearly defined version of alternative two as the council adopts its range of alternatives. The council has taken two actions on the gear switching issue. First, four years ago, as a possible problem was identified, a control date was adopted relative to gear switching. Second, this spring, a target was established for a maximum gear switching on sablefish at 29% based on the average gear switch share prior to that control date. Alternative two can be configured to address this limitation and approach certainty in its execution. 
Alternative two is entirely consistent with previous actions this council has taken when narrowing a fleet, as in groundfish limited entry, and establishing individual opportunities toward a known quota ceiling, as in Amendment 20 or the fixed gear tier fishery. It is based on historical participation and levels of production during a selected window period. It is doable. The council has experience executing a program such as this. NIMPS knows how to set it up. The necessary data already exists. A few specifics. One, choose a window period and significant levels of participation and landings. Two, honor the quota share owned by any of those who meet qualification thresholds. This will be about 11% of Sablefish quota. Three, distribute the remainder, approximately 18%, to qualified permits based on their historical production averages as expressed in quota share. Eliminate the ability for all to approach a vessel cap of 4.5%. This will generate a known amount every year, a mechanism toward certainty. Four, the any permit point 5% feature may be untenable, as Dr. Seeger points out. It needs to be either reduced or eliminated, definitely de-incentivized. In closing, I remind the council, we didn't ask for this. It is only our position that endorsement is an appropriate, precedented response to the perceived problem of gear switching and the desire for its limitation. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Are there any questions for Bob? Thank you, Bob. Next, uh, Travis Hunter, followed by Mike Rutherford. Yes, thank you, Chair Gorlnick. Uh, can you hear me all right? Uh, I can. Go ahead, Travis. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Gorlnick, council members. For the record, my name is Travis Hunter, and I'm a fourth generation commercial fisherman. My family currently owns and operates two trawlers that participate in the Trawl IQ program. Um, first of all, I would, I would like to thank uh, the presenters, Lori Steele and Jeff Lackey, for their uh, uh, presentations. Um, they did an excellent job um, laying laying out some of the issues, and uh, um, I appreciate their work on this. Um, first off, I'd like to support uh, moving forward for analysis the range of alternative options that are outlined in the uh, gap statement portion that is in support of limiting gear switching. Um, second off, I, I would like to uh, address the 29% uh, maximum criteria. And, and I've, I've come to find out over this uh, last couple of days uh, in the gap and watching the uh, presentations from uh, Jim Seeger and Jesse Dorpinghaus that I'm, I'm more confused about um, about that maximum um, level of fixed gear attainment of the trawl sector's northern sablefish allocation than I thought that I was. Um, it was it was my understanding that back in 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 April that that council action was to set a a, a ceiling or a, a maximum. Um, attainment level and and not to use that as a a target and certainly uh not something that 
would be allowed to exceed. Um, and depending on, you know, which alternative and, and options and alternatives um, you use, there is, um, there's possibility for, for exceeding that 29%. Um, so I, I, I don't, I don't know if that's my own confusion. It seemed pretty clear to me, and it seemed pretty clear um, with council discussion on that motion um, that that that's what council members were, were voting on. Um, if I've missed somewhere something in that, um, that's on me. But it seemed pretty clear to me. So uh, not to take up any more time, um, I'd like to. I, I definitely support alternatives that provide for a significant reduction in the current level of fixed gear attainment in the trawl IQ programs. And, and in order to do so um, with any kind of certainty um, that there be no legacy opportunities or conversion dates um, and that uh, and that this be looked at as a you know as long term criteria with potential for a sunset of fixed gear attainment in the trawl ITQ program. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. See if there are any questions for you. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Travis. Mike Rutherford, welcome. I'm not seeing Mike. Uh, as a reminder, if your name is on the list, uh, raise your hand in the Ring Central uh, application so it's easier for us to find you and unmute your microphone. But I don't see Mike Rutherford with us, so we'll come back. And we'll go to Rex Leach. Uh, we'll come back to Rex. And uh, Lisa Damrosh is here. She has her hand raised. Welcome, Lisa. Um, hi. Can you hear me OK? Absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, like others, I'm I'm going to try to speak quickly because I uh, have a little less time than I'm used to speaking as an individual. So, um, for the record, my name is Lisa Damrosh, and I am speaking today on behalf of my family's business only. Uh, we have been trawlers since before IFQ. We are quota owners. We have participated in gear switching since 2010, and we continue to be active trawlers out of California above the 36 line. I bring up the 36 line because I think it's important to restate that gear switching below 36 is not impacted by any of these discussions. Wide open gear switching of southern sablefish is needed to keep boats fishing and communities landing ground fish in that area. There's no need to be concerned about impacting trawlers in that area because unfortunately there aren't any. They're gone. And at this moment, it's difficult to imagine that they'll ever come back. However, there is still a trawl fleet, albeit small, operating a, between the 36 degree management line and the 4010 line in California. We're actually a pretty resilient bunch and we've had two more trawlers come into or back into the trawl fishery recently. This group is landing in multiple ports and innovating markets. As Lori mentioned in Half Moon Bay, we have vertically integrated with offloading, marketing and processing. And while our processing is limited as a small port, it is expanding and a new facility is scheduled to open this year. I know I've been vocal about the differences between trawlers in California and the larger trawl fleet to our north. But on this issue, let me be clear, we are one in the same. We are all trawlers trying to survive in a fishery that is struggling. Any changes to management lines or exceptions for gear switching within California as alternatives move forward could have the unintended consequences of seeing trawlers in our area suffer the same fate as those to our south. We ask that the council reject any such alternatives or options. 
Years ago, I was an alternate at a cab meeting in Portland. And at that time, much like now, there were a lot of opinions and alternatives and criteria, and it was enough to make your head spin. And the group at that time didn't agree on much, but that meeting did result in three principles that the group agreed on. And they were one, we wanna get more sable fish to the trawl fleet. Two, we wanna consider existing operations and investments. And three, we believe that unlimited catch of sable fish through gear switching is not desirable. As I sit here today, all these years later, after all the discussions and analysis, I think these three principles still hold up. And I would add one more that I've been hearing but wasn't discussed back then. And that is number four, we need whatever program is put into place to be as simple as possible. So one, getting more stable fish to the trawl fleet, I would point to the gap report, support for limiting gear switching, section number three. And again, point out that this also applies to California. We've been working incredibly hard to increase demand for all species of trawl fish and to rebuild the infrastructure and markets that we have lost. Without the certainty that there'll be enough stable fish for the trawl fleet, the options to rebuild those markets for Dover and other species remain limited. We recently had a trawler begin operating in California with the goal of harvesting Dover that unfortunately couldn't make things work. We need to ensure every opportunity for the trawl fleet is there to target all trawl species. Two, considering existing operations and investments, my family is heavily invested in the trawl fishery and in gear switching within the trawl fishery. We are one of just two or maybe three operations that have used both gear types in the IFQ fishery in the last 10 years, which I believe is what the gear switching provision was designed for. We're also heavily invested in the future of this fishery, with the fifth generation joining the family business full time just a few months ago. We support language in the gap statement and from the no action section that considers legacy qualification for ownership and participation. And we agree that qualified operations should be able to gear switch 100% of the quota that they own. Three, undesirability of unlimited catch of sable fish through gear switching. I understand the reasons for comments to the contrary, particularly considering current marking conditions for sable fish. However, this is not just a sable fish issue, and this is not just a now issue. This is a trawl fishery, and it is a trawl fishery in trouble. We should not be encouraging unlimited catching of any trawl species under the IFQ trawl fishery using any gear other than trawl gear. Regarding sable fish, for whatever ROA moves forward, we support 5A and 5B from the gap report section on support for limited gear switching regarding using hard caps and using the same 10, 20, 29% sub option. It's a little late uh, to move moving forward on simplicity, but I think we need to try. And options and sub options for opt outs or active trawler designations that are annually renewed are likely to be difficult. We also believe that a control date should be a control date and that the council should not consider options or sub options that include participation beyond the control date. This will simplify the analysis. We don't support options or sub options that recreate a derby fishery or create a race for fish within the IFQ fishery, such as conversion dates or in season limits. And we can't support any automatic sunset or phase out for qualified gear switching or limitations on allowing qualified legacy privileges to be transferred, at least within a family. Um, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, any questions I'm here to answer. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your comment. Let me see if there are any questions from around the table. And I'm not seeing any, thanks very much. Um, I understand Mike Rutherford is with us now. So if I don't call on him now, I might forget get later. So Mike, uh, if you're with us, please raise your hand. We'll enable your mic and you can go ahead. Mr. Chairman and council members, can you hear me? You bet. Thank you for this time. And I'm, I apologize for the delay. Uh, my name is Mike Rutherford. Uh, we own four fishing vessels out of Newport. Um, and I'm just going to keep this short. Uh, uh, and to the point, gear switching, in my opinion, should never have been a provision in the original framework of the IFQ. Pro and uh, I would encourage you to put hard caps and even eliminate over time gear switching. Um, active trawlers and processors all agree that in order to build back the trawl fishery and invest in our communities, uh, the people that are, are invested, we must have a security that the trawl allocated sable fish 
will always be available to the trawlers. So my ask is that you consider reducing and eliminating fixed gear operations and uh, give us access to our trawl allocated sable fish. Um, I guess that's all I really have to say. There's enough been said by other uh, testimonies and I just really feel that uh, something needs to be done sooner than later. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Mike. Let me see if there are any questions for Mike. I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Mike, for your testimony. Uh, next, uh, Mark, Mark Cooper, followed by Tim Hobbs. So, Mark, you need to unmute on your end, it looks like. There you go. Again, that just popped up after you said that, so. Okay, Mr. Chairman and council members, for the record, my name is Mark Cooper. My family owns three trawl vessels and we have four, four quota share accounts. We deliver fish into Newport, Hammond, and Astoria. I come from a multi-generational fishing family and my son, Chris, hopefully has a long future to come in the trawl fishery. I have said before that I believe that this is a mistake to have mixed, fixed gear in a trawl IF cube fishery. I can say this because I have direct experience being a boat owner who uses trawl gear, but who has tried using pots to fish some of my sable fish under the IF cube program, ITQ program, excuse me, as was the intent of the original gear switching provision. What I found was that it made more economic sense for me to deliver a portfolio of trough caught ground fish species versus straight sable fish. Fixed gear sable fish was virtually no, has no associated IFQ species such catch with it. And they have caught an average of 31% of the Northern sable fish trawl quota since the beginning of the IFQ program. The analysis supports this point and indicates that in 2018, for every 100 pounds of northern sable fish landed with trawl gear, an associated 808 pounds of other IFQ species are landed minus the petroli. If petroli was included, the associated pound caught with trawl gear would be much greater. At the same time, for every 100 pounds of fixed gear sable fish landed, only five pounds of associated IFQ species were landed. After reading Tim Hobbs letter to the council, a light bulb went off in my head. Why are we letting fixed gear catch so much of the trawl quota? Especially when they already have a fully utilized tier fishery in their own gear type. MSA National Standard 1 states that the management measure shall prevent overfishing while achieving on a continuous basis the optimum yield each for each federal fishery. I have not heard the council discuss why they are ignoring that part of the national standard, one related to achieving OY, especially when the council does pay strong attention to the overfish component of the standard. The whole standard is a mandate, not just part. At this meeting, my understanding is that the council is to adopt a range of alternatives to limit gear switching, with 29% being the, the maximum amount to be used in the alternative. I believe that zero gear switching should be an, analyzed as well as 10, 20, and, thir, and 29%. These percentages should be hard caps, not simply targets. I would like to point out that this fishery has been harvesting 97% of the sable fish most years since this program has been implemented. And for the trawl portion of the sector to increase these catches, the sable fish has to come out of the fixed gear portion. Sable fish dictate how much IFQ sector OI is caught. In addition to the written testimony of Tim Hobbs, I support the Written and oral comments of Jeff Lackey and Laurie Steele, I agree with Mike Rutherford. Thank you for your time. This is a very important issue for my family and all the crew we support. I can answer any questions you have. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mark. See any, if there are any questions for Mark. Uh, I'm not seeing any. So our next speaker is Tim Hobbs. Welcome, Tim. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Gorelnik. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, so I represent uh, Jim Sievers and Jeff Lackey. And again, my name is Tim Hobbs, and I'm an attorney with the law firm of k &L Gates. Um, I'd like to briefly address two legal issues, uh, National Standard 1 and NEPA. Uh, as Mark uh, was just talking about, National Standard 1 requires the council to achieve optimum yield. Courts have called this an unqualified directive. It's a legal mandate. The council is required by statute to achieve optimum yield over the long term, the same as it's required to prevent overfishing. We are far below optimum yield for a number of ground fish stocks, as we all know. And the council should be working towards achieving optimum yield with the same urgency that it acts to prevent overfishing. The fundamental purpose of this action was to look at improving trawl sector attainment. That's been the very title of the SAM Act, is trawl attainment. The council can debate about the extent to which gear switching may have inhibited trawl sector attainment in the past. But the real question is about the future and rebuilding capacity to achieve optimum yield. The trawl sector needs its allocation, the trawl sector allocation of stable fish in order to do this. Can the trawl sector ever hope to achieve optimum yield if 20 or 30 percent of northern sablefish trawl allocation is effectively reallocated to the fixed gear sector? That is a question the council must grapple with. Whatever action the council takes must be rationally connected to the achievement of optimum yield. And there has been relatively little discussion to date about how the various alternatives under consideration are rationally connected with achieving optimum yield. And this feeds into my second point. Under NEPA, there must be a reasonable range of alternatives. Courts have invalidated actions that failed to consider an alternative that was more consistent with the basic underlying policy objectives than the alternatives that were considered. One basic policy objective here is achieving optimum yield. And putting a low cap on fixed gear use of trawl sector quota and phasing out gear switching altogether is arguably more consistent with achieving optimum yield than some of the other alternatives under consideration because it would free up more quota of a potentially constraining species to allow an increase in overall attainment. So for purposes of analysis in this document and in compliance with NEPA, the council should include an alternative that would cap fixed gear use at a low level, say 10%, and they would also phase out gear switching altogether. Thank you for considering my comments. All right, thank you, Tim. Let me see if there are any questions from around the table. I'm not seeing any. So uh, our next, our last two speakers are Lynn Langford Walton and John Corbin. So Lynn, please go ahead. Mic check? That's all, it's working. Wonderful, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. Uh, for the record, my name's Lynn Langford Walton. And FYI, I tried to reduce this down to get this under three minutes. Hopefully I can, I can accommodate that. Um, I'm submitting comments on behalf of my clients with harvesting interests in a broad range of Alaskan and West Coast fisheries. Those have been identified in other uh, testimony. I'd be happy to provide them for anyone that needed to know. Obviously, there is a tremendous amount that's been said on this subject, offering you vastly different opinions and a broad range of viewpoints. I'm going to take a slightly different spin on it. I'm not going to stay with the analytical pieces. Um, and I don't know that restating my continuing concerns at a higher, what I consider a somewhat different level are gonna be helpful, but I'm gonna make a quick run at that, at certain of those. 
I want to reference uh, Mr. Bob Dooley's prior comments, which provided in part the basis for the council's temporary refocusing of this discussion to determine an acceptable level of uh, gear switching. That effort resulted in the 29% um, gear switching limitation that was adopted by the council. My take home of Mr. Dooley's comments was, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Uh, I hope I didn't butcher that too badly, Mr. Dooley. I think that the statement was clear and I agree with the, set, the sentiment. Along those same lines, what I, I would like to ask is that the council put a very bright red pin on the map that shows you are here. What that means to me is a robust analysis, <clears throat> excuse me, of status quo and all the impacted and affected industry as they exist now. Because I don't understand if you, if you don't have a thorough understanding of where they are today, how are you likely to assess the impacts to them that you see as you move down the road? Large, mid-sized and small fish buyers, large, mid-sized and small trawlers, and fixed gear harvesters and the coastal communities associated which each of those have very different financial situations, different business models, different harvesting plans, and many times they are discrete locations. I understand that this can be done later in the process. I'd like to suggest that we front load that information and not use a rear view mirror the, that view can occur when we are so far down this road that we can't stop forward momentum if or when substantive negative consequences might be identified. We support the advancement of a well-structured, carefully crafted and confidential survey that can help inform the status quo assessment. That completes my comments, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much, Lynn. Let me see if there are any questions from the council. Uh, Krista Svensson. Yes, thank you, um, Chairman Gorelnik or Chair Gorelnik. I, um, I have one question and it's just because you're an all gear group. So I'm, I'm hoping you may be able to give us some oversight on, on um, Michelle Longo Edder's conversation earlier today about new entrants um, getting in. She spoke to fixed gear, um, but wondering about um, opportunities for trawl fishermen to lease um, in addition to fixed gear throughout the spectrum um, in terms of trawl fishermen, so shoreside, midwater, et cetera. And if, if that's something that you can speak to. Um, through the chair, Ms. Fenson, I can offer a limited perspective, but I'll, I will try. Um, I know that the, the individuals that I work with, we have over time, beginning all the way back to the halibut and sablefish IFQ and continuing down into this region, um, encourage crew members, um, financed crew. Um, at this point, we have one vessel that is under contract for sale that we're carrying the contract. We have uh, permits that are associated with that, um, conversation with different individuals for Dungeness Crab. Uh, we have offered quota share uh, in that sort of uh, either pay as you go, work with the pool, deliver it, you know, however we could structure that. Don't see very many takers, and I think in part that has a lot to do with um, one, the ROI. I mean, the rate of return on these is. Uh, is not very high. It may be less expensive in some places, but it also means that there's a lesser rate of return. And alone's alone, you still have to pay it back. Um, maybe that will change in the future. I, it, from my perspective, it depends entirely on not if you can just get a volume of fish out of the water, but whether or not that volume of fish out of the water is going to be of a substantial or a reasonable uh, financial margin to make those payments and make those gains. I don't I don't know that that's gonna happen. Um, I know that we would like to see that. We have offered and been parts of groups that have offered that through over time. It is a very difficult situation to get younger people in. Um, it's not very widespread. We'd like to see more programs. I just don't see a lot of young folks 
that are entering the fishery. And I would be happy to, you know, do more if we could, but we've tried in California, we've tried with our group now. And I, I just think that next generation issues, as Michelle, excuse me, as Michelle indicated, are extremely difficult. Finding somebody who's got the momentum, who's got some financial leverage, who's got some motivation, you know, and the kind of drive that a lot of people that are in this room right now have, it's a tough go. I wish I had a better answer, but I think that it's thin on the ground on who the next generation is, and I'm not sure what it's going to take to get them motivated. Does that answer your question? Um, well, one clarifying, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, and that would be just to, in terms of, are, are you referring to gear switching folks, straight up trawl folks, you threw Dungeness in there. So just wanting to make sure I have a clear understanding of who, who we are talking about when, when you say there are a few people um, on opportunities, but slim pickings on the grounds in terms of future generations. Is it across all segments or are we, are we in one particular, one particular or not? Because, uh, thank you through the chair, Ms. Fenson. Um, because we are spread across that <laughs> spectrum, um, those are the individuals we've reached out to across that spectrum, and I see the same lack in all of those. That includes gear switching. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Are there uh, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Not seeing any. Uh, John Corbin. Here's my thing. Okay, can you hear me now? Absolutely. Well, Mr. Chairman and Council Members, my name is John Corbin. Our company has been gear switching since the beginning with two boats, and we own our own permits and quota shares. Regarding the 29% level of gear switching, I believe that should only be applied to the legacy gear switchers, as that is the historic average level of gear switching since the beginning. And I believe it was the intent of the decision made in April. Keep in mind, legacy gear switchers also include those trawlers that gear switched in the past. If you add in the possibility that all trawlers could gear switch, the sky is the limit. However, historically, most trawlers have not gear switched and most likely would not if trawling is available. I do believe that all trawlers should have the option especially if a catastrophic event such as salmon bycatch were to shut down trawling. I reiterate that 29% should only be applied to the legacy gear switchers as a framework for these discussions. I would like to address Corey Niles' question to Michelle Etter regarding moving forward with crew members as Krista was just talking about as well. As this question is near and dear to my heart, our company is attempting to move one of our captains into an ownership position right now. He would buy into the boat, gear, and permits. However, at this time, we can't move forward with selling him quota share and adding him to our QS account because of the uncertainty of what has been going on here. <clears throat> if we make changes to our QS account right now, we risk losing our ability to gear switch in the future. Our company believes in bringing great crew members up in the ranks and even ownership in the company, if it's a good fit for both. This process has drug on so far that it has made the decision about making, has made decision-making about the future close to impossible. Even the crew members don't know if there's a future here. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much, John. Let me see if there are any questions for John. And I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'm gonna give uh, Rex Leach one more chance to speak up, although I don't see him on the list. So, uh, no Rex. And that concludes public comment. 
We've received some re late requests um, to comment from a few folks, but um, it's, uh, you know, you have to sign up before public comment starts. Um, so that completes public comment um, and takes us to council discussion. As a reminder, we will come back to this agenda item on Tuesday, September 14th uh, for council action, but we, it's a meaty uh, topic. So let's see if we can't get started with some council discussion. And because we're taking action on Tuesday, I can't exactly force the issue by asking someone to put forward a motion. <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna have to implore folks to uh, raise their hands to get us started on any aspect here, any of the alternatives, any of the numbers. Maggie Summer, please, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I will start, I think there, there are lots of um, subjects to, or lots of places to start in on this discussion, but um, here's one. We heard a lot about uh, achieving OI today, and I, I, I will say in, in my own mind that has um, always been part of this. It is certainly connected to the purpose and need we adopted. Uh, I, I think we may we may have been talking about it less at recent meetings because we have really been focused on um, some of the the details of the alternatives. Uh, but I, you know, I I for one um, have been keeping that in mind, and uh, it it is very connected to our action here. I also want to talk about um, you know as we started off this discussion today, we had a, a great presentation, very much appreciate it from uh, Jim and Jesse. And uh, a lot of that was focused on the analysis related to the 29% level uh, that the council selected to guide further development of alternatives. Um, there has been, uh, I think a lot of, of discussion, a lot of questions about the intent of that 29% and about this, this question of certainty. And I just wanted to share that um, it, in my mind, it, it was intended to set, uh, set a guide, set a mark that as we moved forward from that point, alternatives should be developed to uh, allow for no more than 29% of the um, sector attainment by using fixed gear. And as we have arrived at this meeting with this question of certainty in front of us and the analysis, um, it has raised this question of whether it should be treated as a hard cap or not. Um, we, how I have been looking at it is that any of the alternatives in front of us could be structured to achieve reason, uh, achieve less sorry, to allow less than 29% fixed gear attainment and to achieve reasonable certainty of that depending on their details. We're in the middle of a, a process um, that's very iterative uh, of taking a suite of approaches, refining the details, thinking about how they might work in practice to arrive at a range of alternatives for adoption uh, potentially at this meeting and then further analysis and possible future modification, et cetera. We haven't yet arrived at any, and I, I am, have not found the characterization of some of the alternatives as um, having as certainty-based and some of them as projection-based uh, helpful. I can say that I, I did find the analytical projections very helpful in understanding how likely it is that various configurations of alternatives and their sub-options would um, exceed the 29% level. So I, I think we're still working through it. We're in the middle of that. Um, that 29% that value um, remains in my mind as a maximum intent, uh, but I don't see a need at, at, at this point in my thinking today, this afternoon to design every alternative that we move forward to have um, 
no potential for ever exceeding that amount. And I think somebody made the analogy earlier to our trip limit management. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we can design management measures to, to achieve a, a, an objective with a reasonable amount of certainty. And that is a very common approach we take. And that, that's how I've been thinking about it. I'll stop there. Just thought I'd add that into a discussion and put that out there. All right, thanks for that. Maggie, Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Oops. Sorry, using the wrong mic there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, and thanks, Maggie, for those, those thoughts. I'll start by saying, I, Mr. Chair, I did not see the chat in, in, in Don Marshall's request. I think that's um, too bad we didn't make, make the, the testimony list here. Um, yeah, and, and John Corbin said it. I, I think the question of new entrants is, is one we, we haven't heard much from. Um, we, I have heard more about it, how it's happened in Alaska and have been intrigued by it. Uh, so I do, I do, Don, I hope um, we, we can get in touch and you can testify next time this, this, this comes up. Um, I do think it's an important perspective for us to think about here. Uh, and just kind of maybe adding a little to, 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 to what, what Maggie, um, Maggie just said there. Um, I, I, you know, I, I too have some, uh, you know, I, I think I'm thinking about it similar, sim, similar to her in terms of what the 29% means in, in, in configuring a, uh, an option um, you know, or options, alternatives. And I do appreciate the, the forecast as well that, that, that the Jim and Jesse have done. Um, on this, on this optimum yield, I guess I've, I've said it before, and, and I think, I think Mr. Chair, you, you had some Q and A last time on this, but my view here of, of optimum yield is, is, is the purpose and need. It is what we're thinking about, and that the IFQ program is, is puts optimum yield in the hands of the, of the fishery. Um, I understand that the challenges, Lori Steele, in particular, laid out, and, and thank you for that presentation again, Lori. Uh, and, and, and it's going to take a lot, as we've heard, some efforts from from the marketing side, from the investment side, to to uh, build up those markets. That's what's going to be what builds optimum yield. And we've heard all kinds of, of views on 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 what gear switching is doing uh, to to that uh, attitude, uh, that aptitude for more investment or not. And so I think that's what we are doing here. We're trying to look at, at creating some more stability certainty um so uh, yeah the, I, I i see it much differently than we've heard in testimony about our our duties on optimum yield we we're very much thinking about that and, and and the other part of the magnuson act is is the fair and equitable well, many parts of the magnuson act but the fair and equitable is the other one i've been thinking about and as we structure this range of alternatives and get to the next level of analysis i hope we will see begin to see more about how how folks would be affected based on their their the time and, and times of the investment they put into and time money all that and yeah yeah it goes to both all sides of the sectors we we someone said it today we uh we we act like there are two sectors here a trawl and a non-trawl but it, it's more complicated than that including the whiting the whiting folks who have been leasing sable fish um so I think uh, Lisa Damrosh said it. I mean, I think too that we should be looking to keep this stability. Uh, I mean, create some stability with as as few and simple changes as possible. Yeah, and I've I've said it most every time. I hope, but uh, that this IFQ program is is you know up there with the co-op programs in terms of uh, being as flexible and letting fishing businesses make fishing decisions instead of us at the council and. It was nice again to hear yesterday the council's confidence in, for example, for that sea co-ops to, to avoid salmon and, and the track record they have there. So I'm hoping we can still use the IFQ program. I do, I do, I'm thinking along the lines of, of, the, of the gap. Uh, I, I continue to think of alternative one in addition to the other alternatives, but in terms of a quota-based uh, way of doing it, just I see a, a simple creation of two pools of quota with a with an opt out that's 
done based on uh, an, an investment in quota share and, and fishing um, as, as the simplest way to do it, to make really no other change to the program than to just create a new quota type and, and let, the, let the flexibility and transferability um, work. But yeah, um, I think those, those are my thoughts for now. I will, uh, I will stop there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Corey, thank you for those thoughts. Let's see if we have another hand here. Uh, Bob Dooley. Bob, did you have your hand up or did I? Sorry, I did put the wrong button here. So sorry about that, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I did. Um, I have a few thoughts to offer just to get started here. And I would like to uh, reflect on something I've said many times and people have repeated that if we don't know where we're going, any road will get us there. I think we did a good job last time we addressed this of defining a road, a potential road, but I still think there's more road, more direction and understanding to be had. I go back to the beginning of this, that it was a the topic on the five-year review and went through a long path of the five-year review committee and the SAMTAC that was split off of that and all of that to, to try to address this problem that was perceived that and I think we have not, as a council, addressed the SAMTAC principles that are in agenda item C5, attachment three on page six, 1.4 SAMTAC principles. We have skirted around them, but even there, it, it, even in that, in this document, it references that we have not formally adopted them by the council. I think that might help us and guide us going forward. I think we need to think about those. I'll start with a, a, a few of my feelings uh, first. I've always thought of this as a trawl fishery and trying to achieve OI, trying to recover a trawl fishery that was in dire straits coming into this, both from a, from a stock perspective and, a, and a, an industry perspective. I don't believe going forward, I was, I was there. I don't believe the, the gear switching was intended to really be a surrogate for sector switching. I think there was concern at the time. I remember the conversation in the gap, particularly, forgot the name of the other committee that it was, that we had prior to that for the catch shares and understanding how to put that together. But there was a discussion there and a worry that Dover would plummet and we couldn't get Sable out of the water. And I think uh, Mr. Pettinger could probably, has a lot better memory than I could uh, probably recall that for us at some point. Saying all that, I think it's really important that we think about this in a trawl, from a trawl perspective. Now, going back to the principles, A, we had, we want to ensure there's affordable trawl access to sable fish. I think that's true. Believe unlit, B was really, I think, of the big statement here. Believe that unlimited catch of sable through fish through gear switching was not desirable. I think C, was a very, very important thing and, and high on the list there. We want to consider impacts on existing operations and investments. I have some comments on that, I'll come back to it. There was D, we want to maintain the gear switching option for trawl operations. And then there were a few after that. Probably not as, uh, not as informative as the first group go back to consider impacts on existing operations and investments. 
I've come to think about that. And in the view that as, as it's matured through all of our conversations, it made me think about dependency on the fishery. It made me think about what is, what is the, uh, what's the, what's the threshold there to consider dependence on this fishery? And I think owning a boat, that's probably one. Having a permit, having a quota share is important. I think owning fish is a, is a big deal. I think owning the fish is the, is the thing that really sets the bar, the bar for me. Now, leasing fish, that's an opportunity. That's something that you get occasionally that, might, that is not enduring. It is not so to me. I, I think of legacy provisions in that context that perhaps we shouldn't be thinking about giving legacy provisions on leased fish. But someone who owned a fish, owned a boat, owned a, and fished it, gear switched it, and owned the quota within the control of date seems to me to be a real very, and did it to a certain level, as I outlined in a lot of the options, seems to demonstrate. A, a real dependence. So that's where I see that. And I think we need to, as a council, discuss these principles and come to a common understanding of where we, where we think these items should be addressed and the importance of them. And I think it would be informative then to where we go and how to, how to apply the alternatives to it. If we just try to focus on alternatives, I think we don't we don't do service to to the whole the whole process in thinking about it. Um, I appreciated Maggie's comments and on the the thought of the twenty nine percent being a hard cap or being flexible. Um, <clears throat> I I looked at that as a hard cap. That was my impression. I didn't think we set that number with the intention of it going above it. But, you know, that's part of our discussion as well. I do think we left room for it to go below it. There's been a lot of conversation about that. So listening to all the comments, that's where I'll, I'll leave it there. I, uh, that's my thoughts for right now. And uh, I'm anxious to hear others. Thank you, Bob. Looking for another hand. I know we all have hands. Krista Svensson. Yeah, I do have a hand. Um, and I will be speaking about a couple of things today. Um, you know, I've been wrestling with this for well, as long as I've been on the council, and I know that that is not as long as many of you. Um, and I'm really, really struggling with um, the fact that I fully get it. I am sympathetic with the troll industry. I'm sympathetic to trollers. Uh, I spoke at the last meeting about hey, the approach that we're taking, we're not fixing the mechanism. Um, I, looking at these alternatives um, to the decision that they will not fix the mechanism um, in terms of, yes, they will if we, if we don't want gear switching, if we don't want fixed gear people in a trawl fishery. 100%, I agree with you, that will fix that particular component. Uh, but it will not fix the underlying issue of trawl allocation for trawlers because we have a system that is designed for basically open access. Um, so I'm, I'm wrestling not with optimum yield, but I'm, I'm wrestling with national standard four. Uh, in the sense that, yes, we have caps on quota share, but we do not have caps on leasing for quota pounds. And in fact, we don't even have a requirement that you have to use the fish or that somebody needs to. So we have the potential and we, we heard um, 
in Mike Okanowski's testimony that he's concerned about offshore wind. All we need is for somebody who is interested in having trawlers off the water, whether it's wind, whether it's activists that don't agree with trawl gear, uh, whether it's commercial development where they would like to see housing without fishing vessels coming into or out of town. We have the potential for any of those stakeholders or anyone else to go out, lease those pounds and lock our fishermen off the water. And so I'm not supportive of taking fixed gear people out of the equation and only focusing on that, if we're not really going to wrestle this to the ground and take care of fishermen in general. I, I just don't see why we would exclude one user group, um, but not actually solve the problem. The other component that I, I do wanna to touch briefly on is the fact that we've We've had a lot of analysis uh, that the council did not necessarily ask for um, in terms of presentation today um, from staff. Uh, we did not get analysis on items that I asked questions for at the last meeting. Um, and in fact, I've been asking for analysis about what this will do for communities and specifically for shoreside trawlers since 2019. And I, I really think that, again, getting back to my June testimony, hey, who are we trying to help? Um, because while we may say that we want to help the trawl industry, and I believe we need to help the trawl industry, we don't have all trawlers who have the same ability to pay for this fish, um, as was demonstrated in June. And so we really, as council members and as the council family, need to decide who is the primary? You know, is it small shoreside vessels? Is it processors and capacity? Um, is it midwater trawlers? We need to we need to decide who that is before we start really looking at these alternatives so that we can gauge, are we likely to help them or are we not? And hopefully we can bring everyone along. You know, a rising tide generally does float all ships, but we do need to be very clear about who it is that we are doing this for, other than this pan overarching trawl fishery where we may lose our shoreside folks. Um, many of whom have called me in the last year to say, why are we doing this? And when I ask the question about, hey, can we see some analysis? I'm trying to address their needs. And so with that, I will uh, close my statements. I'm looking forward to seeing what the range of alternatives that get put forward, if that is what comes. But I am very concerned about the fact that we're not addressing the underlying issue with alternatives one, two, or three. Um, at this point in time, except with respect to fixed gear folks. And I, uh, I, I think that that is concerning. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Further discussion, uh, Brad Pettinger followed by Phil Anderson. Yeah, thank you, Chair Rolick. Um, I found the analysis kind of interesting that there was focusing on 29% of being a target. Um, I looked at the motion last April as a cap, is the way it should be viewed. If it was gonna be a target, I, I certainly wouldn't have supported the motion at the time. Um, so I'm hoping whatever we do, we have a full range of alternatives uh, coming out of this on Tuesday. Um, listen to the testimony, I thought it interesting that um, in the past we've heard about investment in the fishery, we should look at investment. I think one of the first um, commenters was talking about how much more investment the, the trawler had in the fishery, and it was uh, easier for a new entrant to get into the groundfish fishery uh, in gear switching. Um, but I think what he basically was saying, maybe not intending to, is that the trawl vessel, the trawl, the trawl fishermen had far more investment in this fishery than fixed gear folks. People talk about stability and they want stability. And um, 
I've been involved in the groundfish fishery for third, this is my 40th year. And we went through some crazy swings in this fishery as far as viability. And there is nothing in this, well, there's a few things, <laughs> well, a few things that I don't want stability in. And that's where we're at right now is the processing capacity. I thought that um, Lori Steele had a fantastic presentation. Um, I know she talked fast, um, but she got through it. And But uh, it'd be nice to get a little more time to absorb it. I thought that um, it's interesting seeing the, um, the processes we have on the West Coast. Um, I said I've been involved in this fishery for a number of years. I thought it'd been very interesting if she would have had a map of what the fishery was prior to the overfish designation um, uh, of this block, the groundfish species in the early 2000s. Um, we did have a buyback program that got that hurt some some uh, some ports. It did, but uh, uh, we needed that by only for the fleet to survive because everybody would have went broke at the amount of fish that was available to folks. I know how much processes were back in the day because uh, I fished up and down the coast from uh, from Westport to Morro Bay, and um, I was director of the Trawl Commission for a number of years, and we had an old processor list. Um, I think we had like 30, 40, I mean 50 companies back in the day. So when people talk about stability, I don't want stability. I, we need to have, we need to do something to incentivize people to invest. Um, that is the, the current processors. We need to see, have them see a future. I would like people or companies, or I would think we'd be nice to have some new entrants in the processing side. We need some competition and we're not gonna get that the way we're going right now. Um, people say what's well, been said quite a bit that, you know, Sable Fish doesn't have any bearing on how much Dover sole or other ground fish is being landed. Um, some years, you could say that, but not right now. Uh, my brother and I own uh, collectively about 3% of the adaptive management pounds of the sable fish in the West Coast for our two vessels, which is pretty high. It's a pretty high number for two boats, one half percent of sable fish. Um, of the trips we've made this year, um, I'm between six and 12,000 pounds of sable fish is what we've landed in a 40, 50,000 pound trip. Um, and, that, and they're not targeting sable fish. There's a lot of sable fish in the water. I think that the, uh, certainly the current stock assessment that we have right now, uh, the latest, latest information says we need a bump. And um, uh, in, in the quota, and, but it's gonna take a couple of years to get there. But so there's more fish in the ocean than uh, the stock, the, the current management uh, specs say there are, and we're going to bump, we're bumping into that. So if you look at that, I mean, if our kind of quota holdings for sable fish for two boats, you know, in about 12 trips, 15 trips, we'll be out of fish and have to go out in the marketplace. So I think it's a folly to say that sable fish quota or sable fish to the trawl fleet does not matter for that attainment. Um, I thought it was, um, I thought Tim Hobbs, um, that's a great testimony as far as up the yield. And our, um, and Matt, you'll talk about maximum control attainment. It really is about the future of this fishery. Um, to get this right, um, we have a legal mandate to, to, uh, to do that. Um, it's one thing if we wanted to, if we were doing the gear switching or Gear switching is really the wrong name, wrong term, but allow fixed gear vessels to fish trawl quota. If we couldn't access that, couldn't catch that fish, but that's not a problem. This is the problem to catch disabled fish. Um, uh, given the fact that it is, it is a roadblock, um, I think that we need to deal with it and we need to deal with it fairly soon. And I think we should be bold. We can always cut back in whatever we do and the, the, um, where we end up at. But uh, I have a, for me, I have a very I, I'm very fearful 
of the troll groundfish fishery on the West Coast. Um, without my processor, without a processor, I have nothing. A fixed gear vessel, fishing for blast for sablefish, um, you know, they can jake out the boat. The, the processing is a very small component. Um, they're not held to um, the constraints that we are. Um, so for me, a healthy processing um, sector is paramount to um, a successful roundfish fishery. I could probably go on for a while, but uh, this is going to continue this discussion next week. Uh, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. So um, anyway, I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Phil Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks um, to all my colleagues that spoke previous to me on this topic. Um, find a lot of commonality with my thoughts as those expressed by others. Um, not all, but a lot. Um, I don't know that this is particularly useful, but I thought I'd just take you a, a quick run back in time in my years on the council here in the ground fish fishery and the trawl and try to be quick. Um, I remember uh, when the ground fish management plan was developed and adopted and put in place. I think that was in 1984, my memory serves me correct. Um, Joe Easley was a big part of that, for sure. Um, fast forward to 1996, and the, we had stocks failing, um, overfish species, and the ground fish fishery, and in particular, the trawl fishery was in crisis. Uh, in 1996, we held a council meeting down in Gladstone, Oregon, that was solely for the purpose of addressing the, the ground fish fishery and particularly the trawl fishery. No other topics were on the agenda for that meeting. Coming out of that, uh, we developed a ground fish strategic plan. That was part of the committee. We met more times than I like to think about and we developed a ground fish strategic plan, brought it forward to the council and was adopted I think somewhere around 1999. Out of that, uh, well, as as part of that was identification of the need of that we needed to reduce fleet size. So, um, thanks to the industry, uh, came along the buyback program. Um, and not long after that, in 2004 or five, we started down the path of the catch of developing the catch here program and essentially dumping out what we had in terms of how we manage this fishery on the, on the table and started from scratch. And that process took five or six years. Um, and, and as we all know, was put in place, I believe in 2011. Um, and, um, and, and there were a lot of uncertainties about how that program was gonna work. And of course, we build in the five-year review and some other uh, features into the program to ensure that we could try, at least try to, to make corrections to the program as it developed. It took so long to get the thing in place that our control date was viewed as being stale by, by some, and, and we had to go back, and it took a year to go back and defend our action against the lawsuit. Uh, but our our action prevailed um, at the end of the day. So here we are, um, 10 years later, um, and um, uh, we started our five-year review, I think about seven years after, after 2011. As part of that five-year review was the industry meetings. I think they were um, called the Santa Rosa meetings. Uh, there were three of them, as I recall. I went to a couple of them. And at the last one, the the issue associated with gear switching and the use of sable fish, trawl sable fish in fixed gear application 
was identified as one of the biggest issues that um, many felt that we needed to address or the program uh, was going to fail to achieve its objectives. And so um, uh, off we went as a council and we um, gave we, a, a number of different groups, tried to wrestle it to the ground, if you will, and bring things back to the council. And none of them were particularly successful dis despite their best efforts, the last being the SAMTAC group. Um, and um, um, and here we are uh, still, still at it. Um, I think the principles that um, Bob Dooley referenced um, that were, were developed and not adopted, they weren't adopted by the committee and they weren't adopted by the council either, but they were kind of, they were uh, a guideposts that we, we used and looked at as we went through the SAMTAC um, process. And um, I do think they're good to look at and remind ourselves of, of some of the reasons why this has been so hard, because there are there are are principles here that compete with one another, and it it uh, requires us to balance uh, between some of them to get us to a solution that makes sense. And we'll see we'll see if we get there, but I'm frankly confident that we will. It's also important that through this action is we're not trying to fix everything about this program. There are vulnerabilities as Krista uh, referenced and others um, to, the to, the, to the welfare of the fishery as a whole, uh, but we're not trying to fix everything here. And um, if we do, we will fail to do much of anything, I think. Um, so turning to, the, to kind of where we are here, here today, and some of the issues that we're gonna be grappling with uh, when we uh, get back to this on Tuesday. Um, just a few, few thoughts there. Um, when we selected 29% back in June, um, I viewed that as an upper limit. I don't know whether you wanna call it a hard cap or what you wanna call it, but um, if, if it was just a guidepost, um, I don't think we would have we would have looked at the data and, and Maggie certainly referenced that data and where, where she came, uh, how she uh, came to the point of recommending 29% uh, to the council. Um, uh, if it was just uh, something that was gonna be a guide guideline and well, it could be over. I do think we left room for it to be under, but frankly, uh, I thought we were voting for an upper limit. Um, so that's where my thought was relative to that issue. On the control date, uh, I, I believe and I think uh, past uh, practice will tell us that when we set a control date, uh, we need to stick to it. I don't think uh, we should deviate from it. Um, it, it might be used uh, a date later than that, might be used for some recency, but as, as our um, analysts showed us, in, in particular, Mr. Seeger, um, um, there are pitfalls with even uh, doing that. And I think we need to be really careful about using um, catches that occurred after our control date as part of uh, a qualifying uh, uh, criteria. Um, I think um, uh, the other thing that is apparent to me is that we're gonna have to make some modifications to the alternatives um, to the um, to what was came out in the SAMTAC um, uh, report uh, in order to ad adhere and stay true to the 29% uh, upper limit. Um, and, and I understand there are differences of opinion around the table about that. Uh, and we'll work through that. Um, but uh, regardless of whether you think it's a hard or soft cap, I think we're going to need to make some modifications. I, I hope that we are able to 
uh, look for ways to make the program as simple as possible, uh, but at, and but at the same time be effective, and fair and equitable, and result and result in contributing to optimum yield for the overall fishery. I think I'll uh, stop there, Mr. Chairman and and uh, Council uh, colleagues, and. Um, Look forward to more discussion and uh, look forward to our work that we have to do on Tuesday. Thank you, Bill. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to um, maybe clarify my, my earlier remarks um, on the 29% limit. I am certainly not intending to uh, that, that that be a, a target we should be trying to achieve in the sense of uh, bringing gear switching up to that amount, nor am I intending to design alternatives that are intended to achieve that amount. Uh, maybe just the, the clearest example I think I, I can offer of my thinking on this is what we saw earlier in the, the presentation um, from Jesse and Jim was uh, a slide at one point where they were walking through the projections uh, related to alternative two, which would be the gear switching endorsement alternative. And under uh, a certain selection of options, they indicated that um, if we were intending to allow non-endorsed permits some gear switching opportunity that might have to be restricted to 580 pounds per permit per year to ensure that if every one of those permits goes out and take gear takes the full amount they they are allowed to it would add up to 29 percent and i think that that kind of thing is unlikely and so um that particular level, what has been specified is 0.5% of the, uh, the quota share for that, uh, for the sector is certainly a number I'll, I'll be thinking a lot about. I found the, the analysis and projections provided very helpful in uh, making it quite clear that that number is, is likely not an appropriate number. Um, and I completely agree that there are places where the alternatives we have before us uh, uh, need some modification before um, recommendation for adoption as a range. And um, we have some additional ideas that have been proposed in the GAP report and in uh, written and verbal public testimony that I think are worthy of consideration as well. So I, I will be giving all of that uh, quite a bit of thought and, and trying to um, help the council uh, come come forward with a uh, clear range for uh, some discussion and, and further consideration next week. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Further discussion, Corey Niles. Yeah, just real quick. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And yeah, th thanks for uh, everyone for those comments. I think we could uh, stay here into the, into the evening um, going back and forth and having a good discussion. I just wanna give one specific example in terms of the 29% and what it means to me. I think Phil, I wish I wrote down his sentence, but he, he laid out the objective of, um, you know, keeping it simple while achieving the objective and then in being fair and equitable and achieving optimum yield. As always, he says this stuff better than I could ever, but, the, the part about that's kind of gives me pause about the 29% is we don't know precisely that kind of kind of like Maggie an example she just gave of how it infects, affects the individuals yet we have not got into that detail. So it might be in the end when we see the next round of analysis that that 32% looks a whole lot more fair and equitable than 29%. So I don't, I'm not hearing a wide range of difference between what, we're, what we're, we're talking about there, but I do think we arrived at this 29% uh, number without having done 
the full analysis. And when, when we see that, it might be, it might be, it might look great, but there's a possibility that it might affect some people in a way we haven't seen yet. And that's where I see some some differences. And again, this is if it, if it were a quota based system, it is 29% in a, of a quota based system. And it's you know up to the trading and the transferring business decisions on how much of that gets used by trawl and fixed gear. So it could always be less than 29%. So just sorry, just wanted to say that fair and equitable thing. And I also mentioned it briefly, but just so it doesn't get lost, I want to make the connection back to the presentation we saw yesterday in the NIMS report and the data on the ownership and um, uh, uh, participation in the fishery and the science, the Northwest Fishery Science Center folks are working on. I think that's going to give, maybe not answer all the questions Krista mentioned and others, but that is going to be uh, interesting information to look at. And I'm looking forward to that becoming part of the, the discussion. All right. Thank you very much, Corey. Further discussion today? Jim Seeger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, if there's not any further uh, council member comments, I did want to uh, uh, provide a couple comments in, in response to uh, some of the some of the things that came up during the discussion here. Um, first, there was a comment about the analysis treating 29% as a target. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we, we're trying to <clears throat> trying to be very careful not to treat it as a target or even discuss it in that way. And if something slipped through that indicated that, I would apologize for that. Um, and also not not even treating it as a soft cap, uh, kind of along what Maggie, uh, Summer, Ms. Summers has been voicing that uh, we looked at that as the council's objective to be at 29% or below 29% and looking at the probabilities that, of achieving that, um, that outcome. Uh, second, I wanted to note that the analysis presented today was what we understood the council was, <clears throat> was looking for and asking for and would be helpful for them. Uh, third comment, um, th there was some concern that analyses have been requested over the last year or so uh, uh, that maybe have not been conducted. Um, I think we have conducted all of the analyses that we are aware that the council has asked for and presented them, starting with the meeting last September. Uh, we do need to draw all that together because I do understand it's hard to kind of keep track, <laughs> even for us who have done it, it's hard for us to keep track of all the different parts of it. And we will be trying to bring all that together so it will be easier for you to track. Some of those analyses are not too satisfying uh, for the questions that are being asked, quite frankly, because uh, we are constrained by both the data available and the confidentiality. And a lot of times we're seeing things that, that might be more, much more satisfying for you, but because of confidentiality, we can't, we can't show those to you. Um, but if there are some specific analyses, and this is really the, the main point I want to make, if there's some specific analyses that folks think could be produced and, and they're not seeing them, please, please come and talk to us about it or, or let us know about it, or even next Tuesday when they come up, uh, let us know about it. There may be some ideas out there and some things and approaches that, that we haven't thought of uh, that could be helped to uh, could be done to help with your uh, your discussions and, and decision making process. So um, thank you for the opportunity to make those those few comments. Great, right, Jim. Thank you, uh, Bob Dooley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Jim, thanks so much for all the the hard work on this. And I know it's been a monumental task that you and Jesse took on. Appreciate that a lot. Um, the thing that, that I keep going back to is the last, when we last saw this last meeting, there was a lot of talk about this 11, 12% number of, and, and I don't know the context of that. And I didn't see it in the analysis today, but I, if my recollection's correct, it had to do with the fish people owned Weight against the uh, weight against the, the qualification standards to be included in a legacy type provision. If I'm saying that correctly, and I I I think those numbers are very pertinent, at least in my mind, and I would like to see them if we, at some point. I think they're there. We had them last meeting, but uh, I thought and I didn't see them. I saw numbers much higher, and I don't know what those. 
I, I couldn't get my head around that. That was kind of confusing. So I'm sorry to not be as clear as I should be, but thank you so much for your work. Thanks, Mr. Dooley, Mr. Chair, if I, if I can respond. Please. Yeah, so there's some different numbers that come in at around the 10, 11, 12%, and we can talk about uh, have, you know what those are. Uh, but the big difference between the, the much higher numbers you saw today and the, those lower numbers is that the, those much higher numbers are based on quota share that is owned by the people who own permits used to gear switch. And the lower number is the quota share by people who owned by people who own vessels used to gear switch. And then those those lower numbers, in fact, well, both numbers, but they'll bounce around a bit depending on periods of time and, and various screening factors. And then there's also an annual number that comes in in the tw 10 to 12 percent range. If you just look at any one year, the number of people uh, or the, the vessel owners that are in the fishery in any one year. Uh, but yes, we can certainly talk more about, you know, exactly what's going to be helpful to the council in that regard. Uh, Krista, followed by Corey. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to speak for a moment about um, my my comment with regard to, hey, I've asked for analysis since 2019. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, at that point, asked for information with regard to our communities, um, how this was going to impact processors, small, mid-sized, large, et cetera. Um, and yes, there may not be enough satisfying information. Um, I have continued to ask questions about what this is going to do to our communities. And for, I would say the last year have asked specific to small scale and regular, any trawler. Um, I asked at the last meeting for information on how this would affect our trawl fleet, similar to what was done in the five year review for Sablefish Longline. Now, I think we have enough vessels in the trawl fleet that we don't have to be worried about um, not having enough information and, and masking what's going on. So I am a bit concerned about it. Um, I realize I am only one voice, but to not see anything in terms of what the breakdown is, particularly in light of seeing in the five year review that different scales for trawlers have different capacity for purchasing sable fish and that we may be impacting some folks more than others, I think that that is important to this conversation. So uh, my apologies if I was not clear enough in June, um, but it is something that moving forward, I think is imperative that we sort out uh, so that we know how these alternatives, should we pursue them, are going to impact all of our community members. So with that, you know, I will I will stop, but um, that really is the push and the crux of the matter and why I was asking for that in June and why I still think it's important. All right, Krista, uh, Corey followed by Butch. Thanks, Mr. Chair, I saw Butch's hand go up. Uh, if he had to follow up on, on Krista, uh, I'll, I can yield to him. I, I was gonna go back to Ask Jim to clarify his answer to Bob. But... Uh, how are you want to do it, Corey? My, my, my. I guess I'm going to be on the, uh, hopefully, on the same lines of Krista. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I would, I would yield, please. Go ahead. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, th th this is a heck of an issue to uh, get dumped in the middle of a 70 mile an hour freeway um but uh that's what we get that's what we do um but i think i don't want to misspeak for krista but you know i i'm in as a councilman as a fisherman but as a as a coastal community person a port commissioner i'm for everyone doing well everybody as possible and I, I would hope this next round um, analysis um, comes out I think just what Chris was saying what, what what does this mean to the processors which are very necessary in our coastal community um, Awako lived without one for almost 18 months 
and it was horrible and almost lost access to dredging money out to our the river and all kinds of stuff and 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 all the jobs that go along with it including boats let's open back up we got boats that we didn't have back in here and and jobs um are increasing as fast as they could as the job market will let people go back to or people want to go back to work um but i also wonder about um, not only the the big guys but I also worry about the small scale families that count on this uh, as as one fishery that makes the whole. They have multi fisheries, and this is just one that helps them get by and and feed their families. and And what we the next round, what we will decide if 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 that is possible. I guess, Mr. Singer, and you do a, you know an amazing job, you and Jesse. Um, and, and I, and I guess I might be the only one, but, um, and maybe a little more plain English on, on what that part of the analysis is, if you, if it's possible, um, uh, you do a marvelous job. And I know some of the analysis that I saw today went flying right over the top of my head, which is not hard, but I, I've got resources that I can call and draw on to, to ask. And I, and I don't mind doing that. And I don't mind admitting that, um. Um, and from what I found out that that it wasn't the only head that flew over. So I, I think it's very important part on this next step um, because I, I think that, you know, we can't bring everybody along, but we, 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 we sure need to try and we sure need to try to keep our coastal communities alive and our fishermen going. Um, sometimes uh, processor fishermen, I think, are a marriage made in hell. But but it, it, it it's necessary, you know. The we need uh, we need the processors and we need the fishermen and they need each other. And, and uh, I think if everybody's healthy, we have an, a healthy coastal community. So that that's my statement. Um, and uh, I hope Krista was in line with yours. But I'd certainly like to see that in the in, in whatever range of alternatives that we that we come up with on Tuesday. The next analysis has that involved to see see what it means to to what's currently happening now. Um, it's important. Uh, so when we have make the final decision, we have that information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity. Which thank you. Further discussion for today. Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I don't want to take away from the, the big picture of Krista and Butch just spoke to, but if I could real quickly, just to make sure, I think Bob probably got it, and I think um, that just I want on, Jim when you're the when you when you spoke to the difference in numbers being out there between the ten to twelve percent, and then and then some other numbers in analysis. So what you're speaking to is alternative one from the same tack, how it's it's based on basically qualifying criteria based on landings associated with a permit instead of the boat. And yet a boat owner might have, might have leased a permit from someone else who, who didn't, didn't fish. And so had that permit got transferred off, and, but would, the owner would then qualify to opt out their quota share. And therefore, and then what you and Jesse did was do your best to guess which, which quota share account that permit owner would, would opt out. Is it so? It's really the movement of permits, the leasing of trawl permits, that that adds some uh, extra uncertainty into how much quota share would be opted out. You said it better than me, but I just want to make, highlight and make sure that understanding that's that was your answer to Bob. Uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, Niles uh, through the chair, um, and Jesse may want to chime in here at some point as well. So there were two parts of at least two parts uh, in trying to draw a connection uh, under alternative one. But the key point is the connection that we we're trying to draw there was between the limited entry permit that qualified and a quota share account. And there were at least two methods we used. The first was cross ownership between the two. So if the, if the guy owns the per, a person owns the permit and then also owns the quota share account, then they were linked up. 
Um, and that, and then the second part was then we tried to uh, do, as you know, some some look at some transactions and quota share trading and leasing and so forth to, to make similar linkage. But in all cases under alternative one, what we're trying to do is associate quota share ownership with permits. And the point I was making though is that the the that 10 to 12 percent number that's kind of floating around, that's based on quota share owned by vessel owners. Not by not by not the quota share based on that is owned by permits. And recall that about half of the time those permits are being leased, uh, which and now we're kind of getting into more complexity in terms of tracking all of these uh, different uh, avenues here. But the, the bottom line is that permits that have been the, the owners of the permits that have been used in gear switching own quite a bit more quota than the owners of the vessels that have been used in gear switching. Thanks, Jim, that was, that was clear, thank you. All right, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so this comment isn't, my comment isn't being made uh, to counter other comments that have been made about the analysis or what we need or what we don't need. Um, but I think we we need to pause on Tuesday before we leave the topic and make sure we have an understanding of what we are asking our analysts to do. And they can, in turn, tell us whether they can deliver on that. Um, if I had to go out and pick two people to support the council working its way through this issue, I'd pick Jim and Jesse. They are top notch. They're gonna do their level best to bring us every available piece of information to help us make this decision. Um, and, um, uh, but we also, I just wanna make sure we're being fair to them uh, that we that they they have clarity on what we're asking of them, and that we're asking what we're asking of them, they have a, a, the ability to deliver. So I think uh, again, just before we close this out on Tuesday, let's let's have a a bit of a discussion on what we are looking for in the analysis, or have them describe for us what will be in the analysis. And if we identify something important that we think is missing, we can discuss that. Thanks. I think that's an excellent idea, Phil. And I'm sure Jim as a staff officer will remind us to go through that exercise if I as chair forget <laughs> to prompt us through it. Um, so there's no misunderstanding as we leave the agenda item on Tuesday. Further discussion? We have time, but I don't wanna force the discussion if folks wanna think about things and uh, or maybe uh, keep their powder dry until we have um, a motion and more concrete discussion on Tuesday. Although we will know it's only scheduled for two hours, so we'll have to make efficient use of that time. I will take whatever time we need, but keep in mind it's it's the it's day it's our penultimate day. Um, I'm not seeing any further discussion, so I think it's 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 a good place to leave it, and hopefully we can start on Tuesday. Um, uh, with a motion or close to one, uh, and then allow that to uh, frame the balance of our discussion. So um, I guess that's where we're going to leave it. Let me turn to our executive director, Chuck Tracy, and see if he has any words for us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, uh, well, first of all, um, thank you. I think that we had a really good uh, a good uh, agenda item here uh, up to this point. Uh, the presentations, as you mentioned, were top-notch, excellent. Um, 
statements from our advisory bodies, great public comment and a very good uh, discussion here uh, on the floor. So thank you for that. Um, we are a little bit of, uh, ahead of schedule in terms of our, uh, when we thought we might end today. So <clears throat> I'm gonna encourage you to uh, look ahead a little bit to tomorrow. We've got HMS uh, on the agenda, um, which hopefully will be fairly straightforward. Uh, then we've got uh, our marine planning agenda item, uh, administrative item. And uh, this, I would uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at the materials that have been posted uh, on that today. Uh, there's, a, uh, I think, an excellent uh, statement from the new marine planning committee. And there are uh, three draft letters that uh, will be uh, up for the council's consideration and approval. And I would point out that uh, all three of those uh, are subject to uh, comment deadlines of uh, Monday. So uh, not a lot of time between the time that they hit the council floor and they have to be submitted to the uh, to the various agencies. So, um, so if you could uh, spend a little time and make sure that we have, uh, we, we can get through those letters and uh, uh, address any issues and uh, get them turned around quickly. Uh, we would uh, very much appreciate that. Um, so, and then uh, we've got some salmon business as well. Um, so, uh, but I, I really just kind of wanted to emphasize that marine planning business. This is a, a you know, a, a new uh, high priority for the council. Uh, there's a lot going on um, with the, uh, uh, the administration's priorities uh, on this. And so um, um, things are breaking late, but uh, um, I'm sure we can uh, get through it if we uh, put our heads down a little bit uh, before we get there. So that's that's all I've uh, got to say, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, we're breaking a little early today, uh, but that means we'll just uh, be that much more prepared for the rest of the meeting. So uh, we will see everyone uh, tomorrow, Saturday. Um, at 8 a.m.